Hachette Audio presents Private Berlin. Written by James Patterson and Mark Sullivan. Read by Ari Fliakos and January Lavoie. For the thousands who tried to escape over the wall, and the hundreds that died in the attempt. M.S. Prologue The Invisible Man 1. At ten o'clock on a moonless September evening, Chris Schneider slipped toward a long, abandoned building on the eastern outskirts of Berlin, his mind whirling with dark images and old vows. Late thirties and dressed in dark clothes, Schneider drew out a forty caliber Glock pistol and eased forward, alert to the dry rustle of the thorn bushes and goldenrod and the vines that engulfed the place. He hesitated, staring at the silhouette of the building, recalling some of the horror that he'd felt coming here for the first time, and realizing that he'd been waiting almost three decades for this moment. Indeed, for ten years, he'd trained his mind and body. For ten years after that, he'd actively sought revenge, but to no avail. In the past decade, Schneider had come to believe it might never happen, that his past had not only disappeared, it had died, and with it, the chance to exact true payback for himself and the others. But here was his chance to be the avenging angel they'd all believed in. Schneider heard voices in his mind, all shrieking at him to go forward and put a just ending to their story. At their calling, Schneider felt himself hardened inside. They deserved a just ending. He intended to give it to them. By now he'd reached the steps of the building. The chain hung from the barn doors, which stood ajar. He stared at the darkness, feeling his gut hollow and his knees weaken. You've waited a lifetime. Schneider told himself. Finish it, now. For all of us. Schneider toed open the door. He stepped inside, smelling traces of stale urine, burnt copper, and something dead. His mind flashed with the image of a door swinging shut and locking, and for a moment that alone threatened to cripple him completely. But then Schneider felt righteous vengeance ignite inside him. He pressed the safety lever on the trigger, readying it to fire. He flicked on the flashlight taped to the gun, giving him a soft red beam with which to dissect the place. Boot prints marred the dust. Schneider's heart pounded as he followed them. Cement rooms, more like stalls really, stood to either side of the passage. Even though the footprints went straight ahead, he searched the rooms one by one. In the last, he stopped and stared seeing a horror film playing behind his eyes. He tore his attention away, but noticed his gun hand was trembling. The hallway met a second set of barn doors. The lock hung loose in the hasp. The doors were parted a foot, leading into a cavernous space. He heard fluttering, stepped inside, and aimed his light and pistol into the rafters, seeing pigeons blinking in their roost. The smell of death was worse here. Schneider swung his light all around, looking for the source. Large, rusted bolts jutted from the floor. Girders and trusses overhead supported a track that ran the length of the space. Corroded hooks hung on chains from the track. The footprints cut diagonally left away from the doorway. He followed, aware of those bolts in the floor and not wanting to trip. Schneider meant to look into the girders again, but was distracted by something scampering ahead of him. He crouched, aiming the gun and light at the noise. A line of rats scurried toward a gaping hole in the floor on the far side of the room. The boot prints went straight to the hole and disappeared. He heard rats squealing and hissing as he got closer. To the left of the hole stood a metal tube of a slightly smaller diameter than the hole. Atop it lay a sewer grate. To the right of the hole was a small gas blower, the kind used to get clippings off walkways. Schneider stepped to the hole and shined the light into a shaft of corrugated steel. Ten feet down, the shaft ended in space. 
Four feet below that lay a gravel floor. A female corpse was sprawled on the gravel. Rats were swarming her. Schneider knew her nonetheless. He'd been searching for her all over Berlin and Germany, hoping against hope that she was alive. But he was far, far too late. The desire for vengeance that had been a low flame inside Schneider fueled and exploded through him now. He wanted to shoot at anything that moved. He wanted to scream into the hole and call out her killer to receive his just due. But then Schneider's colder, rational side took over. This was bigger than him now. Bigger than all of us. It wasn't about revenge anymore. It was about bringing someone heinous into the harsh light, exposing him for what he was and what he had been. Go outside, he thought. Call the cripple. Get them involved, now. Schneider turned and, sweeping the room behind him with the light, started back toward the hallway. He had taken six or seven steps when he heard what sounded like a very large bird fluttering. He tried to react, tried to get his gun moving up toward the sound. But the dark figure was already dropping from his hiding spot in the deep shadows above the rusted overhead track. Boots struck Schneider's collarbones. He collapsed backward and landed on one of those bolts sticking up from the floor. The bolt impaled him broke his spine, and paralyzed him. The Glock clattered away. There was so much fiery pain Schneider could not speak, let alone scream. The silhouette of a man appeared above him. The man aimed his flashlight at his own upper body, revealing a black mask that covered his nose, cheeks, and forehead. The masked man began to speak, and Schneider knew him instantly, as if three decades had passed in a day. You thought you were prepared for this, Chris, hmm? The masked man asked, amused. He made a clicking noise in his throat. You were never prepared for this, no matter what you may have told yourself all those years ago. A knife appeared in the masked man's other hand. He squatted by Schneider and touched the blade to his throat. My friends will come quicker if I bleed you, he said. A few hours in their care, and your mask will be gone, Chris. No one would ever recognize you then, not even your own dear, sweet mother. Hmm. Two. At a quarter to four the following Sunday morning, Matilda Matty Angle wove through the crowd jammed into Trezor, a legendary underground nightclub set inside an old power plant in the hip Kreuzberg district of Berlin. In her thirties, strong and attractive, Matty reached a series of industrial passageways that linked the club's two huge dance floors. She yawned and ran her fingers through her short, spiked blonde hair as electronic music throbbed and echoed all around her. Maddie's roving sapphire eyes took in the graffiti-lined walls, the smoky air, and all the hardcore partiers trying to make their Saturday night last until mid-morning at least. A stocky Eurasian man appeared in the hallway ahead of Maddie. He had a tattoo of a spider web beneath his left eye. The count is still here, Axel? Maddie asked, loud enough to be heard. The man with the spider web tattoo jerked his head back in the direction he'd come from. She's with the Argentine. They're on something stronger than booze, weed, or blow. I'm guessing ecstasy. Just as long as it's not crystal, Maddie replied. I hate tweakers. You're on your own in any case, Axel warned. I can't have your back on a gig like this. Think it will ruin your image as a creature of the night, Maddie said. That too. Private will send you a finder's fee. Axel grinned. Even better. Thanks, Maddie. She nodded. Do I have a clean way out of there? Fire exits at both ends of the floor. High ground? Axel thought about that. I'll make a call. The bar. You'll have to dance. Maddie slapped Axel's big palm and moved by him toward the entrance to the dance floor. She got out her cell phone as she walked, flipped it open, and called up a school picture of a brunette teenager. The Countess Sophia von Mühlen of Austria was 17. A week ago, she ran off with her father's polo instructor, a 33-year-old Argentine scoundrel and fortune hunter named Raul Montenegro. 
In exactly four days, the countess would turn 18 and of age to wed, which is what the countess's family was desperately trying to avoid and why Private Berlin had been hired to track her down and return her to Vienna. Sophia's mother had died three years before of a drug overdose. Her grandmother, the formidable Sarah von Mühlen, did not want the family name or fortune tarnished by further scandal, especially when Sophia's father, Peter, a prominent politician in the Tyrol, was preparing to run for higher office. Spare no expense, the grandmother had told Maddie. Find her. Maddie had done just that, tracking the young countess via credit card charges and GPS data from her cell phone to the nightclub. Luckily, she'd known Axel, the head of security at Tresor, since her days as a cripo investigator with the Berlin Kriminalpolizei. Maddie put away her cell phone and moved onto a dance floor packed with writhing, sweating bodies, dancing to a convulsive mix laid down by a DJ named The Mover. She angled toward the bar, nodding to the bartender who was snapping shut his cell phone. She climbed up at the waitress's station and began to dance her way down the bar in time with the mover's beat and riffs. The crowd noticed and began to hoot and cry for her. Maddie smiled, playing the drunken chick. But her eyes moved everywhere until she spotted Sophia von Mühlen and her Latin lover on the other side of the room. The countess's arms hung around Montenegro's neck. She was kissing his chest. His hands were roaming all over her. Maddie looked beyond them for the fire escape doors. But then the countess suddenly pushed away from the polo instructor and wove unsteadily toward the hallway, a lucky break for Maddie, who jumped off the bar and caught up to her in the tunnel where she'd left Axel. Sophia, she said, and flashed her badge. My name is Maddie Engel. I'm with Private Berlin. I'm here to take you home. Sophia laughed scornfully. I'm 18. I can do what I want. You're not 18 for another four days, Maddie shot back in a no-nonsense voice. Let's go, and try not to make a scene. Sophia smiled. I'm good at making scenes, big ones, the kind that attract reporters. Not on my watch, Maddie said, grabbing the countess by the back of her elbow and applying force to pressure points there. Ow! Sophia whined. You're hurting me. You'll hurt more if you don't move. Maddie replied, and began hustling the countess down the hallway, heading toward the main entrance to the club. Sophia, hey, what do you do there? Maddie glanced over her shoulder to see the polo instructor whacked on drugs and booze, angry and storming after them. Maddie held on to Sophia and flashed her badge at Montenegro. Don't make this more difficult than it has to be, Raul. She's going home. Montenegro glowered. She consents to be with me. She's 18. She might have consented to sex, but she's not 18. The polo instructor's shoulders dropped as if in submission, but then he rushed right at her. Maddie let go of the countess and raised her hands to defend herself. Montenegro tried to bat her hands away. Maddie snatched his right hand and twisted it sharply toward the floor. Montenegro grunted in pain and went to his knees, shouting, Run! Sophia, run! Three. The Countess von Mühlen was off like a shot. She dodged by a girl with shocking pink hair and started accelerating. Maddie cursed, released Montenegro, and took off after the Countess. But it was almost impossible to keep up with her. Despite the drugs and alcohol in her system, Sophia proved nimble as she twisted and spun her way through the crowd. Stop that girl! Maddie shouted, holding up her badge. Instead, one wasted guy in his early 20s tried to block Maddie's way. But she slid her right foot behind his leg, popped him in the chest, and sent him sprawling on his back. Other people started yelling after Maddie just as she spotted Sophia running past Axel, who stood at the doors to the side exit. The countess disappeared outside. Somebody grabbed Maddie's jean jacket from behind. She twisted. It was Montenegro. She let her arms go limp and let the jacket slip off her. Then she kicked the polo player in the shin. He screamed and fell. Maddie scrambled after the countess, snapping at Axel, who watched in amusement. You could have grabbed her or something. And miss this fun? Stop the crazy lover for me at least, Maddie shouted over her shoulder. She ran out onto the street without listening for the bouncer's reply. 
The sidewalk was lined with people still waiting to get into the club. Maddie flashed her badge at them. A girl just came out a minute ago. Where'd she go? The guy closest to her was sucking on a joint. He shrugged. The girl behind him said, I didn't see her. Oh, for Christ's sake, I lost her, Maddie groaned to herself. Damn it. She could just hear Sophia's imperious grandmother ripping her apart for the blunder. But then, Maddie heard a groan and violent retching coming from behind a large dumpster parked across the street. There goes the hundred euros she promised us, the joint smoker said, sighing. Maddie flipped him the finger and crossed the street. She looked behind the dumpster, finding the Countess von Mullen hunched over and vomiting everything she'd churned up, making her escape. Come on now, Sophia, Maddie said, helping her to stand after she'd finished and was just panting. Let's get you somewhere I can wash you up. For a moment, the Countess seemed not to know where she was or who Maddie was, but then she started crying. Where's Raoul? He's going to be lying low for a while, Maddie said taking gentler hold of her arm and steering her away from the club toward her car. I'll get away, Sophia vowed. I'll find him. We'll be married. When you're 18, you can do what you want. Until then, there is someone who wants to talk some sense into you. My father, the Countess replied with open contempt. All he cares about is himself and his career. Actually, it's your grandmother who hired us. Maddie saw fear surface in Sophia, who said, But I want to see my father. I bet you do. But Oma's calling the shots now. Something seemed to go out of the Countess right then. All the hostility and fight, certainly. She trudged along in a submissive posture until they reached the car, a BMW 335i from the private Berlin pool. When Maddie went to open the passenger side door, Sophia fell into her arms, blubbering. I just wanted someone for myself. What's so wrong with that? Maddie's heart melted. Nothing, Sophia, but Maddie's cell phone rang. She couldn't do a thing about it. She held on to the young countess and let her sob her heart out. Four. Twenty minutes later, Maddie was driving the young countess through the streets of Berlin toward Tegel Airport. She checked her phone at last, seeing that the call had come from Katerina Doruk, her best friend as well as the managing investigator at Private Berlin. At four in the morning? She got Katerina's voicemail and left a message. Kat, it's Maddie. Don't worry. Got the package, heading to the jet. Get some sleep. When Maddie hung up, she heard snoring. Sophia was lights out, face against the window, drooling from the corner of her mouth. Maddie prayed she wouldn't get sick in the brand new car. It still had that sweet leather smell. Fortunately, she reached the private air terminal at Tegel International without another accident. She roused Sophia, who looked around blearily, got out, and followed her as if in a trance. The pilot was inside, filing his flight plan, and told Maddie to get Sophia aboard the jet. They were entering the jet's cabin when Maddie's cell phone rang again. Maddie Angle, she answered. It's Kat. Maddie heard wait in her friend's voice. What's wrong? she asked. There was a long hesitation before Katerina replied. Chris is missing. Sophia went to a high-backed leather chair and plopped into it. I need a Coke or something, she said. Maybe some rum in it? But Maddie ignored her and listened intently to her phone. He took personal leave early last week, Katerina was saying. He was supposed to be back the day before yesterday, but he never checked in. He still hasn't. I've tried his cell, the house, email, text, nothing. This wasn't like Chris Schneider at all, Maddie agreed. He was a careful, methodical detective and a stickler for following the agency's rules and procedures which included checking in when you were supposed to. You try the chip? Maddie asked at last. The year before, private employees around the world had been offered a small locator chip that could be embedded under the skin of the upper back so they could be found in case of emergencies. Maddie had balked at the idea. 
thinking that if it was misused, it could turn totalitarian in nature. But to her surprise, Schneider had agreed to the procedure. That's why I was calling, Katerina replied before hesitating again. I'm lying in bed. Couldn't sleep after some voodoo tea my mother made me drink. And I was thinking that you could authorize it. I don't have that authority, Kat, Maddie said. You're the closest to it, Maddie. Not anymore, I'm not. Are you ready to report Chris missing to Crippo? I don't know. I'm confused. You know, he could be off with someone. Maddie hesitated and then sighed. I can't control that. I'd hate to send in a rescue team in that sort of situation. I can see your dilemma, but I can't help you. Look, you're going to have to call Jack Morgan to get authorization. Morgan owned Private and ran its famous Los Angeles office. I put in a call to him an hour ago. He hasn't gotten back to me. Maddie chewed on her lip, then said, I'm sure he's okay. But if he hasn't checked in by noon, say, or if Jack hasn't called in, we'll activate the chip. Unless you hear from me, I'll be at the office at noon, Katerina said. I'll be there too, Maddie promised, and hung up. Outside, thunder boomed, and through a porthole window, she saw lightning split the sky. Rain began to drum on the roof of the aircraft. Maddie looked over at Sophia, who was watching her with genuine concern. Who's Chris? Sophia asked softly. Maddie swallowed at the sick taste seeping into her throat, and then replied, Until six weeks ago, Countess, he was my fiancé. Five. As dawn approaches, I find myself standing in a room with mirrors for walls and ceiling, and a big round bed with red sheets. I am naked in this room of mirrors, stripped of all disguises save one. The reconstructed face a surgeon in the Ivory Coast gave me twenty-three years ago. I look at my face, this ultimate mask, and smile because no one would ever know that behind it is me, and because a rare beauty has agreed to join me here in this room of reflection and pleasure. Except for the snakeskin stiletto heels, the stunning brown woman shutting the door is naked, too. She's from Guadalupe, or so she says. Her name is Genevieve, or so she says. Whoever she really is, she smiles weakly as I set the canvas bag I carry on the bed. I have seen you around before she says in an uncertain French accent. I don't even blink. Have you now? I think... She looks at my case and tenses. What's in there? Don't worry, I say. It's something rare and beautiful. She nods, but there's no conviction in the gesture. You seem concerned, I say. She rubs her hands together. Just nerves. One of my friends here, Ilse, she disappeared last week. You might have seen her. A spinner, German. I wave my hand dismissively. I don't remember names, my dear. They're artificial, made up. I mean, do you use your real name here, Genevieve? She hesitates, but then shakes her head. There you go now, I say in a teasing, friendly manner. It's all a fantasy. You can be whatever person you want to be, or anything you want to be. I am comfortable with that, are you? Her eyes shift, pause, and then she nods, the tiniest of nods. Good, I say, but part of me feels a twinge of anxiety. Did she see me with Ilse? No. That's impossible. I'm certain we were alone at all times. And so I opened the bag, revealing a primitive ivory and black leather mask crafted as a leering monster. The stain and lack of finish is cracked with time and burnished in places. 
but the lips have retained their deep henna color. So have the areas around the slits cut for the wearer's eyes. A Chukwe tribesman in the Congo made it a hundred years ago. I tell Genevieve, it's very rare. It cost me a small fortune. I put the mask on, hooking the hemp straps that hold it to my face so I can see clearly through the eye slits. The mask smells of Africa, of moldering wood and nutmeg and roasting peppers. My breath echoes inside the mask, slow and languid, like a leopard contemplating prey. I gesture for Genevieve to lie down on her back on the bed. She's staring at me and at my mask, and there's enough fear in her eyes that I feel myself stir and harden. That, my friends, is just perfect. Her mind is playing games, inventing scenarios far worse than what I have in mind for a late, late-night delight. Isn't it interesting how that works, that the mere suggestion of threat stirs the darkest regions of the mind? Sensing her fear, indeed, feeding on it, I kneel next to Genevieve, caressing her soft cocoa breasts, and then slide my fingers into her bare mystery, all the time glancing around at the mirrors that surround me, admiring my newest mask from an array of perspectives. I am not a young man, but I tell you one and all that my manhood stands like a spear when Genevieve begins to writhe under my insistent touch. It's an anxious writhing, and that only fuels me more until it's simply impossible to keep my desires at bay any longer. Pulling her around and throwing back her legs, I poise to enter her, my hips cocked. The breath of the beast I'm becoming rasps from my throat in sharp, cutting bursts. Genevieve looks up, clearly frightened by the monster crouched above her, which only excites me more. What is your name, Sherry? She asks in a quivering voice. What should I call you while we have sex? Me, I say, and then thrust savagely into her. I am the Invisible Man. Book One. The Slaughterhouse. Chapter One. Private Berlin occupied the penthouse suite atop a green glass and exposed steel Bauhaus-style building on the south side of Potsdamer Platz in Berlin's Mitte district. Clutching a cup of strong coffee, increasingly worried about her ex-fiancé and still groggy after less than five hours of sleep, Maddie Engel stepped out of the elevator into the agency's lobby at a little before noon. Three days late was not like Chris at all, she thought for what seemed the hundredth time unless he went off with someone, to Greece, or to Portugal, like we did when we first fell in love. Private Berlin's lobby featured polished steel sculptures that depicted milestones in the history of cryptography. She passed one of an Enigma machine and another that included the death mask of Blaise de Vigenière, the 16th century French secret code genius, whose blank eyes seemed to follow her as she crossed to a retina scan on a black pedestal next to pneumatic doors made of bulletproof glass. Before she could look into the scanner, Katerina Doric appeared on the screen above the doors. Olive-skinned with long, wild ringlets of hair, Katerina was one of the most exotically beautiful women Maddie had ever known. She was also one of the toughest, a second-generation Turkish-German who'd grown up in Vedding, a rugged immigrant neighborhood, and the only daughter among six sons. Katerina peered through her reading glasses. We're in the briefing room. Any word? Maddie asked. No, but we've got a video conference with Jack in five minutes. Maddie tried to suppress the anxiety that firmly took root in her after the screen went dark. She pressed her right eye to the scan, seeing a soft blue light pass left to right. The glass doors opened with a hydraulic sigh. Maddie trudged down a hallway that overlooked a long, linear park where the ground had been shaped into two huge triangles, one facing west and the other east. Until the fall of the Communist German Democratic Republic, or GDR, 
The park had been an infamous stretch of the Berlin Wall's no man's land, a garishly lit, wide and sandy stretch between the inner and outer cement barriers and the barbed wire and gun towers that had divided the city in two back in 1961. Ordinarily, Maddie would have paused to look down at the park because, no matter what her mood, it usually made her feel better. The park represented a terrible time in her family's life and in her city's life. But it was also a powerful symbol of new beginnings, and she believed in new beginnings. New beginnings were the only way to survive. That morning, however, Maddie could not get herself to look at the park. Deep in her gut, no matter how much she tried to quash it, she feared that Chris's disappearance hinted at the end of something. But I wanted us to stop, didn't I? Didn't I? Before Maddie could drown in those questions, she ducked into an amphitheater with rising tiers of desks that faced a curved wall of screens glowing flat blue, waiting for a feed. Katerina sat at a desk on the highest tier, beside a man who looked like an aging hippie, with long silver hair, round wire-rimmed glasses, a scruffy beard, and a Grateful Dead tie-dyed sweatshirt. His name was Ernst Gabriel, Dr. Ernst Gabriel, and he was the smartest person Maddie had ever known, a polymath with five advanced degrees, including an MD, a PhD in computer science, and master's degrees in physics and cultural anthropology. Gabriel was also a forensics expert and ran Private Berlin's investigative support system. He'd be the one turning on the tracking system and operating it. Maddie was climbing the stairs toward Gabriel and Katerina when a tall, muscular, bald man in his late 30s appeared behind them. Tom Burkhardt was Private Berlin's newest hire. Until recently, he'd been a top operator with GSG-9, Germany's elite counter-terror unit. He usually ran security details. Maddie frowned, wondering why Katerina had called him in. Hi, Burkhardt. Doc, Maddie said, before kissing Katerina on both cheeks. She took a seat between Burkhardt and Gabrielle just as the big screen at the front of the amphitheater blinked and then lit up with the handsome and very tanned face of Jack Morgan, owner and president of Private. Morgan peered at them and said, I just got in. I was sailing over from Catalina and don't have coverage out there. Is he still missing? He is, Jack. Going on three days now, Katerina replied in English. I'd like permission to activate his chip. Morgan winced slightly. The chip? You're sure? I wouldn't want to invade his privacy unnecessarily. His eyes shifted. Maddie, what do you think? Shouldn't this be your call? Maddie flushed. Jack, uh... I don't know if you heard, but we broke off the engagement. Morgan looked greatly surprised. I didn't. I'm sorry. When? Six weeks ago, she said. So it's entirely your call, Jack. Morgan digested that and then said, Gabriel, have you had a chance to look at his credit card receipts? His cell phone records? I just got in myself, but I did manage a quick search. Gabrielle replied. I've got a steady trail of purchases in and around Berlin and Frankfurt, all on his private card, until this past Thursday evening. And then, nothing. And I've got a long list of phone calls that ended about the same time. Nothing since. I haven't dug into the particulars yet. Morgan put his hands in a prayer pose. What was he working on? Chapter 2 Katerina gave her laptop several commands. Morgan's face shrunk and shifted left on the big screen. A photograph of a soccer player performing a dramatic scissors kick appeared beside him. This is Cassiano, the top striker for the Hertha Berlin Sports Club and the top goal scorer in the German Second League, Katerina said. Manchester United hired us to look into him because they are thinking of acquiring him. Even though Cassiano had proven himself a prolific scorer, the British team was concerned about the Brazilian's erratic play in a handful of games. They wanted him vetted before offering him a contract. Katerina said, But as of two Fridays ago, Chris told me he had just a few loose ends to look into, but he was leaning heavily toward clearing Cassiano. And Chris's other case? Morgan asked. 
Katerina typed on her laptop again. A video clip played showing a man wearing a wide-brimmed hat and dark sunglasses that shielded much of his face. He exited a black Porsche Cayenne and walked away from the camera. A beautiful, elegant woman climbed out the other side and followed him. That's Hermann Kruger, Katerina informed them. Billionaire. Early 50s, big art and car collector, very secretive. Doesn't like his name in the media. Grew up in the GDR, but took to capitalism quickly after the wall came down. He built a fortune in real estate here in Berlin and big public works projects in Africa. Maddie said, didn't we do some work for his company? Two years ago, Dr. Gabriel confirmed as he reworked the band that held his ponytail. A comprehensive review of their security system. But we didn't deal directly with Kruger himself. But Chris was dealing with him? No, Katerina said. Kruger's wife, Agnes, is the client. She believed he was seeing other women and asked us to look into it. As of the last update I got, Chris had located at least three mistresses. He'd also discovered that Kruger visited prostitutes, lots of them, sometimes twice a day. Burkhart snorted. Twice a day? An older guy like that must be taking testosterone supplements to be able to get it up that often. And Viagra. Maddie cringed. She'd had limited interaction with Burkhart since he'd joined private. But overall, she'd found him to be headstrong, crude, and abrasive. Perhaps good traits for a counterterrorism expert and bodyguard, but not, in Maddie's opinion, for the kind of delicate investigative work Private Berlin often performed. Chris didn't mention testosterone or Viagra, Katerina sniffed. But I know he had an appointment set for tomorrow to update Frau Kruger. How much would Hermann Kruger stand to lose if his philandering went public in a nasty divorce case? Morgan asked. A billion? Gabrielle replied. Maybe two. Private's owner thought about that. Why did Chris take time off? I don't know, Katerina said. He texted me last Monday that he needed a few days personal time and that he would call me on Thursday at the latest. He's such a hardworking guy, I gave him the time without questioning it. Of course, Morgan said. That's it. No other cases? Not that I... Not true, Gabrielle interrupted. He was working on something else, Jack. Chapter 3 My mother was the first to show me the power of masks. She was a makeup artist with the German state opera and ballet. She was also a traitor to her country, to her husband, and to me. But those are stories for another time. The Masks As a child, I lived with my mother and father in a prefabricated apartment building that the state erected in the far eastern reaches of Berlin, out where the city met farms where livestock was raised for milk and slaughter. I note this, my friends, only because in addition to being a raging alcoholic, my father was a professional butcher. The day I learned about the power of masks, my father was at work, and the opera house was dark for the season. I must have been about seven and had been sick with chicken pox. Trying to cheer me up, my mother climbed into the attic and brought down a large trunk. She opened it, and I swore I could smell old people in there. You know the scent of slow, inevitable decay? She pulled out a Papia Kratler mask, which featured smirking cartoon features, ruby lips, a gargantuan nose, wild eyes, and a raccoon tail for hair. She said it was last used fifty years before, during a parade in Ravensburg, down near the Swiss border. My mother said that the mask had once belonged to her mother, who had died in the bombing that reduced Berlin and my father to smoking rubble and desperation in the last year of Hitler's war. The mask had somehow survived. This mask is a miracle, 
my mother told me. A miracle. She set it aside and brought out another mask. This one black, narrower, and fitted across the bridge of the nose like a criminal's disguise. It's from Don Giovanni, the opera, she said as she slipped it on me. Who's Don Giovanni? I asked. A bad man who dies badly. That is how an evil person dies. The death of a sinner always reflects their life. Remember that. Of course, I would later learn that this was complete and utter nonsense. Death is never a form of retribution. Death is a thing of beauty, something to behold, a moment to celebrate. But good son that I was, I agreed earnestly. My mother brought out her makeup kit and showed me how to paint my face. She gave me surly lips, sunken eyes, and wicked brows that made me laugh. After she'd added a wig and glasses, I remember looking in the mirror and thinking I really was someone else. Most certainly not me anymore. Do you know why they use masks and makeup in the theater? My mother asked. I shook my head. A mask changes you. So does makeup. With the right mask, you can be anyone you want to be. With a mask, you can hide in plain sight. You can do what you want, act the way you want. With a mask, it's almost like you are invisible and free to be anyone or anything you desire. Like a prince or a tiger. I nodded, feeling possibility swelling inside me. Or a monster. Even a monster, my mother said, and kissed me on the head. Chapter 4 A new video appeared on the screens to the right of Jack Morgan's head. It showed a woman wearing a shabby black dress over black denim jeans. Maddie's initial thought was that at one time she must have been attractive. But the woman's hair was dry and must. Her skin was sallow, and her eyes were sunken and dark. She looked like she'd lived a very, very hard life. This is from our lobby camera early morning two Fridays ago, Gabrielle told them. Here, Chris comes out to meet her. Maddie frowned, feeling strange and then hollow when Chris went to the woman and embraced her, pressing his cheek to hers and rubbing her back. Who is she? Maddie managed. I don't know, Gabrielle replied, taking off his glasses and rubbing his eyes. But I did see her come out of his office about an hour after these images were taken. I also heard him say that he would look into something for her, and there would be no charge. They hugged again, she left. Morgan said, Can you go into Chris's files, find out who she is? With your permission, Jack, Gabrielle replied. Granted, Morgan said. Gabrielle typed again. He paused, seemed puzzled, and typed again. That's odd, he muttered. What? Maddie asked, leaning over to see the scientist's screen. The old hippie was typing again. This should do it. But instead of Schneider's digital file folders, Gabrielle's screen was filled with bright pink, emerald, and black pixels that seemed to shift and move and crawl over one another as if they were alive. What the hell is that? Gabrielle said, shocked and staring at the screen. What's going on, Doc? Morgan demanded. Gabrielle mumbled in disbelief. I think we've been hacked. Up on the big screen, Morgan looked perplexed and then angered. That's impossible, he sputtered. I just spent millions upgrading the security system. Gabrielle, you were part of that effort. The computer scientist held up his hands in surrender. I was, Jack, but I've never seen anything like this before. It's like someone dumped thousands of termites into Chris's work area. They've eaten all the data. Katerina Doric interrupted. I thought you once told me that you can always bring back echoes of files, Doc. Not this time, he replied. Whoever did this was good, Cat. Scary good. 
Morgan looked furious, but said, We'll deal with this breach later. Between the hacking and the cases he was working on, I think we've got cause enough to activate Chris's chip. Do it, Doc. Maddie nodded her agreement with Morgan's decision, but she felt agitated by questions that suddenly shot at her from all sides. Who hacked the system? Why? What if it's a coincidence? What if this is separate and Chris is off on a vacation he decided to extend? What if we find him there with another woman? Should I care? I do. But should I? Give me a minute, Jack, Gabrielle said, entering a command that stripped his screen of the brilliant termites. He typed in a second command and his screen filled with a long list of names. He scrolled down to Chris Schneider's and then highlighted a corresponding series of numbers and letters. After making a copy of that code, Gabrielle called up an application called SkyEye. He entered the code into a blinking box and hit enter. Half of the amphitheater's screen jumped to a Google Earth view of Berlin. Maddie was first to spot the blinking orange icon out on the far eastern outskirts of the city, several kilometers south of the neighborhood of Ahrensfelde, Maddie said, puzzled. Can you bring us in, Doc? Gabrielle was already ahead of her. He highlighted the blinking icon and hit enter. The picture zoomed down and in, revealing the blurry image of a building in the shape of an L. It had an arched roof that looked broken in places. Dense vegetation pressed in around the place, which abutted a large, undeveloped space choked with trees and brush. Cross-reference it with the city plan, Maddie said. A moment later, an address popped up on the screen along with a file. Gabrielle clicked on the file and it opened, revealing a PDF of the building's handwritten property records. Blown up on the screen that way, the words Maddie read sent an involuntary shudder through her for reasons she could not fully explain. What's it say? Morgan demanded. Maddie looked at her boss and replied with a slight tremor in her voice. It says the building is abandoned now. Has been for 25 years. But back in the communist era, it was a state-run Schlachthaus. A slaughterhouse. Chapter 5 a few minutes later, Maddie rode in the passenger seat of an agency BMW, while Tom Burkhart drove them across the Spree River and then east through the city toward the neighborhood or keys of Ahrensfelde. Jack Morgan had ordered them out to the slaughterhouse and demanded that Dr. Gabriel start figuring out how in the hell someone had managed to breach Private's state-of-the-art firewall. Katerina was supposed to go to Chris's apartment to see if his personal computer contained any notes on the cases he was working. Burkhart said nothing as he drove. Maddie was glad for it. She was in no mood to talk. Apprehension had enveloped her, and she tried to fend off the sense of being trapped by studying the giant television tower with its revolving ball and spire looming high above Berlin, getting closer with every moment. The communists built the tower in 1965 as a way of showing the West that they were modern enough to accomplish such a feat. At more than 300 meters high, it was visible from virtually everywhere in Berlin on a sunny day. But it was gray now. The clouds hung low in the sky. Drizzle had begun to fall on the tower and on the S-Bahn, the elevated train station at Alexanderplatz, a bustling part of the city, day and night. The tower loomed over it all, as did the Park Inn Hotel, a communist-era building that had been spruced up. The park is where Westerners would stay when visiting East Berlin before the wall came down. It was said that there were more electronic bugs in the park hotel than anywhere else on Earth. Maddie tried to imagine Chris at 18. In her mind, she saw her ex-fiancé standing out there on the plaza between the tower and the park hotel, one of half a million protesters gathered in early November 1989. She saw Chris and the others acting and speaking in defiance of the scores of Stasi, the dreaded and oppressive East German secret police, who surrounded Alexanderplatz that night, filming the crowd, trying to intimidate the protesters into disbanding. During their two-year romance, Chris had told Maddie very little about his childhood and adolescence. She knew that his parents died in an auto accident when he was eight, and that he'd grown up in an orphanage out in the countryside somewhere southeast of Berlin. But Chris also told her that shortly after the uprising began in earnest, 
He left the orphanage with some friends and went to Berlin, ending up on Alexanderplatz the night of the largest protest, the one that showed the world how much the East Germans wanted freedom. Chris said that he'd felt like his life really began that night, as the wall began to crack and crumble, falling not five days later. I was free for the first time in my life, Chris said. We were all free, everyone. Do you remember, Maddie, what it felt like? Sitting next to Burkhardt as they drove east, hearing Chris's words echo in her mind, Maddie did remember. She saw herself at 16 on the west side of Checkpoint Charlie, cheering and singing and dancing with her mother when East Berliners broke through the wall there and came freely into the West for the first time in more than 28 years. Maddie remembered seeing her mother's face when her sister came through the wall that night. They had all wept for joy. Then, in Maddie's mind, her mother's teary face blurred and became Chris's the morning he'd asked her to marry him. She felt a ball in her throat and had to fight not to cry in front of Burkhardt. Maddie's cell phone rang. It was Dr. Gabriel. Good news, he said. He's moving. Not much, a couple of meters this way and that, but he's moving. Oh, thank God, Maddie cried. Then she looked at Burkhart. He's alive. Well, all right then, the counterterrorism expert said, downshifting and accelerating east on Karl Marx Alley. Maddie's mind spun as the prefabricated Soviet-style architecture that surrounded them became a blur out the window. Was Chris injured? What was he doing in an old slaughterhouse? Was I wrong to have ended it? Was I? Do I still love him? Don't beat yourself up, Burkhardt said, breaking her from her thoughts. Maddie looked over at him. About what? Ending your engagement with him, Burkhardt said. Easier said than done, given the circumstances, Maddie shot back, annoyed that she was evidently so transparent. You break it off, Burkhart pressed. Or did he? That's none of your business, she said hotly. I take it you did, then. Mind telling me why? I do mind. Just get me there, okay? Burkhart shrugged. Helps to talk about stuff with an impartial observer. Not always, she said and turned to look out the window again. Chapter 6 The skies had taken on a coal and ash color by the time they reached that wooded area they'd seen on the satellite imagery. They circled the woods, seeing only bike trails before finding the vine-choked drive that led to the old slaughterhouse. The rain was squalling now, blown by gusts from the east. Burkhart parked just as Maddie's cell phone rang. It was Katerina. We're just getting here, Kat, Maddie said. The super at Chris's building won't let me in, she complained. He says he'll let you in, but not me. I don't think it's going to be necessary, Maddie replied. Gabriel said he's moving around inside. Oh, Katerina said, sighing. Oh, thank God, Maddie. I'll let you know when we've got him, Maddie said and hung up. She tugged up her hood and got out, heading straight into the vines, which she pushed and hacked through until she'd reached a clearing of sorts. The walls of the slaughterhouse were cement block and rose to a line of blown-out windows below the eaves of an arched roof. The place was covered in old graffiti, including a skull stamped with a dripping blood-red X. Maddie felt unnerved, which was completely unlike her. She'd been a full-fledged Cripo investigator for the Berlin Criminal Police for ten years, five of them in homicide, and had another two years working high-profile cases for private. She'd seen the worst one man could do to another, and Maddie always handled these incidents like the professional she was. But now, seeing that graffiti, she felt like ignoring years of training and yelling out to him. Out of the corner of her eye, she caught Burkhart drawing his Glock, she drew her own pistol, whispering, Bluetooth, I'm going to call Doc. Burkhart fished in his pocket and came up with an earpiece. Then he donned latex gloves. Maddie did the same. The wind gusted, amplifying the drumming of the rain on the leaves and causing a chain to clank somewhere. I think that door's open, Burkhart muttered. Maddie moved toward it through the sopping wet grass and weeds, redialing Dr. Gabriel's number. He answered immediately. Give us a patch, Doc. 
She saw Burkhardt pause, then touch his Bluetooth and nod. You reading our position? Maddie murmured. Great signal, Gabrielle replied. You're a hundred meters from him. Guide us, Burkhardt said. We're going in an open door on the southeast face of the longer, thinner section of the building. You're looking to go down through that long arm to the north, Gabrielle said. He's in the wider part. Looks like he's up against the east wall. Maddie followed Burkhardt's lead when he got out a pen light that he held tight to his Glock. He pushed at the barn door with his foot. It creaked open, revealing a cement-floored hallway with drains set at intervals down its center and partitions every four meters or so. Maddie peered closer at the floor. It was covered in old trash and dust. No footprints, she muttered to Burkhardt, who'd stepped inside. Probably came in from the other end. Maddie stepped into the hallway after Burkhardt, who moved forward like a cat while flashing his light into the side rooms. Trash. Rat shit. Graffiti. Grime and bolts sticking out of the wall about knee-high and again about shoulder height. Seeing the bolts, Maddie felt a distinct sense of menace around her. What did they do in here? She whispered to Burkhart. He twisted his head quickly. His neck made a cracking sound. Look like animal stalls to me. They probably kept the livestock in here awaiting slaughter. It made sense, but Maddie could not shake that sense of threat. Indeed, the closer they got to the barn doors at the end of the hallway, the more pronounced the feeling became. She could barely breathe when Burkhart slid back one of the double doors. Pigeons spooked and flapped toward the empty windows. East wall, Maddie said. She and Burkhart both swung their beams in that direction, hearing Gabrielle say, He should be right there at 30 meters. Maddie felt her heart sink as their beams played over garbage, Rusted bolts jutting from the floor and old pipes sticking out of the wall. No one here, Doc. What? That's impossible. Gabrielle paused. There, he's moving. Moving? Burkhart said. He's not moving. He's not here. I'm telling you he's moving north along that east wall. But they saw nothing but cobwebs, dirt, and old bottles and trash. Then Maddie caught a flicker of movement and heard glass rolling on cement. She swung her light, the powerful beam finding an enormous rat that froze, blinded, sitting up on its haunches, staring into the light, eyes blinking and nose twitching. There was something shiny between its teeth. Boom! The gunshot surprised Maddie so much she jumped hard left, landing and then tripping on one of the bolts on the floor. She sprawled in the dirt. She glanced up at Burkhart. What the hell did you do that for? It had something in its mouth, Burkhart said, crossing to the east wall, light trained on the dead rat. As Maddie struggled to her feet, he crouched over the rodent a moment, then stood and turned to face her. We need to call in Crippo, now. She felt her heart break. Why? Burkhart held up what looked like a thin hearing aid battery, partially wrapped in a chunk of gnawed and livid flesh. Chapter 7 Have you ever seen that old movie, The Invisible Man? Claude Rains, the same guy who played the enigmatic French captain in Casablanca, stars as a mad scientist who turns homicidal after he figures out how to erase his visible body. Not surprisingly, it's one of my absolute favorite films of all time. One scene in particular never fails to leave me howling with laughter. In it, Reigns is covered in bandages and has taken refuge at an inn run by the Irish actress Una O'Connor. She happens to enter Reigns' room when he's removed the bandages on his head. He looks decapitated, but alive. O'Connor's eyes bulge. She goes over the top insane. She starts to shriek bloody murder. It's my special moment, one I wish I could recreate in my own life. 
But alas, attaining invisibility is an art more than a science. For instance, I have found over the past 25 years that the best thing you can do to remain unseen is to relax and inhabit your mask so thoroughly that people come to think nothing of you, especially in Berlin, my beautiful city of scars. I'm not being poetic here. I am telling you the truth. Pay attention now. My friends, let me state unequivocally that if you are relaxed in Berlin, comfortable in your own scarred skin, and not causing outward trouble, the millions of scarred Berliners around you will just go on about their silly days, unaware of beings like me, or at least not believing in their wildest nightmares that someone like me could still live among them, unexposed, unrecorded, still hunting. With all that in mind, I am very, very cool as I drive an unmarked white panel van, one of a small fleet of vehicles I have collected over the years through the rainy Berlin streets, past the scars of Hitler and the Russians and the wall, way out to a forest north of Ahrensfeld, and down a wet, wooded lane to a children's camp on Liebnitz Lake, not far from the sleepy village of Utsdorf. Do you know Utsdorf? It doesn't matter. Just understand that there is no one at that camp today. At least, that's how it appears at first glance. Then again, why would there be? It's pouring out and cold and there's dense fog building out on the water around the island. I park near the dock. No sooner do I shut off the engine than my young genius friend appears on the porch of the boathouse. He's bearded, mid-twenties, and his soaking wet hair hangs on his fogged glasses. He takes them off and tries to dry them on a wet sweatshirt that features the emblem of the Berlin Technical University. I take a gym bag from the passenger seat of my van and climb out, leaving the engine running. How did you get here? I ask, climbing up onto the porch out of the rain. Bus and walked, like you said. I got fucking soaked. Ever heard of a raincoat? I ask. Wasn't raining when I started, he says irritated. You have the money? I hold up the bag. Twenty-five thousand euros, as agreed. Let me see, my friend says, reaching for the bag. I keep it just out of his reach. Not before I see what I'm buying. He looks pissed off, but he goes to a hiker's pack against the boathouse wall. He retrieves a disc and hands it to me, saying, All of Schneider's work files. Did you look at them? I ask in a super relaxed manner. That would be against my ethics, he replies but his body language says otherwise. Once he hands me the disc, I play along and give him the bag of money. He opens it and checks several packets of 50 euro notes. Nice doing business with you, he says, zipping the bag up. Yes, I say, pocketing the disc and finding the handle end of a flathead screwdriver. Need a lift to the bus stop? That would be great, he says, turning back toward his knapsack. I take two quick steps behind him, grab his hair, and drive the sharpened blade of the screwdriver up under the nape of his skull. Chapter 8 My young genius friend never has the chance to scream but as the blade finds the soft spot where spinal column becomes brain, his entire body goes electric and herky-jerky. 
When at last he drops my money and sags against me, I'm panting, spent and rubber-legged, as if I've just had the most explosive sex imaginable. What a thrill! What an amazing, amazing thrill! Even after all these years, that rush never gets old. I stand there for several moments in the aftermath of a great death. Calm, drained, sated, and yet hyper-aware of everything around me. The rain, the clouds, the forest, and the whistling of ducks out there in the fog. With his body in my hands, with the sense of his life force still vibrating in me, it's like I'm here and not hovering on the edge of the afterlife, you know? At last, I roll him over on his belly and draw out the screwdriver. I get out a tube of super glue and use it to seal the entry wound at the back of his neck. No more blood. It's done in seconds. I chuckle as I drag my young genius friend toward my van, thinking how strange it is that there are people out there in the world, people far deeper and more philosophical than me, who spend their lives wondering if a tree falling in woods like this makes a crashing sound if there's no one around to hear it. What a stupid goddamn thing to spend your life thinking about. Don't they know they would be better off pondering whether a man like me can exist when he's never been truly seen? Chapter 9 Hauptkommissar Hans Dietrich was a living legend inside Berlin Kripo, an investigator with low-key, unorthodox tactics that nevertheless resulted in the highest solve rate of any detective in the department's eight divisions. The High Commissar was a tall crane of a man, early fifties, quiet, moody, and extremely private, rarely fraternizing with other cops. He was even said to resent the fact that he had to work with a second detective on homicide cases. Maddie had heard about Dietrich during her many years with Berlin Kripo, of course, but she'd never had the chance to work with him directly. Still, an hour after their initial call to Kripo, she was more than relieved when she saw him walking toward her beneath a black umbrella in a gray suit, his somber face revealing nothing. If anyone could find out what had happened to Chris, it was this man. Maddie and Burkhardt moved around the uniformed officer now guarding the front of the slaughterhouse and went to meet Dietrich. They showed him their private badges and identified themselves. I know who you are, Frau Engel, Dietrich said, his eyes flickering toward the abattoir. Your reputation precedes you. Maddie felt Burkhardt looking at her, puzzled. Her cheeks started to burn. A blue Kripo bus appeared, splashing toward the slaughterhouse. Maddie knew what that meant. Every time a body is found in Berlin, Kripo sends out one of these specially equipped buses. They contain all the equipment and supplies needed to fully document a murder scene. Seeing the bus, Maddie became angry. With all due respect, High Commissar, we don't know that this is a homicide yet. Someone could have taken Chris, discovered the chip, then cut it out of him so we couldn't find him. Dietrich blinked, took his attention off the slaughterhouse, and replied in a chilly tone. That's what I am here to find. Hi, Commissar, came a woman's shrill voice. Dietrich grimaced and looked over his shoulder at the stout little woman in her mid-twenties, marching earnestly up the driveway toward them. He sighed heavily. Inspector Sandra Weigel, my trainee. Inspector Weigel beamed at Maddie and Burkhardt as they introduced themselves, before turning to Dietrich. What shall I do, High Commissar? Weigel asked. Stay out of my way and listen, Dietrich growled at her. Then he looked back at Maddie and Burkhardt. Now take me inside, show me where you found the chip, and tell me everything I need to know. Chapter 10 As they donned blue surgical booties and latex gloves under an awning that had been set up outside the slaughterhouse, Maddie and Burkhardt brought Dietrich up to speed on Chris Schneider's cases and activities during the prior two weeks, finishing with the decision to activate the GPS chip 
and its discovery in the main hall of the slaughterhouse two hours before. Inspector Weigel took copious notes. Dietrich took none. He just stood there, listening intently, expressionless. He asked only one question. No footprints. Burkhardt shook his head. None, but the dust in there is rippled, like someone used one of those blowers that gardeners use to erase all tracks. Matty frowned. Burkhardt had not mentioned that before. Dietrich gave Burkhardt a glance of reappraisal and then went inside the slaughterhouse. The hallway was lit now with Klieg lights. The high commissar walked toward the main slaughterhouse slowly, methodically, his eyes going everywhere, saying nothing. Maddie said, the room where we found the chip, it's big. Private could bring in its forensics team to help. We have state and federal certification. Dietrich shook his head and continued on with his inspection, as if the idea were completely out of the question. A team of criminalists was setting up lights and gathering samples at the east end of the main slaughterhouse where the chip had been found. Dietrich examined the dead rat and then looked up at Burkhardt. Remind me not to anger you, Herr Burkhardt. Burkhardt shrugged. Just a lot of practice. You have the chip? Dietrich asked. Maddie dug in her pants pocket and came up with a plastic evidence sleeve with the chip and the flesh inside. Dietrich took it from her and studied it closely. Hi, Commissar, one of the evidence specialists called. He was crouched over a bolt protruding from the floor beneath the rusty overhead track. I've got something here. Dietrich stiffened and hesitated before looking at Maddie and Burkhardt. I'm sorry, but I'll have to ask you to leave now. What? Maddie said. Why? This is a crime scene. I can't have any more contamination. Contamination? Maddie said. We did everything by the book in here. We backed out the second we found the chip and we waited for Crippo. So you did, Dietrich replied calmly. It does not change things. You'll have to leave. You should know, Frau Engel. It's department policy. Maddie shook her head, unable to control her anger. Hi, Commissar. Until six weeks ago, Chris was my fiancé. I have every right to be here. Dietrich softened, but still shook his head. I'm sorry for you, he replied quietly. But you have no right to be here. So leave, or I'll have you taken out. Maddie was gathering herself to protest one more time when she felt Burkhardt's massive hand on her shoulder. We should go now, Maddie. Give Crippo some space. We've got other things to take care of. Maddie's shoulders sagged and she felt like crying, but she nodded. Good, Dietrich said. And if you'll be so kind as to come to my office tomorrow morning at nine, I will tell you what we've found. We will too, Burkhardt offered. Private wants to help. I'd prefer you don't launch a shadow investigation, Dietrich said. Maddie hardened. As long as Chris is missing, we'll keep searching. Dietrich shrugged. Fair enough. Negotiated cooperation, then. Deal, Burkhardt said, and led Maddie away. The high commissar followed them to the south entry to the slaughterhouse and watched them walk down the driveway in the pelting rain. Inspector Weigel came up beside him. Excuse me, sir, but I thought you told me before they came that we wouldn't be cooperating with private in any way. Dietrich did not look at his young trainee. What's that old saying, Weigel? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer? Private's investigators are enemies? Weigel asked. There's a man missing. Their man, Weigel, Dietrich said. We certainly can't treat them as friends. Chapter 11 I take a left turn onto the lane that runs past the old slaughterhouse and see the police barrier immediately. A uniformed police officer is letting two people leave, a tall man imposing and bald and a blonde woman wearing a navy blue rain slicker with a hood up. They walk toward me, and a BMW parked on the shoulder. For a second, I can't breathe. Dots dance before my eyes. I feel like they're a pack of snarling dogs suddenly biting at my ankles. 
What have they found? My young genius is wrapped in a blue top behind me on the van floor, but I'm not thinking of him. I'm being strangled by that question. What have they found? Then old training kicks in. I get a hold of myself and quickly lower the sun visor. The passenger windows of my van are slightly tinted. All the man and the woman will see is a silhouette of me as I pass them and the police barrier. I take my first breath, then another, and by the fifth I have to fight not to hyperventilate. But I get the van turned into an alley that runs between the two old apartment buildings up the hill from the slaughterhouse. In seconds I'm out on a main drag, heading back toward the neighborhood of Melro. My stomach churns. The first chance I get, I pull over, park, and put my head on the steering wheel. What have they found? And who was that big bald guy with the woman? The air around me suddenly seems negatively charged, and that sets off true panic in me. Sweat boils on my forehead and trickles down my spine. I force myself to go through everything that occurred inside the slaughterhouse three days ago. Everything! What could be left? Blood stains on the boat, perhaps? Or spinal fluid? Maybe some bone fragments, I decide at last. But they won't know whose blood or bone it is, now will they? Unless dear Chris left behind DNA samples. But those tests take days. Weeks, right? There's nothing else. I've seen to it all. I'm sure of it. Unless Chris told someone where he was going. No, it was personal. He came for me alone. Given the lack of other evidence, I tell myself the police will soon let it go. A blood stain in an old slaughterhouse. They'll think someone tripped and gouged their leg or something, right? I almost convince myself before doubt takes a stroll through my mind. What if they were to keep looking? This possibility agitates me so much, I twist around to look into the rear of the van at the shape of the corpse in the tarp. Every cell in my body wants to drive by the slaughterhouse to get another look. Try to get a sense of the scope of the police action, but I know I can't. Smart cops look for that kind of thing. In the end, I tell myself to return home, or better to call and meet the woman who thinks I love her. Put a sense of normality in my visible life. Rebuild the mask once more. I'll come by tomorrow in a different vehicle. If the police are gone, then I'll dispose of the young genius's body in the normal way, and things will go on as they always have. But if they're still there, I'll have no choice but to erase the slaughterhouse and all its dirty little secrets forever. Chapter 12 I should be in there. Maddie complained as Burkhart clicked open the doors of the BMW. The white panel van passing by barely registered in her brain. Burkhart shook his head and climbed in. Maddie got in angrily beside him. I should. No, Dietrich is right. They need impartial people in there. You're saying I'm not impartial? Maddie demanded. Yes, that's what I'm saying, Burkhart said, starting the car. You couldn't be. If you were impartial in this situation, I'd wonder about you as a human. Maddie did not know what to say. Burkhart turned on the windshield wipers, which slapped away the wet leaves. Maddie threw up her hands. I've got to do something. I can't just... We're going to Chris's apartment. Berlin is a huge city geographically, almost 341 square miles. And Chris Schneider lived far from Ahrensfelde, west of Tiergarten Park and the zoo. It took them 40 minutes to get there in the late afternoon traffic. Maddie had gone quiet again, looking out at the cityscape as they crossed back from the old east into the west. Maddie had lived in Berlin her entire life. She was a Berliner through and through. 
She loved the city, its architecture, people, art, laid-back attitude, and entrepreneurial spirit. But now, in light of the mystery surrounding Chris's disappearance, Berlin seemed suddenly to her to be an alien place, inhabited by creatures who might cut a tracking chip out of a man's back and feed it to rats. They passed the ruins of the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial, the roofless grand entry hall and wounded spire of a church that somehow survived a bombing raid in 1943. The scorched ruins sat on a grand plaza beside an ultra-modern belfry. The ruins were among Chris's favorite places in the city. He liked to sit and contemplate the spire, which looked like it had been cleaved in two by the bomb. One side collapsed and fell. The other still stood, jagged against the sky. Left on Goethe, yes? Burkhardt asked, shaking Maddie from her thoughts. She startled, looked around, and then said, Correct. Chris lived in a second-floor apartment on Gutenbergstrasse, in the Charlottenburg district of the city. It was a slightly frumpy address for a man of Schneider's age, but he'd loved the place because it gave him close access to the zoo and to Tiergarten Park, where he liked to run. Maddie had not been to Chris's place in more than six weeks. Her last visit weighed heavily on her mind as they used her key to open the door to the building. There was a courtyard with grass and raised garden beds. The one below Chris's apartment had been freshly tilled. There were bags of tulip bulbs sitting near a hoe and shovel. A BMW motorcycle was parked on the grass. Maddie frowned. She knew the superintendent of the building, a cantankerous man named Kraus. She'd never known him to allow motorcycles in his courtyard, or bikes for that matter. She put that aside and led Burkhardt up an interior staircase to a second floor landing. She hesitated. At some level, she felt like this place was forbidden to her now, no matter what might have happened to Chris. That key doesn't work on this door? Burkhardt asked. Or are you worried Dietrich is going to have a shit fit if he finds out we've been in here? Screw Dietrich, Maddie said, and rammed the key into the lock. She turned the knob and pushed the door open. Chapter 13 The leather couch and chairs had been overturned. The upholstery slashed, the stuffing torn out. Books littered the floor. The closets had been opened, their contents strewn all about. Mattie smelled trash rotting and heard a cat mewing. Socrates, she called, walking inside. Here, kitty. This is a crime scene now, Burkhardt said. We can't go in. It's a tossed apartment, she shot back. Let's figure out what they took. Mattie stopped and donned the same latex gloves she'd worn at the slaughterhouse. The cat had stopped crying. Burkhardt grimaced, but then followed her lead. She walked gingerly through the debris, including shattered glass from picture frames. Several of the pictures showed Chris and Maddie, arms around each other, smiling as if they were the happiest couple on earth. How had it all gone so wrong? How had this happened? The chip, the hacking, and now his apartment is tossed, and why? What was Chris on to? Maddie reached the alcove where Chris often worked at home. She spotted the smashed laptop on the floor and went to it. She crouched and used a pen to push aside the pieces, barely aware of Burkhart picking up a photograph of Chris and a young boy. Angle, is this? Burkhart began. Fuck! Maddie cried, cutting him off. They got his hard drive! Fuck! All right, we know what they were after then, Burkhart said, setting the picture down. We are out of here. We call Crippo. Maddie stood and pushed by him. I'm finding his cat. You wait at the car. She did not wait for an answer, but instead walked down the hallway past the kitchen, where dirty dishes and takeout Thai food boxes contributed to a foul reek. She stopped breathing in through her mouth and went into the bedroom, which was painted bright white. The comforter was bright white, too. So were the drapes which billowed with the gusts of wind and rain blowing in through the open French windows that overlooked the courtyard. Rain soaked the rug below the windows. There was a wastebasket by the bed filled to the brim with papers, one of the few containers that had not been emptied in the entire apartment. Maddie crossed to it and saw several crumpled pieces of paper on top. She was picking one up when she heard a meow. She looked over and saw Socrates, Chris's charcoal and gray tabby, coming out of the bathroom. 
Mattie took a step toward him, grinning. There you are. Then she spotted the imprint of soles on the wet rug. She followed the tracks with her eyes to the closet door at her immediate right, then slipped the crumpled paper into her pocket, took a step toward the cat, and started to reach for her pistol, saying, Good, Socrates. You hungry? The closet door exploded outward. Chapter 14 A burly man in black leathers and a motorcycle helmet smashed into Maddie's left side and blew her off her feet. She crashed to the rug next to Socrates. The man tried to kick her in the stomach, but she saw it coming and curled up so her thigh took the impact. He took two steps to the window and jumped out. Maddie fought to get to her feet, drawing her pistol. She heard the motorcycle engine growl to life and staggered to the window just as he popped the clutch, throwing up grass as he wove toward the entry to the building. Without thinking, Maddie jumped. She landed in the soggy, freshly tilled bed and then rolled out of it as a parachutist might. She saw Krauss coming into the courtyard from the opposite side, horror on his face. Matty, he cried. She had no time to explain. The motorcyclist was getting away. She sprinted through the building's main door, hoping to catch the license plate. The motorcyclist was accelerating west. She could see his back and helmet, but no license plate. Shit, she cried. The BMW screeched up beside her, Burkhardt at the wheel. Get in. She jumped in the passenger seat and they went squealing after the motorcyclist, who braked and turned onto English Estrasse, heading south. By the time they reached the corner, he was turning west again, paralleling the canal in the campus of the Technical University. Burkhardt downshifted and almost caught him before he crossed the March Bridge onto campus. Students were diving out of the way of the motorcycle and Burkhardt's car as they raced through campus. At a roundabout, the rider curled left onto Hardenbergstrasse and then crossed under the Zoologische S-Bahn station, where he wove hard to his right onto Joachim Stahler, then sharply left onto Kantstrasse, heading east toward the ruins of the Belfry Tower. Despite the serpentine course they ran through the city, Burkhardt had somehow managed to close the gap again when the man who'd trashed Chris's apartment dodged without warning across traffic and up onto the plaza that surrounded the ruins. Don't you dare, Maddie cried at Burkhart. There are people all over that plaza. Take the next ride at Budapester instead. Burkhart gritted his teeth but did as he was told, lucking out that the light was in his favor. The street ran parallel to the plaza. Maddie could see the motorcyclist weaving through pedestrians who scattered ahead of him. There's got to be a cop there somewhere, Maddie said. They're never around when you need them, Burkhart said, barreling down Budapesterstrasse. The motorcyclist veered off the plaza and out onto Budapester. But Burkhardt was right behind him. He's got no license plate, Maddie said. I imagine not, Burkhardt said, as they shot off-road through the busy Palma Platz. Burkhardt was a genius behind the wheel. He made every move the motorcyclist did until they crossed the canal again east of the zoo. On the immediate north side, the motorcycle suddenly braked hard, as if trying to avoid something in the road ahead. Bastard gonna knock you down, Burkhardt said, hammering the gas. The BMW's front left fender just missed the rear wheel of the motorcycle as it veered hard left onto Corneliastrasse. Burkhardt slammed on his brakes, threw the car in reverse, and then squealed after the motorcyclist. But Maddie already had a sinking feeling in her stomach. She knew this part of Berlin well. She and Chris had run here often. Straight ahead two blocks, the way west was blocked, except for pedestrians and bicyclists who could access a trail that ran along the canal inside Tiergarten Park and between the zoo and Neuer Lake. The last Maddie saw of the motorcyclist, he was accelerating west on the canal path, and then he disappeared behind the falling leaves, the pouring rain, and the waning light of day. Chapter 15 Hauptkommissar? Hans Dietrich turned to his trainee. He towered over her, looking exasperated. What is it, Weigel? Standing in the eastern end of the slaughterhouse, Inspector Weigel's cheeks reddened, but then she stammered, The technicians have found blood samples. Many of them. Dietrich stiffened, hesitated, and then sputtered, Well... I imagine so. It was a slaughterhouse. 
sir, they want to know what you want them to do. He hesitated again and then said, take 20 random samples. The inspector paused, then nodded uncertainly. Hupt commissar, are you not feeling well? Dietrich stared at her a moment, and then he looked at his watch. 4.10. He did his best to appear stricken. No, as a matter of fact, I feel like I'm coming down with something. I... I think I shall have to go home. Sir? Weigel said. A 12-hour bug, Dietrich said. If you find something of significance, call me. Twenty minutes later, the High Commissar was driving his old opal down a corridor of horse chestnut trees that lined both sides of Pushkin Ali, heading toward Treptower Park in southeast Berlin. Dietrich glanced in his rearview mirror, seeing the television tower at Alexanderplatz, framed in the road behind him. His lip curled. He hated the tower. He hated everything it stood for. He'd heard lately that real estate speculators were going to tear it down as part of the redevelopment of Alexanderplatz. Dietrich thought the tower was a good thing to be rid of. A very good thing. As an investigator, he had learned well that the past is always eventually buried, especially in a city. It may take centuries, it may take mass destruction, but the past is always eventually reduced to rubble, dust, and rumor. As far as the High Commissar was concerned, the sooner the burial happened in certain parts of Berlin, the better. Which is why, as he approached Treptower Park, Dietrich felt like he'd been forced to pick up a shovel and dig into a mound of radioactive material. He knew he had to do it, but he feared he might be destroyed in the process. He parked the opal and checked his watch. It was 4.40 p.m. He had 20 minutes. He swallowed hard, grabbed his umbrella, and struggled from the car. In a long, ungainly gait that caused his head to bob forward with every step, the high commissar hurried south on a lane that ran through sopping autumn woods until he reached a vast rectangular opening in the forest. He passed a statue of a mother crying. Mother Russia, crying. He walked up a long promenade lined with weeping silver birches toward two massive red monuments facing each other. The red granite had been taken from Hitler's chancellery and then carved into giant, stylized flags adorned with the Soviet Union's hammer and sickle. Below the flags, bronze statues of war-weary Russian soldiers knelt facing each other. In the distance, framed between the two soldiers, stood a third statue. This warrior was ten times the size of the others. The noble Soviet carried a German child. At his feet lay a broken Nazi swastika. The High Commissar climbed the stairs and walked between the kneeling statues. He looked out over a graveyard of 5,000 of Stalin's soldiers who died in the battle for Berlin at the end of World War II. But Dietrich was not looking at the 16 crypts that held the bodies, nor was he thinking about Stalin or the particulars of the Soviet war memorial. He was peering beyond all of it, through the lightly falling rain to a path that ran parallel to the cemetery through a grove of trees. In the dull pewter light in the rain, a lone figure appeared from the trees in a black raincoat, jogging pants, and shoes. He strode briskly down the path, arms pumping and his head up like a dog on alert. The high commissar checked his watch. 5 p.m. on the dot. He shook his head in mild disbelief. Like fucking clockwork. Chapter 16 Dietrich watched the figure move away from him toward the rear of the war memorial and calculated his speed. When he thought he had it right, he headed off at a slant to the walker, weaving through the sarcophagi and losing sight of his quarry for several minutes. The high commissar stopped on the north side of the statue of the victorious Soviet and the German child. The rain had slowed, so he could hear the slap of the man's feet coming long before he spotted him. Oberst, Dietrich said. Colonel, can I have a moment of your time? The colonel was old, in his 80s at least, but his bearing was autocratic, a man used to giving orders and having them carried out. And he had a steel-blue penetrating stare that slashed all over the high commissar before a look of disgust curled his lip. He did not slow his pace and tried to get by him. Dietrich reached out and grabbed the older man by the elbow. I need to talk. I need your help, your advice. 
You need my help. The colonel laughed spitefully and wrenched his arm free with surprising strength. For years, you want nothing to do with your own father, and now, out of nowhere, after, what, ten years, you need? For a moment, Dietrich felt as sick as he'd claimed to be earlier in the afternoon. His stomach ached, and he was bombarded by a sense of claustrophobia that he had not felt since the last time he'd spoken with his father. I'm on a case, Dietrich said. Yes, the colonel said with mild contempt. You are a police officer. Haupt Kommissar, Dietrich said, feeling old anger stirring in him. I just need to rule a few things out. About what, Haupt Kommissar? It had begun to rain again in earnest. His father's hood was down, but the old man showed no bother. Dietrich hesitated and then said, I need you to tell me what you know about certain ancient rumors. The colonel turned suspicious. What kind of ancient rumors? About the old auxiliary slaughterhouse near Ahrensfelde. Something cracked in the old man's expression. But it sealed tight a moment later. I don't know anything about it, and neither should you. Dietrich said, I have reason to believe someone might have been murdered in there. Assaulted, certainly. Blood but no body, then? A piece of skin but no body. And animal blood. Lots of it. We are searching the place now. Are we going to find anything? The colonel blinked at raindrops that hung from his lashes, and then said, It could be squatters fighting. No evidence of that yet. Then I can't tell you. Dietrich did not believe him. He'd understood at a relatively young age that the more in control his father seemed, the more likely he was to be lying through his teeth. I've got a life, Colonel. A position, a reputation, people who count on me. People who don't know who you really are. His father snorted in derision and then soured further. In all honesty, Hans, I don't care about your life, your position, your reputation, or your people. And in case I did not tell you this the last time I saw you, when I think of you, and that is admittedly a rare occurrence, I think of you as an utter disappointment. Your actions today have not changed my assessment. With that, the colonel turned and took up his brisk evening walk as if he'd never paused. Dietrich's throat flamed with anger, but his stomach churned with fear. Chapter 17 The apartment building where Matty Engel lived on Schliemannstrasse, south of Prenzlauer Alley, was painted bright green and red and white. The building stood next to a preschool painted with images of kids on tricycles and others playing with dump trucks. Tom Burkhart slowed to a stop on wet cobblestones in front of the school. Mattie had Socrates on her lap. They'd gone back to Chris's apartment, found the cat, secured the place, and tried to call Dietrich with the news. But the high commissar had not answered his cell phone, and Mattie had not left a message. He'd find out soon enough. She reached for the door handle. You going to be okay? Burkhardt asked. As long as I never get in a car with you again, I'll be fine. What? We're lucky we're not in jail. Nonsense, Burkhardt said. I had total control. But do you? Maddie hesitated and said, I've got to sleep. Chris could be out there somewhere alive. And I'm going to sleep. Burkhardt's tone softened. You'll function better if you do. I'll meet you at Dietrich's office first thing in the morning. Maddie nodded, climbed from the BMW, and hurried to her front door with the cat in her arms. Burkhart waited until she was inside and then drove off. She took the elevator to the third floor and walked to her door. She paused, hearing a television blaring inside and smelling onions frying. She looked at the cat. How am I going to do this? What do I say? Socrates just stared at her, blinking. Then he meowed. Maddie stuck her key in the lock and went into an open area with a couch, two chairs, and a coffee table. 
There was a counter at the back that looked into the kitchen, where Maddie's Aunt Cecilia, a stout woman in her 70s, bustled about cooking Sunday dinner. Aunt Cecilia had lived on and off with Maddie since the Berlin Wall fell. She'd watched Maddie grow into womanhood, and she'd cared for Maddie's mother as she died. Maddie did not know what she'd do without her. From a room opposite the kitchen, the television got louder with the roar of a crowd and an announcer screaming, Goal, Cassiano! Goal, Cassiano! A boy's voice pitched in, screaming, Goal, Cassiano! Goal, Berlin! Socrates leaped from Maddie's arms and scampered toward the commotion. Maddie followed the cat, worming her arms from her rain jacket and calling, Nicholas, I'm home. Hello, dear, her aunt called from the kitchen. I'll have your dinner ready in a second. Thanks, Maddie said, and looked around the corner into the small room opposite the kitchen. Her nine-year-old son bounced on the couch, watching the replay and yelling, Go, Cassiano! when the striker drove the ball into the upper right corner of the net. The cat leaped into Nicholas's lap. A whippet lean boy with large, welcoming eyes, Nicholas looked shocked and then even more overjoyed than he'd been celebrating Cassiano's goal. Socrates, he cried, and then hugged the cat. Where do you come from? I brought him, Maddie said. I wish you'd get that excited to see me. Nicholas finally seemed to notice her. He grinned. My mommy! Maddie went to him. She hugged him close to her and petted Socrates' head. Missed you, she said. Nicholas pressed his head into her belly. Missed you too. But you should have seen it, Mommy. Cassiano, he's like no one on Berlin ever. Maddie looked over at the television, studying the Brazilian who was being shown in close-up. Did he have something to do with Chris's disappearance? Nicholas's smile disappeared. He looked down at the cat. Why is Socrates here? His smile returned before she could answer. Is Chris here? Maddie was amazed sometimes at how intuitive Nicholas was, one of those people who seemed to sense hidden emotion. Then again, that's how you grow up when you don't have a father. I've got some troubling news, Maddie said at last. Nicholas's face tightened. You're working next weekend again? Maddie hesitated, still unsure of what to say and how to say it. Nicholas got up, dropping the cat and barging by his mother. You promised we could go to the lake and canoe again. It'll be too cold soon. Nicholas, Maddie said sharply. It's Chris. That's why Socrates is here. Her son stopped and looked back at her, his face suddenly pale and puzzled as the cat arched and rubbed against his ankles. What? He's missing, Nicholas. Chris is missing. Nicholas appeared even more confused. What does that mean? No one knows where he is, Maddie said, deciding not to tell him about the chip that was found. And he's been gone a long time without anyone hearing from him. Too long. Nicholas picked up Socrates, held him tight to his chest, and asked, Who was he with? What was he working on? I don't know. You used to know everything. You always knew what he was doing. Nicholas, I... Nicholas's expression turned bitter. If you hadn't said you weren't going to marry him, you might know where Chris is. He'd probably be right here watching the game with me. Maddie's son burst into tears and stormed off down the hall toward his bedroom, holding on to Socrates like he was his last friend on earth. Chapter 18 Maddie's Aunt Cecilia witnessed the entire episode. Upset, rubbing her hands on her apron, she shouted, Nicholas, come back here. You come back here and apologize to your mother right now. But Nicholas slammed the door to his bedroom shut behind him. Maddie put her hand on her aunt's shoulder. Let him go, he's right. Chris and I used to share everything. I would have known. Her aunt looked ready to argue, but then caught the tension in Maddie. But he's just missing, right? Couldn't he have gone on a vacation? No, definitely not a vacation. Then I need to go talk to Nicholas. 
Her aunt nodded. And then you come eat. Schnitzel with lemon zest. Maddie kissed Cecilia on her cheek and went down the hall to her son's room. She knocked. He didn't answer. She twisted the knob. Locked. Nikki? Can I come in? Several moments later, she heard the lock freed. She went into the bedroom of her soccer-mad son. A big poster of Cassiano hung above his bed. Nicholas climbed back onto his bed and curled himself around Socrates, who purred. Maddie sat on the bed next to them and rubbed her son's back. You have the right to be upset, she said. For several moments, Nicholas showed no reaction, but then he asked, Is Chris alive, Mom? We have to believe so. And if he's not? Maddie did not answer. Why don't you still love him, Mom? Maddie's lower lip trembled. I do love Chris. And I love you. And we are going to get through this. And get him back? If it's in my power. Now it's time for pajamas and toothbrushes. No book? Aunt C will read to you, she promised. I'm starving. The cat meowed, squirmed from Nicholas's hold, and pranced to the door. Looks like he's hungry, too, Maddie said. There's still some dry food that Chris left. I know where it is. She left her son's room, returned to the kitchen, and saw that her aunt had already found the cat food. It was in a bowl next to another filled with water. Socrates went to the food and ate hungrily. And your supper is on the table, Cecilia said. Maddie kissed the old woman's cheek again. Nicholas is almost ready for you to read a little Harry Potter to him. I'll need to find my glasses then, Cecilia said, pulling off her apron. Maddie went to the table and had her aunt's incomparable schnitzel with lemon zest and twice-baked potatoes, a salad, and a cold Berliner Weisse. After she'd finished, cleared the table, and washed the dishes, she went into the refrigerator in search of a second beer. She needed it. She popped the top. Her cell rang. It was Katerina Dorak. Burkhardt called in and told me what happened, Katerina said. We're all right, Maddie replied. So he said, Katerina answered snippily. I would have rather heard that from you, Maddie. You're lucky the two of you weren't arrested. A high-speed chase? You're not cops. Maddie sighed. I know. It was the heat of the moment, and... Then I was too exhausted to call. I needed to take Socrates home and tell Nicholas what happened. How's he taking it? He's got Socrates. And you? Maddie shook inside. She'd not allowed herself to reflect at all since arriving at the slaughterhouse. Now it threatened to spill out of her in a torrent. You want me to come over? Katerina asked. I'll be okay. Burkhart said the guy on the motorcycle got the hard drive from Chris's laptop. Katerina said. Looked that way. Nothing else? The place was wrecked, Maddie replied. It was a little hard to figure. She remembered the crumpled paper she'd retrieved from Chris's wastebasket just before the burglar attacked her. Hold on a second. Maddie put the phone on speaker, dug out the paper, and unfolded it. She scanned the list in Chris's distinctive scrawl. She smiled, but with little joy. Looks like the burglar missed something, she said. Chapter 19 What? Katerina asked. A to-do list that Chris wrote, Maddie said, picking up her phone, the paper, and the beer, and heading toward her bedroom. It's dated last Tuesday, and says he had an appointment with Hermann Kruger at 11 in the morning that day. Not the wife? No. It says H. Kruger and it has an address on Potsdamer Platz, the Sony building, I think. So what? He meets with Hermann, tells him he knows he has multiple mistresses and consorts with prostitutes, and... You're assuming too much, Cat, Maddie snapped. Kruger's name's just here on a list. So is Cassiano's. He was to meet with him at three that afternoon. And he has a third name here, Pavel. Maxim Pavel? Katerina asked, suddenly excited. Doesn't say, Maddie replied. Why? Because Gabrielle was able to trace a series of phone calls Chris made last Monday and Tuesday to a Maxim Pavel. 
He's a Russian expat. Owns two or three nightclubs, including Cabaret. The drag queen show? Maddie asked. Very successful business, according to Gabriel. But there's more. He evidently has ties to Russian organized crime. Maddie checked her watch. It's only eight o'clock. We could... We already checked, Katerina said. Pavel's away in Italy. Won't be back until tomorrow morning. Maddie thought about that. We're going to need reinforcements. Way ahead of you again, Katerina said. I've called in Brecht from Amsterdam, and Jack Morgan's on his way from Los Angeles in the private jet. I'll be at work by seven, Maddie promised and hung up. She put the beer, the list, and her phone on her nightstand, and then went in to kiss Nicholas goodnight. I'm praying for Chris, Nicholas said after she'd shut off the light. I am too, sweetheart, Maddie said. She closed the door, told her aunt goodnight, and went into her bedroom. After showering and putting on her nightgown, she got in bed with the beer. She almost turned on the television, but then got out her laptop. She signed in to her private email account and found a note from the Countess von Mühlen's grandmother, thanking her for her prompt, efficient work. Maddie replied that she thought Sophia was just a sweet, mixed-up kid and wished her well. Maddie quit out of the mailbox before she thought to sign in to her personal account. She hadn't looked at that email account in well over a week, but... Then again, the only person to use it regularly was amid the spam. Maddie spotted an email from Chris with a date stamp of the prior Wednesday evening at approximately 10 p.m. She opened it and saw only an MPEG attachment. She clicked on it. Chris's face appeared on her screen. He was in his apartment in the alcove, looking weary and sounding partially drunk, with Socrates in his lap. Hi, Maddie. I've tried to respect your wishes and not contact you, but... He stopped, looking away from the camera. He cleared his throat, gazed at the lens again, and said, Maddie, I've gotten on to something, and I feel that if I can see this through, then it'll be better, better for me, and better for you, and for Nicholas. Chris's eyes glistened, watering with tears. These past few weeks have been the worst I can remember since I was a kid. I miss you, Maddie. I miss Nicholas, too, and Aunt Cecilia. Call me, or send me a message back. However you want to contact me, I'll be waiting. I love you both. I always will. The clip ended and went dark. Maddie collapsed into sobs so loud that Aunt Cecilia came running. Chapter 20 it's just after dawn, my friends, and the rain pours as I drive south out of Berlin in the Mercedes-Benz ML500 I picked up last year. Do you know the ML500? It's like a tank in wet conditions, my power vehicle, my go-anywhere car. Normally, I'm the picture of confidence behind the 500's wheel, but I'm nervous as I drive, thinking about the police at the slaughterhouse last night. When I awoke, I desperately wanted to pass by again this morning, but I had such a long way to drive and so little time before I needed to be back at work. Southeast of Halle, I find a two-track lane that goes down by the river, a secluded spot, especially in this foul weather. I park and wait, thoughtless except for the pleasant task before me. Twenty minutes later, a motorcyclist rides up wearing rain slickers and a black helmet. The deluge has ebbed to a light drizzle. I get out wearing a rain jacket with deep pockets and my gloved hands shoved into them. My friend pulls off the helmet, revealing a swarthy man in his late thirties, a Turk who is also a thief. And as a thief would, my friend says, I want more money. I almost got caught. I almost got killed. So you said on the phone last evening, I reply agreeably, 50,000 euros instead of the 25. Will that cover it? I could see the thief had expected an argument, but now he nods. You show me yours, I say, I'll show you mine. My friend goes to dig in his saddlebags. I open the rear of the Mercedes. Next to the tarp that contains the body of the computer hacker, I find a leather satchel, 
I open it and draw out a little something to help speed things along. Then I pick up the bag as if I were serving it at a fine restaurant. The jaws gape so the cash inside is visible. I walk to the thief. He's holding the hard drive. I make as if to hand him the money bag and then stumble. The bag pitches from my hands. My friend instinctively reaches out to catch it. I stick him with a stun gun and jam the trigger. He jerks violently and collapses. I stun him again, then drop the device and ram the screwdriver up under the nape of his skull. Now the thief quivers on his own, but I hold him tight, feeling the mystery drained from him and fill me once more. But on this occasion, I cannot pause to savor the moment or the sweet stillness that follows death. I'm in the open. It is raining. But I could be seen if I remain too long. Instead, I superglue the wound and drag the thief's body to the riverbank. I wade out and push him into the main current, hoping that the cold rushing waters will take him deep and far away. I get out. Chilled, but not caring. I get the satchel and fling it in the back of the Mercedes. Then I drag the tarp and the carcass of my friend, the computer genius, to the river. I roll the bundle into the river, pull the tarp, and roll his body into the water. The thief's body is already out of sight. I quickly fold the tarp and put it beside the satchel in the ML-500. I hurl the helmet into the river, I start the motorcycle, put it in gear, hold the brake, gun the throttle, pop the clutch, and let go. The bike roars forward, flies off the bank, and disappears. I have to hurry back to Berlin now. I can't take it any longer. I have to check the slaughterhouse. I have to make decisions about its future, my friends. Terrible decisions. Chapter 21 Maddie put her right eye to Private Berlin's retina scan at 6.45 on Monday morning. She'd slept fitfully. Her eyes were bloodshot and puffy. She wondered if it would affect the scan, but it did not, and the bulletproof doors hissed open. Dawn was just breaking when she walked through the glass hallway above the park. No lights had been turned on yet. She was the first to arrive. Or so she thought. When she entered the lounge area, meaning to start coffee brewing, she flipped on the light. Someone groaned loudly. Maddie jumped and looked at the couch. Who's there? She demanded in German. Jack Morgan sat up from the other side and looked at her blearily. I don't speak German, Maddie. What time is it? Like many Germans, Maddie spoke fluent English. Ten of seven, she replied. Jack, I'm sorry I didn't... Private's owner waved a hand at her and got to his feet. He wore a pilot's leather jacket, jeans, and low-heel cowboy boots. A tall, lean man who always seemed in a hurry, Morgan pushed back his dark, sandy hair and said, Don't worry about it. They say you're better off staying up, right? Maddie smiled. She liked Jack Morgan. He was smart without being overbearing, and he owned the company but didn't act like God. He came over to her. How are you? Maddie shrugged and started making coffee. As well as you can be when you find out that your, uh, colleague and friend is missing except for a tracking chip dug out of his back. It's why I came, Morgan said sympathetically. The moment I heard. When did you get in? About an hour ago, Morgan said. Thirteen hour flight. You must be beat, Maddie said, flipping on the coffee maker. I can bring you up to speed on what's happened while you've been in transit. Do you want to go have a real breakfast somewhere? Coffee's fine for right now, Morgan said, taking a seat at the lounge table. And I would appreciate a briefing, but first, because it was bugging me the entire flight, why did you and Chris break off your engagement? Maddie made a puffing noise and looked away from him. She rarely talked about her personal life except with Katerina and her aunt. But her boss had just flown 13 hours to help her find Chris. She figured an honest answer was the least she could offer. In a strained voice, Maddie said, We had a whirlwind romance shortly after you hired me. We were engaged in six months, but 
I eventually found out that Chris was a troubled man, Jack. There was a part of him that I could not reach, that I could not know. He never talked about his childhood. But there was something from that time that haunted him. The longer I was with him, the more I could feel how large a space it occupied in his soul. I pleaded with him to tell me, but he refused. Finally, I decided I couldn't marry a man with so much unknown inside him, no matter how much I loved him. It wouldn't have been fair to me. And it would not have been fair to my son, Nicholas. So you ended it? Maddie nodded. One of the most difficult things I've ever done. How'd Chris take it? Like he'd been expecting it? He said he didn't blame me and that he still loved me. No idea what this secret was that he carried? I just know that he used to have these nightmares. They'd come in waves. And he'd start crying in his sleep, calling for his mother. Sometimes screaming for her. You ever ask about the nightmares? Only if I didn't want him speaking to me for a few days, Maddie replied, pouring coffee into a mug and offering it to Morgan. He took it. I knew he grew up in East Berlin, and that his parents died when he was eight or nine. And he grew up in an orphanage out in the countryside, right? Maddie nodded. That's about all he ever tells anyone. He once told me that the past is best forgotten, but I don't think he's ever forgotten. He just won't tell anyone about it. Chapter 22 Katerina Doric arrived at 7.15. Dr. Ernst Gabriel checked in at half past the hour. So did Tom Burkhart. Together, they and Maddie briefed Morgan on what they'd found so far, including the slaughterhouse, Chris's scheduled meetings with soccer star Cassiano and billionaire Hermann Kruger in the days before he disappeared, and the various phone calls he'd made to the nightclub owner, Maxim Pavel, and others. For a man operating on just a few hours sleep, Maddie thought Morgan acted soundly when he decided to split the investigation three ways. Katerina would take the lead on Hermann Kruger. After he arrived from Amsterdam later in the morning, Daniel Brecht would begin working the Cassiano angle with Morgan helping. Private's owner had conducted several major sports investigations in the past. Brecht spoke six languages, including Portuguese, the Brazilian striker's only tongue. Gabriel would track Chris's movements in more detail, while Maddie and Burkhart continued shadowing the official police investigation and pitching in on the other veins of inquiry as needed. But when Maddie and Burkhart were preparing to leave for their scheduled meeting with Dietrich, her cell phone rang. It was the high commissar himself. I'm calling you under orders from my supervisor, Dietrich said, the annoyance evident in his voice. Our meeting at my office is canceled. What? Maddie said, growing angry. You said, Dietrich cut her off. What I am about to tell you is not, I repeat, not for public dissemination. Are we clear? That took Maddie aback. Yes. Dietrich cleared his throat. As you might imagine, because of the nature of the building, we found a great deal of blood evidence, so much that I decided to take 20 random samples and have them run overnight. Of the 20, 12 were animal, four swine, and eight bovine. The remaining eight were human. I'm sorry to say that four small spatters have been identified as Chris Schneider's. The other four were completely unlike one another. Maddie froze, blinking, trying to understand what he was telling her. You found blood from four other people besides Chris? Dietrich hesitated, coughed, and then replied, That is correct which is why we are returning to the slaughterhouse this morning. And it turns out our forensics teams are under heavy demand at the moment. Though I am opposed to this, my supervisor would be pleased if Private Berlin's forensics team could help us examine that slaughterhouse in more detail. We'll be there in an hour, Maddie promised, and hung up. Chapter 23 At 10.15... Maddie, Burkhart, Dr. Gabriel, and three private forensics techs entered the slaughterhouse carrying equipment including blue lights, cameras, thermal imaging systems, and a pressurized tank attached to a hose and nozzle. Hauptkommissar Dietrich was already on site, waiting for them along with Inspector Sandra Weigel and a Kripo forensics team. 
We'll assign you a piece of the floor and wall, Dietrich told Gabrielle, whom he eyed with open distrust after the hippie scientist removed his jacket to reveal a bright orange sweatshirt featuring Bob Marley's image. Gabrielle smiled agreeably. I'm calling this place 80 meters by 40. Roughly, the high commissar replied. So? So let's reduce the space, Private's forensics expert replied. Or at least let's understand the full dimensions of what we're dealing with. Dietrich looked at him suspiciously. How? Super pressurized luminol fog, my own invention, Gabriel said as he retied his gray ponytail and tucked it up under a surgeon's cap. Then he put on goggles, picked up the pressurized tank and twisted the valve. Shut down the Kliegs, please, he called. Dietrich nodded to his assistants. They killed the lights, leaving the place dim and shadowed. Rain pattered on the roof. Start recording, Gabriel told two of his technicians, who waited with video cameras mounted on tripods. Private Berlin's chief scientist aimed the spray wand toward the western end of the building, then squeezed a lever trigger. With a burst and hissing, a fine aerosol fog of luminol, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxide salt shot from the wand, widened into a cloud that drifted into the rafters, crept down the walls, and settled on the floor. Son of a bitch, Burkhart said. Awed and horrified, Maddie nodded. It was like looking at depictions of galaxies, tens of thousands of stars in clusters, splashes, and pinpoints. A chemiluminescent, glowing blue constellation of blood. Chapter 24 The chemical reaction ended in less than 30 seconds. The blue glow died, and the slaughterhouse returned to its ruined self. The sheer scope of the blood evidence revealed by Dr. Gabriel's device stunned everyone into silence. Except for Weigel, who whined, it's everywhere, High Commissar. Dietrich scowled at her. As I said last evening, Weigel, this was a slaughterhouse. Luminol only gives us an indication of the presence of iron in blood hemoglobin. It says nothing about that blood's source. Dr. Gabriel cut in. In any case, we'll have to microgrid the place. Sample every three inches, say. Dietrich looked annoyed. He hesitated and then nodded with little certainty before saying, I think six inches will do. Mattie closed her eyes, seeing the glowing blue galaxy of blood traces in her mind, and noticing that one area seemed more saturated than others. She went to the video camera and replayed it just to be sure. What's up? Burkhart said. Dietrich was off talking to one of his forensics men. Mattie gestured to the glowing blue pattern on the camera screen. See where it's more concentrated? Burkhart looked and nodded. Over in that corner. They walked through the trash and filth to the corner and an iron sewer grate. They shined flashlights into a steel-lined well, seeing that at the bottom, some three feet down, there was a second grate of sorts where the metal had been perforated with pencil-sized holes. Why isn't there stuff on the bottom down there? Maddie asked. Burkhart said, I don't follow. It's like a drain catch in a kitchen sink, right? She asked. But in this trashed place, except for a few leaves, it's clean. Burkhart thought about that and then said, Well, maybe it is a catch, which means there's something underneath it. Let's take a look. He squatted down, got his fingers entwined in the sewer grate, and with a grunt, lifted. Maddie had expected to see the grate come free of the floor. But to her astonishment, the grate and the steel tube welded beneath it came up, leaving a gaping hole that gave off a horrible stench. Chapter 25 The hole in the slaughterhouse floor stank of urine and something fouler. As Burkhart set the false well aside, Mattie held her arm across her nose and shined her light into a metal-walled shaft that dropped eight feet before giving way to four feet of space and then a gravel floor. Probably a secondary drain field system, said Dietrich, who'd come over and looked somewhat rattled by their discovery. Someone needs to go down, but it's too tight for me, Burkhart said. Me too, the high commissar said. 
Inspector Weigel peered down the shaft and shook her head. There are rats down there. I can smell them. I hate rats. My brother had one, used to taunt me with it. I hate them. Then I guess it's me, Maddie said. You know I can't let you, Dietrich began. Maddie cut him off. If I find anything, Hopped Commissar, I'll back out. Besides, you'll see what I see. I'll be wearing a camera. After hearing what Maddie proposed, Gabrielle went out to his equipment van and returned with a white disposable coverall, a hard hat, goggles, knee pads, and a headlamp attached to a fiber optic camera, as well as a radio headset with a super sensitive mic that he taped to the side of her neck, and a respirator to keep her lungs protected from any diseases that might be airborne because of all the rat feces. They put her in a climbing harness and attached her to a rope. Sure you want to do this? Burkhardt asked. No, Maddie said, before kneeling and backing slowly into the shaft. Burkhardt and Dietrich lowered her while Gabrielle watched a laptop receiving the signal from Maddie's camera. The shaft was barely bigger than Maddie's shoulders. For a moment, she felt a growing claustrophobia, but then the shaft gave way to open space and her feet touched ground. She released the rope from her harness. Crouching down and swinging her headlamp, she saw that the gravel surface went out in all directions in a black space that swallowed her beam. It's like a huge drain field or something, she said. We can't see very well, Gabrielle said in her ear. Use your surefire, too. Maddie got out her flashlight and flicked it on, instantly happy for the powerful beam that shot through the space. She spotted something dull white about ten yards ahead behind a load-bearing steel column. Then she heard chattering to her left. She swung the beam and spotted dozens of rats watching her and sniffing her presence, some of them scolding her angrily while others worked their chops. It was creepy, and she heard Nicholas's voice telling her to get out of there. Instead, Maddie crouched and duck-walked toward that white object behind the column. Three feet from it, she saw what it was and froze. A bone stuck up out of the gravel. That's a human femur, Gabrielle said in her ear. Maddie swallowed hard and swung her lights deeper into the sub-basement, seeing more bones. And then, a human skull. And then two more. And then more bones and skulls, scattered like seashells everywhere. Chapter 26 It's a boneyard, Maddie whispered. We see them, Burkhart said in her ear. Dietrich wants you out of there. Maddie had no argument. She'd never been in a more frightening place in her life, and she wanted out before everything went claustrophobic. But as she pivoted to leave, her beams played across something 20 meters away. Maddie rocked back on her heels as if hit on the chin. Two fresher corpses lay there, both almost devoid of skin. A woman? A man. Clothes hung in tatters from them. Though she absolutely did not want to, she moved to within several feet of the bodies. She recognized a black-ribbed turtleneck that hung off the larger of the two, and felt her whole world cave in. Maddie fell to her knees and stared, her breath coming hard and fast, echoing in the respirator and making her feel like a zombie, the living dead. Maddie? Gabrielle's voice came in her ear. Do you see them? She asked numbly. Maddie, we do. Please, come up out of there. The bigger one is Chris, she said. My God, no, Gabrielle said. Maddie swooned and thought she was fainting. She rocked her head back, gasping and feeling drunk, when through the spots dancing before her eyes, she spotted the first package. It was strapped to the ceiling support about four feet in front of her. It was about the size of a paperback book and wrapped in green wax paper that had Russian Cyrillic writing on it and a fuzzy stamp in German. For several seconds, nothing about the situation seemed real, and what she was seeing did not compute. But then she lolled her head over, seeing similar green paper packages strapped to the ceiling supports. Scores of them. They were all connected with electrical wire. Engel! Burkhart yelled. Those are bombs! Get the hell out of there! Chapter 27 All things must pass. 
Isn't that what they say, my friends? It's certainly what my mother said the last time I saw her, traitorous bitch. All things must pass. As if that explains anything to a boy of eight. As if that justified what she'd done to herself, to my father, and to me. But this time the old saw is true. All things must pass. I know it as sure as I know myself, despite the masks I'm forced to wear. I'm musing this way in the driver's seat of the ML-500, because I've just driven by the entrance to the slaughterhouse at an insistent speed, as if eager to be somewhere else. There are more vehicles there than yesterday, twice as many, police cars and forensics wagons, and unmarked sedans, and the whole place roped off with yellow crime scene tape. But instead of feeling on the edge of panic as I did the day before, I go cold, almost reptilian inside. Pulling past the apartment buildings west of the slaughterhouse, I swiftly come to a difficult decision. A long time ago, very early in my life as a matter of fact, I learned that survival means acting in the moment with the best information you've got. With that many people inside, they were bound to find the secrets of the slaughterhouse eventually. It's just logical. So I pull over several hundred yards away at the top of a slight rise, where I have more or less a direct line of sight to the roof of the abattoir. For a moment I feel stricken by nostalgia. The slaughterhouse has been part of my life for so long. I'm conflicted about what I must do. But there's no way around it, is there? I open a paper bag on the passenger side floor and come up with an old, bulky, Soviet-era military two-way radio with a whip antenna. I find the battery and snap it into the housing. I turn on the power switch. For a moment, the little bulb by the switch is dark, and I feel concerned. But then, it glows green. The air tastes bittersweet as I adjust the radio to a channel with a frequency I set almost twenty-five years ago. My fingers find the transmit button. My throat clicks with pleasure. Well then, my friends... I guess it's about time we raised a little hell in Berlin, hmm? Chapter 28 Maddie! Burkhart roared. Get out! Down in the basement of the slaughterhouse, Maddie snapped out of the haze of shock. She reached up, grabbed at the green wax paper, and tore off the area with writing on it. She took one last look at Chris's body and started going as fast as she could to the shaft, all the while fighting the urge to stop, lie down, and sob her heart out. When she reached the bottom of the shaft, she looked up and saw Burkhart looking down at her with great concern. Clip in, he ordered. Maddie stuffed the green paper in the pocket of the coverall, attached the line to her harness, and yelled, I'm on! She rose instantly. She guided herself into the narrow tube and closed her eyes at the tightness of the passage until Burkhart snagged her by the back of the harness, lifted her, and set her firmly on the slaughterhouse floor. Maddie trembled as if she'd just been blasted by cold air. Did you see? She addressed the question to High Commissar Dietrich, who appeared stunned. How many bodies are in there? Twenty? Thirty? Like I said, it's a boneyard. I don't care what it is. We are getting out of here now, Burkhardt said. He looked at Dietrich. The place looks booby-trapped. Get your people out now and call in a federal bomb squad. Dietrich hesitated, clearly upended by the scope of what lay before him. Burkhardt got more insistent. Hauptkommissar, I worked for GSG-9 in an old life, and I'm telling you to get your people out until the experts can get in there. Dietrich's face contorted and then paled. He looked over at Inspector Weigel and the rest of his team watching him. Out, the High Commissar finally barked. Everyone, take only the essentials. Now. The ten people inside the slaughterhouse went into gear, grabbing computers, cameras, and the evidence samples they'd already gathered. 
In under a minute, they were all hustling through the barn and out the front doors. The rain had settled to a mist as they came out and trotted back toward the road to Ahrensfelde. Maddie followed Burkhart mutely, feeling battered by what she'd seen underground. Chris was gone. He would always be gone. When she was almost to the police barrier, the first bomb detonated. Maddie spun around. Smoke and dust billowed out the windows and doors before a giant, deafening eruption hurled Maddie off her feet and blew the slaughterhouse to smithereens. Book Two, Weisenhaus 44. Chapter 29. Jack Morgan walked down a hallway in a large, two-story apartment north of Montbijou Park in central Berlin. He was following a slim, pale man in his late twenties with ice blue eyes, pierced eyebrows, a long black trench coat, bleached white hair, and leather half gloves with studs, all of which made him look like he belonged in a vampire movie. But Daniel Brecht was one of Private's best detectives in Europe, a fascinating character who slipped easily through cultures and languages. Brecht shifted a black book bag to his left shoulder, wrapped his studs on the door, and turned the handle. They entered a dark room that smelled of sex. Brecht flicked a switch. Light flooded the bedroom. An angry, fit, caramel-colored man shot up in bed and began shouting at them in Portuguese. Morgan didn't understand a word Cassiano was saying. Brecht did. He flashed his badge, which cooled the soccer player. That's when Morgan noticed the woman, a blonde with enormous breasts, who lay passed out next to Cassiano. It surprised Morgan. Earlier, he'd seen internet photos of the striker's wife, Perfecta, a Brazilian model with stunning, exotic looks and an incredible body. The woman in the bed looked plain in comparison. Over the next five minutes, Brecht interrogated Cassiano and translated for Morgan. You know Christoph Schneider? Brecht asked. He works for private. The striker shook his head. Never heard of him. Where's your wife? Brecht asked, nodding at the passed out woman. Cassiano shrugged and smiled. Perfect as on a photo shoot in Africa. Be back the day after tomorrow. Be tough if she found out you had a sleepover, Morgan said. The athlete sobered. Okay. So, I met with Schneider for ten minutes last Monday. He asked me about games where I played poorly earlier in the season. You mean these? Brecht asked, removing an iPad from his carry-all. He gave it a command and a clip played of Cassiano missing a great pass. We looked at all the videos this morning, Morgan said. You don't look anything like the scoring machine you are in other games. I was sick, nauseated all those times, the shits, Cassiano said indignantly. I went to doctor. He says I am having problem with German food. It came and went, but I still played. Sick. Hurt. I play. I'm known for that. Sure you weren't taking a dive? Morgan asked. Cassiano turned furious after Brecht translated and started shouting at him in Portuguese. No way! There is World Cup in three years. Do you honestly think I'd screw that up? Brecht gestured at the woman, who had stirred and groaned at the shouting. You look like you're trying to screw up a marriage with a supermodel, so what do we know? This is recreation, Cassiano said, indignant once again. And my answer is still no. I was not taking a dive. I never take a dive. It is a matter of honor. You know Maxim Pavel? He owns that drag queen club, Cabaret. Cassiano looked insulted. Do I look like a fan of female impersonators? Doesn't answer the question. Morgan shot back. Do you know Pavel? Cassiano sighed. Like I told Schneider, I met him once at another of his clubs, not cabaret, dance, I think. Did you know he's associated with Russian mafia? Brecht asked. Not until Schneider asked me that same question, he replied evenly. Like I said, I met him once. We talked for maybe five minutes. About what? He says he is a big fan. Guess my autograph. Can anyone corroborate this? Your wife? Perfecta wasn't with me when I went to the dance club. But Cabaret's a ten minute walk from here, so do the same thing I told Schneider to do. Go there and ask Pavel. Chapter 30 
firemen trained hoses on the smoking ruins of the slaughterhouse. Her ears still ringing from the blast, her mind flashing with images of Chris's corpse. Maddie sat on the bumper of an ambulance, wincing as an EMT used a butterfly bandage to close the scalp wound she'd gotten during the blast. Burkhart sat next to her getting his arm wrapped with gauze. Next to him, High Commissar Dietrich was being treated for a cheek contusion. They were facing Dr. Gabrielle and Rizi Baumgarten, a German federal agent who'd seized control of the investigation. Dr. Gabriel said, I just spoke with Jack Morgan. He's given the okay for me to call in forensics teams from our offices in Amsterdam, Zurich, Paris, and London. Anything you want from private is yours. I think private's already been involved too much, snapped Baumgarten, who stood a full six inches taller than the hippie scientist. Maddie heard that through the ringing in her ears and said, What is that supposed to mean? It means perhaps this explosion would not have happened had you not gone down there, Frau Engel. Someone had to go, said Dietrich. She was the right size, and we had no idea there was a bomb down there. Dietrich had seemed much less tightly wound and adversarial since the explosion. Maddie smiled grimly at him, thankful for the backup. But Baumgarten was having none of it. You sent in an amateur. I am not an amateur. Maddie cried. You set off a booby trap, Baumgarten said. I did not set off anything. I did not trip anything. So it's simply a coincidence that the place blew right after you'd been down there? Burkhart shook his head. If it was a booby trap and she tripped something, it would have gone off right away. I figure this was done remotely by radio. We just got lucky getting out before it blew. Baumgarten eyed them all and then looked at Gabrielle. You said there was a video of what Frau Engel saw in the sub-basement. Gabrielle nodded and queued it up on his computer. Baumgarten was sobered by the images from the boneyard. Maddie could not watch when the camera picked up Chris's corpse. But she did see herself reaching up to tear green paper from one of the bomb packets. She dug it from her pocket and handed it to the federal agent. Baumgarten examined it for several moments before saying, Checkmade Semtex, similar to C4. Soviet era. Gotta be 25 or 30 years old. Who put it down there and when? Maddie said. I mean, if Burkhart's right, whoever set those bombs off had to have been watching us, or at least had to have known there were police at the site. He didn't know we were rushing to get out. He was willing to kill all of us to keep that boneyard buried. While Baumgarten considered that, Dietrich said, I agree. And more, I think what Frau Engel discovered could be a dumping ground for a serial killer. How else do you explain 30 skulls in the same place? Maybe he's an assassin, Burkhart said. Maybe when people hire him to make their enemies disappear, this is where he dumps them. Dietrich nodded. I could see that too. Baumgarten did not comment on any of it. Another agent called to her and she left them just as Inspector Weigel reappeared. Where does this leave us, High Commissar? Blocked, at least as far as this place is concerned, Dietrich said. We really have no other course of action except to wait for the forensics teams to find us some evidence. That could be a week or more, Maddie protested. It could, the High Commissar said. So you're going to put this investigation down? Not at all, Dietrich said. But I know what my supervisor is going to say. We've got a backlog of homicide cases and the federal agencies have taken the lead now. Until we get more physical evidence, I'm sure I'll be spending my time working cases with more short-term promise. Maddie looked at the Cripo investigator in disbelief and then anger. Well, you can be damn sure of one thing, Hauptkommissar. Private Berlin will be spending every waking moment working on this case. We are not resting until we nail the bastard who killed Chris and the other people buried under that debris. Chapter 31 the nightclub cabaret was empty and dark except for a few workers and a man in a leotard on stage practicing a dance routine in time to an amplified tune that Jack Morgan could not place. Cabaret's decor was over-the-top lavish with velvet booths and crystal chandeliers and a booming sound system. Morgan took one look and wanted to leave for Ahrensfelde. He'd just heard from Burkhardt about Maddie's discovery of Chris's body, the mass grave, and the destruction of the slaughterhouse. But Burkhardt had assured him they were fine, and there was little Morgan could do there because the federal police had taken over the investigation. 
he'd reluctantly decided to continue pursuing the Cassiano angle. A burly, big-necked man stalking the bar regarded Morgan and Brecht suspiciously and asked them what they wanted. Brecht showed him his private badge, introduced Morgan, and asked for Maxim Pavel. The bartender, a Russian, seemed amused and switched to stilted English, addressing Morgan. You have office in Moscow, Mr. Proywit? We do, Morgan replied. The bartender grinned, revealing a missing tooth. He nodded at Brecht. Good thing you put this bloodsucker in Berlin. He wouldn't last ten minutes in Russia. They'd put a stake through his heart. Without a change in expression, Brecht showed his canine teeth and said, I bite guys like you in the neck. The bartender snarled at Brecht. Get out of here before I call police or throw you in the sun. Not before we talk with Pavel, Brecht said. He's not. I am Pavel, said a voice behind them. Morgan turned to find a man coming at him from the main entrance, removing a raincoat and setting it on a chair. Pavel was a fit, handsome man whose age was hard to peg. His skin was so taut, Morgan believed he'd had plastic surgery at some point. What do you want? Pavel demanded. We're with private, Morgan said. Getting to be a regular thing with you guys. Chris Schneider came to visit you last week? That's right, Pavel said. Why? Morgan said, Soon after he came to see you, he was murdered and dumped in a rat-infested slaughterhouse that blew up about two hours ago, almost killing two more of my agents. That threw Pavel, and he shrank a little. Blown up? Schneider's dead? Uh-huh, Brecht said. Where you been this morning? Driving, in the countryside, Pavel said. It calms me. Anyone able to vouch for that? I'm sure if a real police officer asked, I could find someone. Morgan said, Did Schneider ask you about Cassiano? I told him that I met Cassiano once at dance, another of my clubs. No other contact? Morgan asked. Other than what I see on television, no, Pavel replied. What about his wife, Perfecta? Morgan asked. You ever met her? The nightclub owner hesitated, but then said, Once, that same night. So they were together? Brecht asked. That's right, Pavel said. A handsome couple. But now I have to oversee rehearsal and attend to other business before tonight's show. Brecht made to protest, but Morgan stopped him. We appreciate your time, Herr Pavel. Pavel studied Morgan before smiling broadly. You come back and see the show, Mr. Morgan. It's on me. Morgan smiled coldly. Drag queens aren't my thing. Cabaret is so much more than that, Pavel said, not missing a beat. The costumes, the makeup, the talent. It's a great art form. I'll be in touch if I have a change of heart. Outside the club, the rain had slowed to a drizzle. Brecht said, Somebody's lying to us, Jack. Morgan nodded. I know. Chapter 32 An hour later, Agnes Kruger exuded an almost regal bearing as she sat in the drawing room of her lavish townhome on Fassenenstrasse in the elite Wilmersdorf district of Berlin and listened to Maddie Engel and Katerina Dorek give an account of her husband's extracurricular activities. Three... Mistresses? The billionaire's wife said at last in a voice like an ill-tuned piano string. And two prostitutes a day, you say? Yes, ma'am, Katerina said. I'm sorry. There was a long silence. Maddie sat numbly on a plush couch, wanting to feel sorry for the woman, but all she could think of was how she was ever going to tell Nicholas that the only man who'd ever been solidly in his life was gone. She and Burkhardt had left the explosion scene while journalists and federal agents swarmed the area. They returned to the office where she'd met Katerina, who had told her to go home, but Maddie refused, saying she could not face Nicholas yet. Katerina had decided to keep Chris's appointment with Kruger's wife. 
Maddie could not bear sitting still, so she'd showered and changed in Private Berlin's locker room and gone along. But now she just wanted to go home, hold Nicholas, and Socrates, and cry. It is hard, Agnes Kruger said, breaking the silence and then coughing. It is hard to learn that you do not satisfy your husband in any way, shape, or form. Do you have names? The mistresses, their phone numbers, addresses? Katerina looked pained. We do, but... What are you gonna do, mother? A snide male voice said, cutting her off. Buy them off? Cover up for him again? The billionaire's wife reacted as if she'd been slapped. Maddie startled and looked over to see a gaunt young man with grungy clothes and a scruffy beard. He was peering into the drawing room from the hallway. Agnes Kruger's chin rose as if in defiance. My son, Rudy. The name's Rude, mother. This is not the time. Sounds like it is, her son said, strolling in and taking a seat. He nodded to Maddie and Katerina. Go on. I'd like to hear just what old stepdad's been up to. The billionaire's wife sat even more erect in her chair. Maddie and Katerina said nothing. Rudy Kruger snorted. You know what? I don't need to know the details. I know all about Hermann. Except for his money and his business, his art collection and the cars, he only has one other dimension. Stepdad's a goat, driven by his prickin' balls. And those women, they're just holes. Even mother is a hole. A hole who completed Hermann's facade of respectability. Agnes Kruger's facade broke into rage. Enough, she shouted at him. Go back to that hell hole you prefer to my house. Get out. Her son smiled and stood. I know what you're going to do, mother. You're going to figure out a way to sweep it under the rug. And you know why? Agnes Kruger said nothing. She just glared at Rudy. Because of the money, he told Maddie and Katerina. With my mother and stepfather, it's always about the money. Chapter 33 Jack Morgan and Daniel Brecht sat at the window table in a cafe, diagonally across the street from Cabaret, debating why Cassiano would claim he met Pavel alone when Pavel said they met with his wife. Perhaps a memory lapse, Brecht allowed, or it's a flaw in a cover story. Morgan had been looking out the window. He threw down his napkin and got up fast. So much for rehearsal and other business. Pavel's on the move. Breck tossed money on the table and rushed after him out into the street. Out in front of Cabaret, the nightclub owner climbed into a taxi cab. Morgan was already hailing another cab. They jumped in and told the driver to follow the cab ahead. As they drove, Morgan began to feel the effects of jet lag. His head nodded and his brain buzzed with thoughts, wondering if Pavel had actually had something to do with Chris's death, wondering how Maddie Engel was taking it all. Burkhardt had said she was acting like a professional. Morgan's last thought before he dozed was, but how long can that last? Several minutes later, Brecht nudged him and he jerked awake. Pavel's getting out at the Hotel de Rome, Brecht said. Even in his groggy state, Morgan recognized the hotel. It was the most luxurious in Berlin as far as he was concerned. He usually stayed there during his visits. Know anyone in security? Morgan asked as they climbed from their taxi down the street from the hotel. Definitely, Brecht said. I helped them out last year. The American movie star. Did you see that report? Morgan came fully awake. I'm so tired I forgot that happened here. Jesus, what a mess that must have been to clean up. Crazy mess, Brecht said. Crazy, crazy mess. They entered a lobby with soaring ceilings and marble columns and went to the concierge. Brecht asked to see the hotel's head of security. Exactly nine minutes later, Brecht and Morgan were inside the room directly across the hall from one Pavel had reserved. They also knew that the nightclub owner had just ordered champagne and caviar. He was expecting someone. Brecht unscrewed the peephole and inserted a tiny fiber optic camera and microphone, which he connected to a transmitter linked to his iPad. I pay for all that, 
Morgan asked after he flopped on the king-size bed, feeling depressed again about Chris Schneider's death. Private Berlin issued, Brecht said. Here comes room service. Morgan watched the cart with the champagne and caviar arrive, and then Pavel opened the door to let the waiter in. He left moments later. Why don't I have one of those mini surveillance kits? Morgan asked. Euro technology, Brecht said. Hasn't made it to L.A. yet. I forgot I live at the end of the universe, Morgan said, throwing his arm over his eyes. I'm going to snooze. Wake me up if... Private's owner drifted off. Right on the edge of sleep, just before falling, Brecht tapped him on the shoulder. Pavel's got a visitor. Morgan groaned and opened his eyes blearily to see Brecht showing him the iPad. A woman in a long, dark trench coat and a floppy rain hat stood with her back to the camera outside the door across the hall. They heard Pavel's muffled voice through the door. Who is it? I have delivery for you, the woman replied in a soft Portuguese accent as she fumbled with the belt of her raincoat. They heard the deadbolt thrown. The woman looked both ways and then shrugged the raincoat off. Morgan sat upright. She was magnificently naked when the door opened. Pavel's eyes went wide with delight. Delivery accepted. She stepped into his arms. The door closed behind them. Who is that goddess? Brecht asked. I didn't see her face. Morgan shook his head in disbelief. I didn't see it either, but I'd recognize that teardrop Brazilian rear anywhere. That, my friend, was perfecta. Chapter 34 When the front door to Agnes Kruger's townhouse in Wilmersdorf slammed shut, the billionaire's wife regained her composure and bearing. My son fancies himself an anarchist and an artist, she said. He despises my husband for his money. She smiled sourly. But he doesn't refuse the 10,000 euros Hermann deposits in his account every month. She laughed caustically and then looked at Maddie. You have children? One, Maddie said. A son. Rudy is an only child as well, she began. She hesitated and then said, But he's not why you are here. No, Katerina said. We're here because Chris Schneider is dead. That shocked the billionaire's wife. Dead? How? He was such a young man. Katerina gave her the bare bones of the circumstances. Mattie listened to her report as if it were arriving from outer space, incomprehensible even to her. In a slaughterhouse? The billionaire's wife said. Why? We don't know, Mattie replied. We're hoping you might help. Where has Hermann been the last few weeks? Katerina asked. Agnes Kruger fidgeted in her chair. He was here in Berlin for the most part, I believe. Ask his secretary. I did, Katerina said. She said he's off on business. Or tending to his mistresses. Doesn't he live here with you? Maddie asked. Her face flickered painfully. Hermann has a bed here. He uses it from time to time. Comes and goes as he pleases. Doesn't give a damn if I'm in it or not. Agnes Kruger looked closely at Maddie, who'd somehow won her trust. You know, he wasn't always like this. At least I don't think so. This belief that anything goes came with the money. Where did you meet? Maddie asked. Here in Berlin, shortly after the wall fell. He was making his first fortune bringing textiles into the newly liberated East as fast as he could. I worked for him as his secretary. Rudy was just a baby. My first husband had deserted me, and, well, Hermann is a good talker. Who knows how to make money, Katerina said. He came to capitalism naturally. It suited him. I don't understand, Maddie said. He grew up in East Berlin, but as soon as the wall fell, he was in motion. Same thing with Chris. She studied Maddie again. He was more than a colleague to you. For the second time in 24 hours, Maddie wondered if she was that transparent, but she said, My ex fiance Oh, dear, the billionaire's wife said, her hand traveling to her lips. I'm so sorry for you, Frau Engel. 
Maddie nodded, swallowing hard at the loss pulsing in her. There was a pause and another painful flicker in her skin before Agnes Kruger said, And you think my husband might have been involved in his death? What do you think? Katerina asked. Is he capable of it? Would he have reason? Would Chris's knowing about all the women and being ready to reveal them to you drive him to murder? The billionaire's wife was still for several moments, and then she turned, disgusted. On this, my son is correct. Hermann's soul is black, she hardened. You should know that there have been rumors about Hermann. What kind of rumors? Maddie asked. Agnes Kruger gazed at Katerina and Maddie in turn before saying, You'd have to talk with Rudy for any particulars, but evidently people who cross my husband have a way of disappearing or dying in convenient accidents. Chapter 35 The rain lifted just before five that afternoon, casting the grounds of the Soviet War Memorial in Treptower Park in a light that looked nickel-plated to Hop Commissar Hans Dietrich. The homicide detective stood at the base of the dripping statue of the Soviet soldier carrying the German child. His cheek ached and felt swollen. With an air of victory surrounding him, the colonel strode into view at precisely 5.07 p.m. Again, his eyes slashed all over his son, lingering on the bandage on his cheek before his lips twisted in contempt. Leave me alone, Hans, he commanded. I will after tonight, Colonel, the High Commissar promised. That slaughterhouse in Ahrensfelde. I told you to leave that alone, the Colonel said, and kept walking. This night, Dietrich did not reach out to grab his father. To his back, he said, Someone blew it up this morning with GDR-era Semtex. The Colonel stopped and turned, incredulous, but then said, I thought I heard something like cannon fire. The High Commissar nodded. Before it went off, we found decomposing bodies and skeletons in a sub-basement. Thirty of them. Dietrich always thought his father was unshakable, but that news rattled him. No, the colonel said in a voice that sounded suddenly old. That's not... They were there, Dietrich insisted. What do you know? The colonel rubbed his left arm as if to soothe an ache. I honestly don't know anything. But there were rumors, Dietrich pressed. I heard you one night. His father's face twisted and he held his arm tighter as he hissed back. There were rumors everywhere about everything and everybody. No one knew what was true and what was fiction. No one, and I still don't. Don't you want to know? No, his father croaked, then turned, now clutching his left arm. The colonel made three steps in the direction of the closest sarcophagus. He stopped, weaving unsteadily. Then he reeled to his right and pitched over on his side in a puddle on the gravel path. For an instant, Dietrich was too stunned to move. He did not think it possible that... Papi, he cried, rushing to his father's side. The colonel was choking and looking at him bug-eyed. Dietrich threw himself on his knees to perform CPR. But his father's right hand shot up and grabbed him by the collar of his jacket. I know I wasn't a good father, he rasped. But was I a good man? For once in his life, the high commissar did not know how to answer a question. His silence was a response that the colonel understood. The old man's cheeks tightened. He turned his gaze away from his son to the statue of the triumphant Soviet warrior and the German child, towering above them. I was a good citizen, the colonel gasped. You know, I was. And then in a harsh sigh, the life went out of Dietrich's father, and his eyes took on the dull and glazed stare of fate. Chapter 36 It's 8 p.m. when I enter the Diana FKK, a high-class mega-brothel set in a luxurious spa setting on the outskirts of West Berlin. 
indoor pools, jacuzzis, saunas, masseuses, and beautiful women of every race and color parading around completely nude. One would think that my thirst for flesh would have been satisfied by my late afternoon interlude with my friend, the woman who honestly believes I love her. But the lethal events of the past two days seem to have filled me with an unquenchable desire for all things carnal. I pay my entrance fee and go down to the locker room where I strip and put on a robe and rubber slippers. I take the canvas bag with my latest mask acquisition and head upstairs, hearing the sound of women laughing. Is there anything like it? The sound of women laughing. I feel alive here among these laughing women. I can be anyone I want to be. They can be anyone I want them to be. And that's a relief after such a long and difficult day. But as I wander, evaluating the women against my criteria, my mind keeps flashing to the expression of my friend the thief's face when I hit him with the stun gun. Even with the music blaring from the brothel bar, I can honestly hear the crunch and squish of the screwdriver entering his brain. And behind it all, like a shimmering backdrop, the memory of that unbelievable fireball that rose above the slaughterhouse scorching and pulverizing that part of my past into dust. As I walk through the brothel spa, admiring the women soaking in the whirlpools, these pleasant memories bow to pressing concerns. I have much to do to finish burying my past for good, and it will take every bit of my skill to get it done swiftly and without a trace of my participation. But I'll wait until tomorrow to address those crucial tasks. For now, I'm seeking to cleanse myself, a sensual reduction to the primal, a release from all that I appear to be to the ignorant outside world. I spot my prey on an elevated platform in the middle of one of the pools. She's exotic, black hair, dark, flashing eyes, a copper stain to her skin. She's naked, except for a gold chain about her waist, and she's writhing in a slow-motion belly dance to the appreciation of several men lounging in the water below her. I stand there, watching until our eyes meet. I smile and crook a finger at her. She smiles and keeps dancing. We keep this up, and a nice little tension builds between us before she finally leaves, crosses the pool, and comes up to me. Her brown eyes are dazzling, her hips to die for. She says her name is Bettina, and asks if I want company. I smile warmly. She comes into my arms as if she belongs beneath me which she does. I tell her I've got a little surprise for her in my bag. What kind of surprise? Bettina asks. The kind that surprises, silly girl, I tease. Moments later, in a mirrored room, I have her get on her knees and elbows, her legs open so I can see every little bit of her mystery. I unlock the case and draw out the mask. A black jaguar with golden eyes and ruby mouth, bearing golden teeth. Bettina's looking back over her shoulder, uneasy at the mask. I can already feel myself rising. I put the mask on and prepare to enter her. Bettina's clearly unnerved now, and I don't think I could be more excited if I'd planned to throttle the life out of her or stick a screwdriver in her brain. What's with the mask? she asks in a tremulous voice. It's an ancient Mayan relic, Bettina, I say as I crouch over her and drive myself into her as a panther might, thrilled at her grunt of disbelief and fear. It depicts their jaguar god, the ruler of the night and the lord of the fucking underworld. Chapter 37 
At 8.30 that evening, Maddie stood unsteadily outside the door to her apartment. She smelled fresh cookies baking. She could hear a radio announcer giving the news and caught something about the slaughterhouse explosion. She leaned her head against the door. She was more than a little drunk. The 6 p.m. strategy meeting Jack Morgan called in order to better manage the various threads of the investigation had eventually devolved into an impromptu wake for Chris. Drinks were poured. Toasts were given. Stories were told. Tears were shed. They'd even laughed a few times at old memories. Now, standing outside her apartment door digging for her keys, she realized that memories were all she had of Chris. It was all he would ever be. But Nicholas was alive. Nicholas had a future. She had to make him see that. Maddie opened the door to see her Aunt Cecilia coming out of the kitchen. Where is he? Maddie asked, unable to hide the sadness. He just went to his room, Aunt Cecilia replied, her face twisting with concern. Chris? Maddie bit her lip and shook her head. He's dead, Aunt C. No! Aunt Cecilia cried as she hurried over. No! What happened? Maddie fell into her arms, tears brimming in her eyes. I'll explain it to you later after I explain it to Nicholas. But how am I supposed to do that when I can't explain it to myself? Her aunt hugged her tightly, and the dam burst. Maddie sobbed in her arms. Life can be so cruel sometimes, child, Cecilia said, rubbing her back. Why is that? Maddie cried. Why is that? That's a question beyond my qualifications, dear. One better addressed to God. Mommy? Maddie raised her head and saw Nicholas watching her from the hallway. He was already in his pajamas and looked so frightened that she almost collapsed with grief. But she got hold of herself, left her aunt, and went toward him, saying, I'm sorry, Nicky. Her son's chin trembled, and for a moment she thought he was going to blame her and run away. But dissolving into tears, he ran into her arms and cried in a hiccuping voice. But I th thought, I prayed, Aunt C said. Maddie picked him up and carried him to the rocking chair in the television room. I know, I know. Nicholas curled up in his mother's lap. Socrates appeared and jumped into Nicholas's lap. Maddie held on to them and watched her aunt sit down crying on the couch, realizing that these three beings were among the very few anchors left in her life. Chapter 38 The next morning, after a near sleepless night, Maddie resisted the urge to go to work early. She stayed with Nicholas, cooked him his breakfast, and walked him through the streets to the John Lennon Gymnasium, where he attended elementary school. When they neared the school, Nicholas stopped and looked up at her, asking, Are you going to be all right, Mommy? She had been about to ask him the same thing. She hugged him. As long as I've got you, little man, I'll always be all right. Me too, Nicholas said. She kissed him and said, Go on or you'll be late. Aunt C will be here to pick you up. I know the way home. I know you do, Maddie said but she'll be waiting just the same. She waited until he'd disappeared up the steps inside the school. Her cell phone rang. It was Katerina Doric. Meet me at Takalus. I was heading to the office. I found out that Rudy Kruger lives and works in Takalus. It might be a nice time for a chat. I hear early is always good when you're dealing with artists and anarchists. Maddie had her sights set on Chris's past, but she could see the value in talking to the billionaire's son. When? I'll be there in 20 minutes. Maddie headed toward the underground at Rosenthaler Platz. It was a cool, blustery day, with dark, puffy clouds racing across a deep blue sky, and Maddie found herself wondering if life was nothing more than that, a cloud racing across a blue sky, and then simply gone on the wind. That thought consumed her until she entered the underground station and noticed the Berliner Zeitung and Berliner Morgenpost newspaper headlines at one of the kiosks. 
She snapped up both, paid, and read the articles about the slaughterhouse on the train to Oranienburg Estraza. Both stories noted the explosion, the fact that police vehicles had been seen in the area the day before, and the rumor that High Commissar Hans Dietrich had been working the case. Federal agent Rizi Baumgarten was the only official quoted in either story, however, and she had revealed very little, refusing to say what police had been doing inside the old abattoir before it blew up. The Morgan Post article went further, noting that the GDR government built the slaughterhouse as an auxiliary to East Berlin's main stockyard and slaughterhouse in the late 1950s. As the communist economy slowly crumbled, the building had been used less often and then abandoned. It had stood that way until yesterday's blast. That place was never fully abandoned, Maddie muttered to herself as she got off the underground train. Someone knew about that sub-basement and that fake drain going way, way back. Chapter 39 Takalus was the epitome of cool in Berlin, a bullet-ridden, bomb-scarred, and graffiti-clad building in Mitte that the East Germans never tore down after Hitler's war. When the wall fell, squatters moved into the former department store on Oranienburger Straße and formed an artist collective. Twenty years later, more than 100 artists lived and worked in the building and on the grounds, which over the years had evolved to include studios, an avant-garde cinema, restaurants, a squatter's village, a giant sculpture garden, and an outdoor performance area and stage. It was 8.15 in the morning, but the lower building was nearly dead quiet. They climbed upstairs. Rudy Kruger's rented squat was on the third floor. Katerina's smartphone dinged. She looked at it. Interesting, she said. Ola Larsen, the Swedish financier, just announced that he's taken a 5% interest in Kruger Industries. Which means what? Maddie asked. Possible target of a takeover bid. And according to this report, there's been no comment by Kruger, who is said to be out of the country on business. I bet a hostile takeover would put a lot of pressure on Hermann. Keep him away from his women, certainly, Katerina said. Maybe enough to make him homicidal? I don't know. Let's ask. They found the door to Rudy Kruger's studio. Electronic music played inside. Katerina pounded on the door. I'm working, Rudy Kruger yelled back immediately. Katerina identified herself, and a moment later the music lowered and the door opened on a chain. The billionaire's stepson wore a white coverall spattered in black and blue paint. I'm busy. I've got an exhibition opening in three days and a meeting to be at in an hour. We just want to talk to you about your stepfather, the alleged murderer, Maddie said. He gave them a calculating stare and then opened the door. They entered a loft area with north light beaming into a large, high-ceilinged studio. There were canvases up on easels and others stacked against the walls. They were all abstracts in blues and blacks and featured the words rude, rot, and riot splashed somewhere in brilliant yellows or reds. Selling any? Katerina asked. Rudy looked at her contemptuously. Buying and selling have little to do with art. I'm more about the doing than the marketing. Uh-huh, Maddie said. Tell us about your stepfather. Your mother said he's had people killed, but she had no particulars. His lips curled as if he'd tasted something sour. Those are the rumors. From the rumor mill, he said. Any particulars? Maddie demanded. Just look at his projects, Rudy said. It's there if you really want to dig. Check Africa. We plan to, Katerina said. Is that what Chris Schneider called you about last Monday? Maddie frowned. She knew nothing about any call to Rudy. The billionaire's son looked surprised as well. How did you... We ran Schneider's phone records, Katerina said. Yours came up. Why'd you look? He's dead, Maddie said. Murdered. Rudy appeared shocked, but then said, Yes, Schneider called me. He was about to meet with my stepfather and wanted to know if Hermann really is the ruthless corporate bastard he's made out to be in the press. What did you say? Katerina asked. Rudy's smile resembled a hyena's. I said that my stepfather in person is much, much worse. Someone who'd cut his mother's throat if he thought it would fetch him a euro. 
Chapter 40 We get it. You don't like your stepfather, Katerina said. Why? Rudy Kruger picked up one of his paintbrushes from the palette and considered one of his masterpieces before responding. Because Hermann is a pure corporate capitalist pig. Emphasis on pig. Example, Katerina pressed. He tossed the paintbrush back on the palette. How about the way he treats my mother? Twenty years ago, he made her sign a prenuptial agreement that limits what she'd get in a divorce. It's what keeps her tied to him. She'll never give up the money, no matter what he does. Plus, she honestly believes he loves her deep down. He snorted and shook his head. How much does she get in a divorce? Maddie asked. Ten million euros. Not terrible, Katerina observed. If your husband is worth three and a half billion, and you were married to him when he made most of it? Maddie said, I see your point, but what can she do? What can she do? Rudy Kruger laughed caustically. She can show some backbone and character and leave him. That's your advice? It's either that or she learns to live with three mistresses and a house full of whores. What do you know about Ola Larson? Katerina asked. The billionaire's son's head pulled back like a turtle's toward its shell. Who? Swedish financier, Katerina said. He launched a hostile takeover bit of your stepfather's company an hour ago. Rudy's breath came partly out in a rush. Never heard of him. Rude, a woman's voice called. She was tiny, no more than 100 pounds with a pretty face and a haircut that made her look waifish. She wore a kaffia scarf around her neck. This is Tanya, Rudy said. My, uh, student. Right, Katerina said. We're due at the rally, Rude, Tanya said. Unzipping the painter's coverall, revealing jeans and a dark sweater, Rudy told Maddie and Katerina, If you're here to ask me if my stepfather had something to do with Schneider's death, I honestly don't know. But if you're here to ask whether I think he's capable of it, my answer is that Hermann Kruger is capable of anything. Chapter 41 It's nine on the dot when I park the Audi A5 well down the street from the German Federal Archives in West Berlin. Call it the German in me, call it how I was raised as a child, but I do so like to be punctual for an opening. I check myself in the mirror. The makeup, gray hair color, and clothes I wear make me look elderly. I put on a Bavarian alpine hat that is too large for me, so the brim sits just above my eyebrows. I climb from the car with a satchel briefcase and a cane. As I approach the gatehouse to the archives, I make myself shake every so often, as if I've had some kind of stroke and it's left me palsied. At the gate, I present an expertly forged identification card from Heidelberg University, and portray myself as absent-minded history professor emeritus Karl Groning, who has failed to bring his driver's license after coming all the way to Berlin by train to do research into 19th century agricultural policy. The guards give me a blue researcher's badge and let me in. The grounds of the archives look like a decaying college campus, with huge spreading chestnuts and long, empty lawns. I find the building I need on the far side of the complex. When I enter the public reading room, like many of the other researchers, I don cotton gloves. Then I go to the archivist's desk and request all documentation associated with East German orphanages in and around Berlin. It may take an hour or so for the files to come up, the clerk says. This is okay, my dear, I say. I booked the late train to Heidelberg. Chapter 42 Jack Morgan was sitting at the break table nursing a coffee and looking very hungover when Katerina and Maddie arrived at Private Berlin. You didn't sleep here, did you, Jack? Maddie asked, pouring herself a cup. No. I kept the room at the Hotel de Rome he said. How's your son taking all this? As well as could be expected, thank you. 
Morgan nodded. I liked Chris. He was a good person, and when good people die, it reminds you of everybody else you've lost. I saw my mother in my dreams last night, Maddie said. She was right there with Chris. Your dad, he lives in the U.S., a cop, right? Chicago, she replied. Katerina asked, who have you lost, Jack? The owner of Private thought about that. Comrades in arms, dear friends, and an old and dear lover. How did she die? Maddie asked. Justine's alive. What's dead is what we had between us. How long ago did that end? A few years. Long enough I should have moved on. You're still not over her? My relationship with Justine is like waves on a beach, coming and going, but always coming back, especially because she works at private in L.A. You have a complicated life, Jack, Katerina said. Uh-huh. No other love interests? Maddie asked. He laughed with little enthusiasm. I'm always looking for love. I'm just not too good at creating it. And I'm not good at holding on to it. Seems to me like it was taken from you by forces beyond your control, Katerina said. I'm going after Hermann Kruger. Maddie nodded, her eyes watering. But she refused to cry again, and she got up from the table. I'm going to find Gabrielle. It's time I figured out Chris's terrible childhood secret, once and for all. Chapter 43 when Maddie found Dr. Gabrielle in his lab on the second floor of Private Berlin, he was wearing black jeans, a red bandana, and a Jimi Hendrix live at the Monterey Pop Festival sweatshirt that featured a burning red guitar. She told him what she was after, and he graciously put down what he'd been doing to help her. They used a giant translucent screen that allowed them to call up documents, pictures, and video and study them all at once, as if they were looking at them on a corkboard. They mined Private's records first and found Chris's personnel file, including a digital scan of his birth certificate, which said that Christoph Rolf Schneider was born in Dresden in 1975 to Alfred and Maria Schneider. They tried to match the birth certificate and found no Christoph Rolf Schneider registered in the Dresden files. They searched for Alfred and Maria Schneider in the marriage records and again came up empty-handed. They expanded the search to include all of what had been East Germany, and found several men named Christoph Schneider, but none were remotely Chris's age. And nowhere did they find a record of a marriage between an Alfred Schneider and a woman with the first name Maria. They dug deeper, trying school databases. Again, nothing. I'm beginning to think nothing about Chris was real, Dr. Gabrielle said. I know, Maddie said, now seriously confused. But he was real. Let's go back. Do we have his army records in his personnel file? I'm sure, Gabrielle said. He searched a minute and then called them up. The picture of Chris made her smile. He looked so young. The base information was all in line with what he'd listed on his private application after leaving the German military police. Same parental names, same bogus birth certificate from Dresden, and the same bogus address. Maddie thought they had hit an impenetrable wall until she noticed something on the sheet in the army file that listed Chris's educational history. Listed under his place of primary and secondary education was Waisenhaus 44, an orphanage out in the countryside south of Berlin and east of the city of Halle. Ernst, where would they keep records of GDR-era orphanages? Dr. Gabrielle thought about that. I don't know. The Federal Archives? Chapter 44 At ten o'clock exactly, I hear, Professor Groning? German precision, my friends. Is there anything more reassuring? I smile and shuffle from my seat in the back left corner of the reading room, mindful of the cameras mounted to the ceiling. At the desk, I find sixteen boxes of files, and am told that there are more waiting for me in the microfilm room down the hall. The kind clerk lady helps me roll the cart back to my spot. I start with the paper archive first, scanning rapidly. In the fourth box, I find the records of Waisenhaus 44, an orphanage outside of Halle, about an hour south of Berlin. 
There are hundreds of names, and they're not listed alphabetically. They seem all jumbled and out of order. But then I study several closely and discover that they've been filed by date of admission. That brings a smile to my lips. It takes less than ten minutes to find the documents of six children, including snapshots taken on the day they were brought to Weisenhaus 44. For a moment, I linger on a picture of Christoph as a boy. Scrawny, dark, sunken eyes showing fear and hatred. He's exactly as I remember him as a boy. But I can't afford to relive the good old days. I've got business to attend to. I count the pages in the six files. Fifty-six. I leave the files on the table, pick up my briefcase, and go to the toilet. From a secret side pocket in the interior of the briefcase, I retrieve a sheaf of white antique finish paper covered in typed gibberish. I count out fifty-six pieces and slip them into seven gray, well-worn legal size files. I set them in the briefcase and shut it. I return to the archive reading room in my spot, noting the position of other researchers. I set the satchel down, open wide to my right on the floor next to my chair. Then I wait. Five minutes pass. At the stroke of eleven, clerks wheel in fresh documents. Researchers who've been waiting charge toward the counter. All eyes rise and follow the rush of activity. In a series of fluid motions, I slip the six files off my desk into my briefcase and return the phony files to the tabletop, immediately reaching past them to the box that held the real documents. They're packed in less than a minute, I put those boxes on the cart, get up, and take my briefcase to the men's room, where I slide the files into the interior side pocket of the valise. Then I go down the hall to the microfilm section, pick up the boxes I ordered, and retreat to the rear of the room behind a machine that faces the counter. I spin rapidly through the microfilm reels until I find more documents on the children, laid out one after another on almost twenty feet of film. I check. The clerks are busy. I reach in my pocket and pull out a razor-sharp folding knife. With no hesitation, I cut the microfilm. I take the free end and wind it on my fingers until I get to the other end of the documentation and make a second cut. Then I put a rubber band around the microfilm and stick the tiny roll inside my jacket pocket. When I withdraw my hand... I'm holding my trusty tube of superglue. My friends, you can do so much with that stuff, can't you? I scan the room for activity and then run a bead of the glue on one end of the cut reel and press it to the other with a quarter-inch overlap. I hold it one minute, then take up the slack on the film reel and gingerly rewind. It holds. I set the reel back in the box and put the box neatly in the middle of the other microfilm boxes I have stacked beside it. I get up, take my briefcase, and head toward the door. Are you returning today, Professor? The clerk asks. Of course, I reply. A quick supper, and then back. I can't help it. I make that clicking noise in my throat and smile. I make another clicking noise as I go out the door to the archives, flashing on that picture of Christoph as a boy. You didn't have a chance, I think. And none of the others do, either. Chapter 45 Maddie walked to the front gate of the German Federal Archives. Inside the gatehouse, the guards were checking the briefcase of an elderly man in a long raincoat and a Bavarian hat whose hands shook as if he had a neurological disorder, like Parkinson's disease, but not. Maddie knew what Parkinson's looked like. Her mother had died of it. This rhythm of tick and tremor was different, however, and for some reason it made her feel odd. Still, Maddie could not help pitying the old man as he took back his briefcase and returned his researcher pass. Maddie never got a good look at his face, but for reasons she could not explain, she watched him shuffle down the sidewalk before showing the guards her badge and ID and turning over her weapon. She walked across the campus and found the archival reading room, where she asked one of the clerks how best to track down the files of an East German orphanage called Weisenhaus 44. 
The clerk frowned, and then went over to another archivist and had an intense conversation. She returned and said, Those files are out with a researcher already. That surprised Maddie, and she instantly scanned the room. Which one? Flustered, the clerk said, It's not our policy to... Maddie leaned over the counter, flashing her private badge. This is a murder investigation, she said softly. Which one? The archivist's brow knitted, and she pointed over at a desk in the far left corner. He was sitting over there, but then he went down to the microfilm room. What does he look like? Maddie demanded. An older man? A professor at Heidelberg, I think. He's got Parkinson's, you can't miss him. I just did, Maddie groaned. Did you touch those boxes after he left? He wore cotton gloves, if that's what you're thinking, the clerk said. You don't think he killed someone, do you? He couldn't. He's got Parkinson's. He told me so himself. I don't think that old man could hurt a fly. Chapter 46 Trying not to hyperventilate, I drive until I am well eased of the archives before I tear off the wig. My friends, I recognize the woman at the archives' gate. She was the same woman I saw with the big bald guy outside the slaughterhouse. There are dozens of pictures of her on Christoph's hard drive. Her name is Matty Engel. She and Christoph had been lovers, engaged, I believe. She and Chris worked for private. She has a son, Nicholas. She's looking for me, and that makes me agitated. But there's more. Her face. It's true, she resembles my mother, and that makes me infuriated. For an instant, I fight the urge to clean out all my money and flee Berlin and all of Germany, for that matter. South America? No, I decide, growing angrier. The bitch will find nothing. With no documents left in the archives, it's as if Christoph and the others never existed. No masks, but they're as invisible to the wide world as I am. And soon, very soon, they will cease to exist at all, while I will go on. Ten minutes later, I pull into my garage. I park between the white work van and the Mercedes, make sure I'm alone, and then leave the Audi coupe. I climb in the back of the van and start removing the makeup with wipes I keep there. I have several hours of real work to do, clients and business associates to meet. I must be presentable for the time being. But as I stare into the rear-view mirror, I flash once more on Matty Engel and get a nervous feeling that has served me well over the years. Christoph was her lover once. Even if their official relationship had ended, she must have feelings for him which means she has a strong motivation to find me, which means she's dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Right there, my friends, I decide that if it comes to it, I'll have to make Matty Engel permanently invisible too. But until then, I've got other people to take care of, people who could identify me, people who could tear off my masks. Chapter 47 The midget rolled an unlit cigar between his lips as he squinted at Daniel Brecht and Jack Morgan before saying in a raspy voice, You think a fix was in? Tiny Heine Wagner was a black market bookie, someone Brecht had used as an informer for years. Around noon that day, Tiny Heine, Brecht, and Morgan were sitting at a table overlooking the Spree River inside the Georgerbräu Beer Hall in central Berlin. We're asking you if you think a fix was in, Brecht said. The bookie shrugged and put the cigar down. Hair to Berlin is second league. I haven't seen deep action on any one of their games. Certainly not compared to what you'd see in the Premier League. We wouldn't expect so, Morgan said after Brecht translated. But maybe that helps. Do you know of any big payoffs on any of those games? Tiny Heine shrugged again. Not on my book, anyway. But you know, sports betting is changing in Germany every day. Explain that, said Jack. The government passed a gambling treaty a few years back, 
that says they're the only ones who can handle sports betting, the bookie said, and then started chortling. It's supposed to limit gambling addiction. Not working? Jack asked. Doing the exact opposite, the midget replied. My business is up 25% this year. Online, it's even bigger, 30%. Online brokers in other countries? Brecht asked. It's officially against the law, but there you go, Tiny Heine said and started laughing again. Stupid government bastards. They think because it's a law that people will pay attention to it, especially addicts. Breck turned to Morgan. I wonder just how many of these online betting ops there are. Thousands, Morgan said. All over the world. Maybe tens of thousands. The bookie nodded after Brecht translated. Who do you figure for the fix? What should I tell him? Brecht asked in English. Morgan replied, Ask him what he knows about Maxim Pavel. That name seemed to impress Tiny Heine. Oh, that's heavy. He plays the cool nightclub owner, but the way I hear it, that's one mean, twisted motherfucker. Word on the street is he'll kill you as soon as look at you. He'll like killing you, too. Russian mafia? Morgan asked. I have it on authority that he's ex-KGB. And you think he was in on a fix? We don't know for sure, Brecht said. Any way for us to find out what kind of betting volume was on the Hertha Berlin games? Morgan asked. Tiny Heine thought about that. I don't know. You got any contacts in Vegas? Morgan brightened. As a matter of fact, I do. Chapter 48 At half past noon, Agnes Kruger was already late for a luncheon date at Restaurant Carré with Ingrid Dahl, an old friend. The billionaire's wife wanted to talk to someone she could trust, someone outside her immediate family. And Ingrid Dahl, who was both discreet and wise, fit her needs perfectly. She had a driver at her beck and call, but that day she felt the strong need to make a visible show of independence. She'd drive herself. She took the elevator to the garage and found her black Porsche Cayenne among the myriad of other cars her husband stored there. Agnes Kruger hit the button that raised the garage gate and then pulled out, heading south toward Fasenenplatz, which was empty due to the heavy rain that was falling again. She pulled up to the intersection of Fasenen and Schapasrasse. Before she could take a left onto Schapa, a figure in a black rain jacket with the hood up ran to her and knocked sharply on the window. The billionaire's wife startled and then rolled down the window angrily. What do you want? She demanded. I already told... Agnes Kruger was suddenly staring at the empty bottom of a plastic Coke bottle that had been taped to the barrel of a pistol. No, please, she began. The shot hit her above the right eye at point-blank range, spraying her life across the passenger seat and window. Her foot came off the brake. The Porsche rolled across the street and crashed into a parked Fiat. Alarms began to wail as the killer walked off into the storm. Chapter 49 In the amphitheater inside private Berlin, Dr. Gabriel loaded a copy of the German Federal Archives surveillance tape featuring Dr. Groening. Maddie snapped shut her cell phone. Surprise! No Professor Groening at Heidelberg. Not even close. I didn't expect there would be, Gabrielle replied. Katerina Dorek shut her own phone. That was Brecht. They went back to the nightclub and were told that Pavel hasn't been seen since yesterday. So Hermann Kruger's and Pavel's whereabouts are now both unknown? Apparently, Katerina said. The surveillance tapes appeared on the screen. Gabrielle enlarged them. In the reading room, the professor did a remarkable job of keeping his hat tucked down over his eyes. But they saw how he managed to steal six files from the archives of Weisenhaus 44. He's very clever, whoever he is. And his hands are as fast as a close-up magician's, said Gabrielle. Maddie nodded. Zoom in on that briefcase. Dr. Gabrielle did. Looks like old crocodile skin. Maddie was positive there would be a better look at Dr. Gronick at the front gate. 
But both entering and exiting, his body shook and quivered so much it was hard to get an image of him that wasn't blurred. And even then, it was at a steep downward angle from the upper right corner of the guard's shack. Look at me watching him walk away, Maddie cried after seeing herself step to the guard's window. I had this feeling about him, but I let him walk away because he reminded me of my mother and I pitied him. You couldn't have known, Katerina said. Maddie knew she was right, but it sure didn't make her feel any better. Was that the man who killed Chris? Was that Kruger or Pavel in disguise? Pavel owned a nightclub for female impersonators. He'd know all about makeup, wouldn't he? What about Kruger? A billionaire could hire someone to disguise him, right? Or he could have paid someone to steal the documents. She was lost in these thoughts when Katerina's phone rang again. What? Katerina cried. She stabbed at her phone and the speaker came on. He's done it, Rudy Kruger shouted over a background din of voices. He's killed my mother. Slow down, Rudy, Katerina said. She's dead, he said in a quivering voice. I just got a call from Berlin Crippo. Someone shot her in her car near the house. It had to be Hermann. I know it. He did it or he had her killed. That fucking capitalist pig, he... Rudy was choking. Oh, God. He... I told her... Rudy, I know this is tough. Take a deep breath. Where are you? Leaving the rally. We were protesting corporate pigs like my stepfather who are trying to tear down Takalis and turn it into another high-rise. The police want me to identify her. We'll meet you there in ten minutes. Chapter 50 Hauptkommissar Hans Dietrich was already on the scene when Maddie and Katerina arrived. He was standing in the rain by the open door to the black Porsche Cayenne, grim, drawn, and gray, and even more hunched over. From behind the yellow crime scene tape, Maddie spotted Inspector Weigel and called to her. Weigel came over, puzzled. What are you doing here? the inspector asked. Agnes Kruger was Chris Schneider's client, Maddie said. Dietrich knows about it. Suddenly annoyed, the young inspector glanced at the high commissar. The man tells me nothing. It's like I don't exist. But he has a lot on his mind. His father died of a heart attack last night in Treptower Park. He found him. That's awful, Maddie said. And he's here at work? Katerina asked. The way I understand it, work is all Dietrich has, the inspector replied. Maddie had heard the same thing and was about to say so when she heard Rudy Kruger cry, Where is she? The billionaire's stepson had just left a taxi and was rushing to them. He slowed when he saw the crashed Porsche on the other side of the street. He moaned, Oh, God, what's he done to her? To Maddie, Rudy Kruger no longer looked the part of the arrogant artist and anarchist. He was just a boy who'd lost his mother. Tears came to his eyes, and he rubbed fiercely at his cheeks. What's he done? What's he done to her? Are you Rudy Kruger? High Commissar Dietrich asked. He'd come over to Weigel and seen Rudy crying. He is, Maddie said. Dietrich ignored her. Herr Kruger, I know this is hard, but I need you to identify your mother. Your stepfather is apparently nowhere to be found. Sounding dazed, Rudy Kruger said, It's her. You can't see her from here. It's her car. Please, sir, I need you to look at her face. We'll drape the wound. Rudy looked at Katerina and Maddie. Would you go with me? Dietrich appeared displeased, but Maddie said, Of course we will. The billionaire's stepson was shaking like a leaf. His lower lip trembled as he walked up beside his mother's car. Maddie could see her in there. Her body was rocked to the right. A stream of drying blood ran out of her mouth. Tears rolling down his cheeks, Rudy Kruger nodded. It's her. My mother. Then he spun around, doubled over, and vomited. Chapter 51 When Rudy Kruger's spasms subsided, Maddie and Katerina led him away. I need some water he said dully. 
I'll get you some, Inspector Weigel answered and hurried off. The rain had stopped and the wind had picked up, blowing leaves from the trees in front of Agnes Kruger's home. Rudy Kruger sat on the wet front steps looking wounded and alone. Herr Kruger, Dietrich began. Mattie stepped in front of the high commissar and in a low voice said, Remember what you felt like last night? Give him a minute. Dietrich was a man not used to taking orders and not used to other people knowing his affairs. But in a measured tone, he replied, Just so, Frau Engel. Weigel came up and handed the billionaire's stepson a bottle of water. Thank you, Rudy Kruger said. You're very kind. Dietrich waited until he'd drunk it before informing him that no witnesses to his mother's murder had come forward yet. There'd been a driving rain at the time, and none of the neighbors seemed to have heard anything unusual. Where were you an hour ago? Dietrich asked when he'd finished. Me? Rudy Kruger said. I was at a rally for Tocolus. Anybody see you? Hundreds, he said. I was a speaker. I've been there since this morning. Any idea who'd want to kill her? Rudy's expression turned to outrage. The same person who probably killed Chris Schneider. Hermann Kruger. Or someone working for him, I promise you. When will you arrest him? I've got to find him first, Dietrich said. Hear his side of things. Jesus Christ, Rudy Kruger moaned. Jesus, it's just... What? He was racked with anguish when he answered more to Mattie and Katerina than to Dietrich. After you left on the way to the rally, I talked with my mother on the phone. I asked her what she'd decided to do about Hermann. She said she was going to stay married to him. Isn't that just perfect? He asked bitterly. So, Agnes, she went for the money. She decided to go on with their separate lives because of it. But he killed her before she even had the chance to tell. Down the street, they had his mother's body in a black bag and were loading it into an ambulance. Rudy Kruger let loose a sigh and seemed on the verge of crying again, but instead he said, I'd better check on the house. I prefer you leave it the way it is, Dietrich said. We'll want to search it. That surprised the billionaire's stepson for a moment, but then he said, Of course, I'm sorry, I, I guess I'll go home now. Dietrich nodded. You'll want to notify her friends and family. Rudy Kruger hung his head and said, I have my first opening in two days. She was coming, you know? My mother said she was coming. Then the high commissar's cell phone rang. Dietrich answered it and walked off several paces. Rudy Kruger got up, appearing beaten. He looked at Maddie and Katerina. Thanks. I couldn't have done that alone. You have someone to go home to? Katerina asked. Tanya might be there after the rally, he said. I don't know. You call us if you need us, Maddie said. He nodded absently and walked off, a shattered man. Maddie heard Dietrich complaining, I'm tied up here, send someone else. He hung up shaking his head. What is it, High Commissar? Inspector Weigel asked. Dietrich hesitated and then said, Halle police found a floater in the river down there. They've identified him. A doctoral student at Berlin Technical University. Some kind of computer super genius. They wanted our help. We've got too much to do already. I want Hermann Kruger found. Maddie had wanted to tell Dietrich about the files stolen from the archives, but now she was consumed by this information in light of the fact that someone of tremendous skill had hacked into Private's computer. So was Katerina, who said, You have a name for this dead student? Weigel can get it for you, Dietrich said, walking away. I think I'll go to the technical university then, Katerina said. Dig around. Not me, Maddie said. I'm heading to Halle. Chapter 52 Friends, fellow Berliners, it's only three in the afternoon, but I must admit that I'm already bone-tired from the many long and difficult tasks I've been forced to attend to already today. But I'd like to have things cleared away, cleaned up and polished like glass before I move on to something new. That's the way of an invisible man. Some old habits never die. 
I look at my hands a moment and entertain the notion that I've never really seen myself. Not without a mirror, anyway. And mirrors are part of life's illusion, aren't they? I really don't know what I look like at all, I decide, and I never will. And if I don't, who will? Certainly not all those I've been forced to eliminate in the last two weeks. Not one of them recognized my new face. But they knew my voice. Before they died, when I was speaking to them, they looked at me like I was a scary puzzle with pieces missing. I laugh, feeling buoyed as I smear instant tanning lotion on my face and hands, and then use colored contact lenses to turn my eye color from brown to green. Then I glue on thick, dark eyebrows and a mustache, and stuff rolls of cotton in my cheeks. I pull on a blue workman's coverall, embroidered with the name of a local plumbing company. It's amazing what you can find in thrift stores if you really know what you're looking for. I even found the matching cap there, too. When I'm finished and satisfied that no one from my current life would recognize me, I fill a toolbox with wrenches, screwdrivers, and a mini blowtorch, making gentle clicking noises in my throat. It's so important to have the right tools for the job, isn't it, my friends? Hmm. Chapter 53 It was mid-afternoon by the time Maddie returned to private Berlin, requisitioned a car, and drove the 170 kilometers south to the city of Halle. A gray, bleak city dominated by GDR-era architecture, Halle looked even more grim and somber in the mist that was swirling in advance of another storm. Maddie parked, wondering again if the body of the computer genius was indeed linked to the hacking at Private, Chris's death, and now the murder of Agnes Kruger in broad daylight. Was Hermann Kruger behind all of it? Could someone of his stature afford to be so brazen and cold-blooded? In an effort to answer those questions, Maddie went to City Hall and inquired at the clerk's office about Weizen House 44. The tattooed emo girl who waited on her said she'd never heard of the orphanage, much less its records. But a middle-aged woman working at a desk behind the emo girl told Maddie that Weizen House 44 was out on the road from Klepsik to Roysen. It's still there? Maddie asked. Not for long, she said. Someone's tearing it down next month and building a green light bulb production facility. Records? Maddie asked. I think they were transferred to the Federal Archives after reunification. No other place they could be? Not that I know of. Maddie considered throwing in the towel. But then she decided to make the drive out to see the orphanage. She told herself it might help her to understand whatever it was that Chris went through as a kid. The thought of Chris as a boy made her think about Nicholas. The two brought a lump to her throat and tears to her eyes, and it took every bit of her strength to stay on the wet highway leading east out of Halle. The wind began to gust, and the rain fell harder as Maddie drove north on the potholed secondary road from Klepsik to Roysen. The road wound through farmland, by stands of hardwood trees partially stripped of leaves, and past giant white wind turbines, their blades slicing the iron sky. At last, Maddie spotted the roof line of the orphanage through a tangle of brush and woods. It sat next to a field being tilled by a farmer on a tractor. Between two stout wooden posts, a new steel cable stretched across the orphanage's overgrown driveway. There were notices of condemnation and plastic sheeting stapled to both posts. A sign dangled from the cable. No trespassing. Maddie parked her car on the shoulder, pulled up the hood of her rain jacket, and got out. She trotted across the road, jumped the cable, and moved down the driveway through sopping weeds and thorns that clawed at her slacks. Vines strangled the off-kilter walls of Weizen House 44, a large three-story building with a sagging roof. The windows of the old orphanage were gone, except for teeth-like shards that clung to the frames. Maddie stepped up on the front porch, which sagged off the building. The orphanage's front door lay broken on the floor, in the mouth of a long, gloomy central hallway. Something in her stomach told Maddie not to enter and to leave the secrets of Weisenhaus 44 alone. But then thunder cracked in the distance, and the rain fell even harder. Feeling keenly on edge, wondering if she was crazy, 
she stepped inside. Chapter 54 In the hallway, Maddie stopped to get out her flashlight. She shined it around, finding a room to her right that held the last relics of an office lying in leaves, fungus, and mold. A desk with two legs, a chair with the stuffing and rusted springs visible, and an overturned file cabinet with no drawers. This was where the headmaster or mistress must have done their business, Maddie thought. She walked on, moving about the orphanage's lower floor, which had been stripped of nearly everything. She found the kitchen and the eating hall. They were stripped, too. As she climbed the stairs, she tried to imagine Chris in this horrid place, eight years old, motherless, fatherless. She thought of Nicholas having to be put in an orphanage and felt on the verge of weeping again. On the second floor, Maddie discovered the ruins of old classrooms and became aware that something about the background din of the rain falling and the tractor plowing had changed. She ascended to the third floor and found dormitories set to either side of a long central corridor. The first was empty. The one across the hall held rusted bunk bed frames bolted to the wall. Maddie walked over creaking floorboards to the second set of dorms. In the first one she inspected, the roof was caved in on top of one of the steel bunk beds, the only one she'd seen that still had a mattress on it. The mattress was black with filth and mold. There were puddles on it and on the floor. For reasons she could not explain, Maddie felt drawn into the dorm, toward that bunk bed mattress. The floorboards felt soft and rotted underfoot. But she went anyway and stood in the rain, teeming through the hole in the roof, transfixed by the mattress and the splintered joists that stabbed it in several places. Was this bed once Chris's? Maddie saw him lying on the bed as easily as another memory that came flooding in around her. She and Chris were in bed at a ski condo they'd rented at Garmush, a rare separation from Nicholas. Chris made her breakfast and brought it to her on a tray with a single rose and a small box of chocolates wrapped in a bow. He watched her eat, amused. And then he was interested to see her opening the chocolate box. Inside was a ring, two emeralds surrounding an emerald-cut diamond. Suddenly, there in the wreckage of the orphanage, loss flowed everywhere around Maddie, an invisible, terrible hydraulic pressure built, making the room feel as menacing to her as the sub-basement in the slaughterhouse. Lightning flashed, almost blinding her. Thunder cracked right overhead. Maddie ducked, desperate now to leave this place, to get back to her car and go home to Nicholas. She ran from the room. She raced to the staircase and then froze. Standing in the shadows at the bottom of the staircase was a man in a long, black, hooded rain slicker. His face was hidden beneath the hood. He was aiming a double-barreled shotgun at her. Chapter 55 Who are you? The man with the shotgun growled. And what in God's name are you doing in here? For an instant, Maddie couldn't answer. He adjusted his aim. I asked you. She reached to her coat pocket. Easy, the man said, still aiming the gun. I'm going for my badge and ID, she stammered. He picked his head up off the butt of the shotgun. You police? I work for private, private Berlin. She showed him the badge. He made a motion for her to come down the stairs toward him. The gun, sir? She asked. It's making me nervous. At last, he lowered the gun and then pulled back the hood, revealing a raw-boned man in his late thirties. He said, I saw the car after I quit plowing. You're not supposed to be in here. They're demolishing this place next month. I'm sorry, Maddie said, her wits returning. She started down the stairs toward him. This was an orphanage. A, a close friend of mine lived here. Lot of people lived here. Can't say many liked it from what I've heard. She stuck out her hand. Maddie Engel. Darek Eberhardt, he replied, not taking her hand. You should leave, Frau Engel. This place is dangerous. Floorboards are all rotted. You could go through anywhere. Break a leg or a neck. My friend is dead. Murdered. Maddie said. He was more than my friend, he was my fiancé, and I'm just trying to understand his childhood. Eberhardt studied her without emotion. I'm sorry for your loss, but you won't learn anything here. 
This place was abandoned 20 years ago. Looters stripped most of it. Took the government forever, but they finally got the land sold to some green energy company. I heard that. Light bulbs. Eberhard turned without comment and started down the hall. Maddie hurried after him, saying, The records about Weisenhaus 44 that are in the federal archives, they're... they're incomplete. Eberhard said nothing as he headed toward the front door. Maddie called after him. I was hoping I could find someone who knows about the orphanage, someone who might have known Chris. Eberhard went out the front door. The rain had slowed. The thunder boomed and the lightning flashed to their east now. I've got to get back to my tilling, Eberhard said. Maddie followed him, saying, I'm sorry, I'd hoped. She started to choke up. It's just so hard not understanding why he died, who he was, this place. She wiped at her tears with the sleeve of her rain jacket. Eberhard had turned to face her, the shotgun held low at his side, his face a mystery. I'm sorry, she said again. I'll be going. I'm sorry to have bothered you and taken you away from your work. Maddie pivoted and took several steps down the overgrown driveway toward the road. Harriet Ledvish, the farmer said. She lives in a nursing home in Halle. Maddie stopped and looked at him, puzzled. Who is she? My father's second cousin. She ran this place for 22 years. Chapter 56 35 minutes later, Maddie knocked and entered a room that reeked of old age, disease, and an antiseptic that smelled like citrus. Harriet Ledvish sat upright in a chair by a hospital bed, connected by a tube to an oxygen tent. A little bird of a woman in a nightgown, robe, and slippers. She was having a coughing fit. A blanket covered her legs. There were books stacked around her. One lay open in her lap, cradling a magnifying glass. When the coughing subsided, Harriet Ledvish spit into a tissue and dropped it in a trash can set among the books. What do you want? The old woman croaked suspiciously. Maddie identified herself, showed her the private badge, and then said, I met your second cousin's son, Derek, out at the old Weisenhaus 44 building. He suggested I come talk to you. Harriet Ledvish now turned highly guarded. Who do you work for? The state? No, I... The old woman picked up the magnifying glass and shook it at Maddie. I was not a part of any forced adoptions, never, not once. I can prove it. Maddie understood what she was talking about. During the communist reign in East Germany, children were sometimes taken from parents thought disloyal. The children's names were changed, and then they were given over to families deemed true to the state. That's not why I'm here, Frau Leidwisch, Maddie assured her, and there is no client. I'm just trying to find out about a very dear friend of mine who lived at Weisenhaus 44 in the 70s and 80s. Harriet Ledvish watched Maddie the way a cobra might a mongoose. Your friend's name? Chris, uh, Christoph Schneider. The old woman blinked. Confusion and then pain rippled through her. She started coughing again, hard and spastic convulsions, and she would not meet Maddie's gaze. When the fit eased, Maddie said, Did you know Chris? Harriet Ledvish seemed in some kind of internal battle, but then she glanced sidelong at Maddie and said, I had nothing to do with whatever happened to that boy. Absolutely nothing. Chapter 57 Maddie felt a pit opening in her stomach. She stared at the woman who'd run Weisenhaus 44 and said, What happened to Chris? I don't know, Harriet Ledvish whispered. You do? The old woman shifted painfully. I don't. Why are you here? Why now? Because Chris was murdered last week. Harriet Ledvish's eyes unscrewed a moment as if she'd fallen into some time warp. Then she said, wheezing, I'd always hoped he'd be safe and live a long life. I'd hoped they all would. I, I did nothing but try to help him as best I could, but it was beyond me. I was a good person, caught in an impossible situation. The old woman blubbered these last words. I'm innocent. 
Innocent of what? Maddie demanded. Was Chris abused in your orphanage? Harriet Ledvish forced herself to sit straighter. Absolutely not. Whatever it was, it happened before he came. Before they all came to Weisenhaus 44. All? The old woman hesitated, but then, between hacking fits, she described the snowy winter night of February 12th, 1980. A car and a police van came. A man got out of the rear of the car. He told Harriet Ledvish that he was with the state. Three girls and three boys between the ages of six and nine had been found wandering the streets of East Berlin. Weisenhaus 44 was the only orphanage around with vacancies. The children appeared to be in shock when they arrived. They clung to each other obsessively. Most had violent nightmares and would wake up screaming for their mothers. Two of the girls were sisters and rarely let the other out of their sight. They all feared men. Over the course of years, Harriet Ledvish tried to coax out of them what had happened. But every time she did, they'd become terrified and refuse. The only thing Chris ever said about it was that some things were best forgotten. So I did, the old woman croaked. From then on, I saw to their care as best I could. Made sure they were fed and clothed and educated. Some of the six did better than others. Chris and Artur were probably the best. And then they were teenagers, and word of the uprising in Berlin had reached even Weisenhaus 44. They all went up there one night. They came back, but not for long. They were of age, they could do what they wanted. I lost track of them, though I heard that Chris chose the army. Maddie nodded. But other than that, and the fact that Chris lived at the orphanage, there's nothing about his childhood that's real. At least as far as documents go. Harriet Ledvish fought for breath. Because of me, I did that. The old woman explained that after seeing the traumatized state the six children were in and their pathological fear of being asked to talk about it, she came to believe that someone had threatened them if they ever talked. I didn't want whoever had tortured those children to be able to find them, she said. They came to me with no documents, so I invented documents for them. Even when the children were able to tell me their parents' names, I changed them and made the children memorize the new names I had written. And you told no one? It was a different time. As Chris said, one best forgotten. What was Chris's real name? Rolf Christoph Wolfer. And his mother and father? I never knew. I guess I didn't want to know. Earlier today, a man posing as a professor stole six of the Weisenhaus 44 files from the Federal Archives. I believe Chris's file was among them. Harriet Ledvish blinked, and then she seemed to shrink right in front of Maddie. How could that possibly? She choked hard as if someone or something was strangling her. Then she said, coughing, My God, they all came in on the same date. I sent the Federal Archives the chronological copy of the files. The old woman broke down, sobbing. No, this is not right. I wanted them to be safe. Maddie went to her side, squatted down, and put her hand on the blanket, through which she could feel the woman's legs. They were like twigs. Harriet, do you remember the names of the other five children? Harriet Ledvish's crying slowed. I knew what would happen when the wall fell. I knew there would be a witch hunt. I kept copies of the files of every child who lived in my orphanage. Maddie's heart skipped a beat. Can I see them? Make copies? The old woman nodded. They prove I was a decent person, not part of the sickness that seemed to afflict everyone around me in those days. Book Three, The Motherless Children. Chapter 58. Find these people, Gabrielle, Maddie said, slapping down six blue files on the hippie scientist's workbench at Private Berlin. They're the key. Wait a second, Katerina complained. I've got first dibs on him. Dr. Gabrielle was hunched over a computer, removing its hard drive. Cat, Maddie insisted. Her friend cut her off. That computer belongs to Ernst Neumann, dead computer genius, doctoral student at Berlin Tech, and according to his roommate, a freelance hacker who'd come into a lot of cash recently. Really? 
Maddie said, impressed. I'll do my own research then. Gabrielle did not look up, just gestured with his screwdriver toward an iMac. Use that machine. Maddie started toward the machine with Katerina in tow. What's in those files? She asked. Fiction, Maddie said, sitting down in front of the computer. The door to Gabrielle's lab opened and Jack Morgan entered with Daniel Brecht. They were on their way out to catch Cassiano's game at the stadium, but they wanted to bring everyone up to speed on Pavel, his background in the KGB, and his disappearance last evening, some time after he'd vacated the room he'd shared with Perfecta. And I spoke with some old friends in Vegas, Morgan said. There was heavier-than-normal betting on the games where Cassiano played poorly. And, get this, in every case, Hertha went into the games as five to three favorites. I'm not following, Katerina said. The odds were such that few flags would be raised on someone betting on Cassiano's opponents, Morgan said. Pavel, Maddie asked. That's where my money is, Brecht said. Here's a picture of him. Maddie studied the photograph of the nightclub owner, but she could not tell if it was the man she'd seen at the Federal Archives that morning. Then she told them all what she'd discovered in Hala. When she finished, Gabrielle abandoned the hard drive of the computer genius, went to Maddie, and pushed her out of her chair, flipping open the first file. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Gabrielle, Katerina protested. The computer will take me hours, he said. This? Minutes. The first file belonged to Ilza Fry, who had been one of the younger of the six children who'd arrived at Weisenhaus 44 on February 12, 1980. Morgan and Brecht left for the game just before Gabrielle found an Ilza Fry, correct age, living near Frankfurt. She's a paralegal and lives in the suburb of Bad Homburg, the old hippie said, now giving his computer a command to cross-reference her name against the various law enforcement databases to which Private had access. He immediately got a hit and looked pained. What is it? Maddie asked, coming around the back of his chair. Ilza Fry was reported missing 15 days ago. Chapter 59 My friends, fellow Berliners, 20 years ago it would have taken me weeks to track down the address of Greta Amsel. I know this because nearly two decades ago, shortly after recuperating from my surgeries, I decided to find and kill the bitch that bore me. It took me a solid month of painstaking document research to locate my dear, sweet mother and end her life. But that is a story for another time. It had taken me all of an hour on Google to pin down the fact that Greta Amsel was a nurse who lived alone in a small apartment building in the outskirts of West Berlin, not far from Falkensee. At the moment, I'm sitting in my blue workman's van, diagonally across the street from the apartment building, reviewing the actions I took after finding her. I'd had the good sense to call her phone number once I'd arrived. The voice on the machine was a stranger's. Funny, I never would have recognized it. I called the apartment manager next, a man named Gustav Banter and posed as an electrical supply salesman from Mannheim, who wanted to drop by later, around 5.30. Impossible, Banter told me. His shift ended at 4.30. How sad, I said, and settled in to wait for Greta. Again, I did not recognize her voice on her answering machine, but I know her the moment she rides by me on her bicycle at a quarter to five. She's still got the naturally blonde hair, the high cheekbones, and that lost look about her. Greta Amsa locks her bike in a rack in front of the apartment building. I wait until she's been inside ten minutes before taking the tool bag from the floor and setting it on the passenger seat beside me. I wait until a man carrying a book bag comes down the street and heads for the front door of Greta's building. As he puts his key into the lock, I'm angling in behind him. In a heavy Slavic accent, I say, Do you know where I finds Herr Bander, the superintendent? The young man turns to look at me. Bander, he's long gone by now. I shake my head angrily. 
I get called to come fix toilet leak on third floor. I pat my pockets. I got number and name here somewhere, but I suppose to meet Banter. The young man shrugs. Banter's a worthless piece of shit. It's just like him not to hang around when someone's toilet's leaking. I'm in 212. It's not above me, is it? My ceiling could be falling in. No, I say. 347 or something. Can I go in? The young man nods absently, stopping at the mailboxes. By the time he's got one open, the elevator door is shutting on me. I get off at the third floor, find the stairwell, and climb to the fourth floor. I find apartment 429 and knock. I look right at the peephole, and a shiver of excitement passes through me. Yes, I hear her call in that unfamiliar voice. Who is it? It is plumber, Frau Amsel, I say. Herr Banter called. He says tenant in 329 is complaining of water from the ceiling. He wants me to check toilet. There's a long pause. And then I hear a chain slide and a deadbolt thrown. Chapter 60 Who reported her missing? Maddie asked, studying the PDF of a document carrying the letterhead of the police department of Frankfurt am Main. Her sister, Ilona, Dr. Gabrielle said, tapping the section that identified the concerned relative. Maddie felt a chill. Ilona was also one of the children who entered Weisenhaus 44 with Chris. She gave an address? Just a cell number, said Katerina, who was also looking at the document. Maddie whipped out her cell and dialed just as Tom Burkhardt entered. He went straight to her. I think I've got something. She held up her finger, hearing Ilona Fry's phone ring. A synthesized voice answered, telling her to leave a message and a callback number. Hi, Ilona. My name is Maddie Engel. I'm a friend of Chris Schneider's. He and I work together at Private here in Berlin. If you could call me, I'd appreciate it. Any time, day or night, please. It's important that I speak with you. Here's a Greta Amsel, Maddie, Dr. Gabrielle said when she hung up. She lives out by Falcon Z. That's 20 minutes tops. Maddie jotted down the address and moved toward the door. Again, Burkhart said, Engel, I said, I think I've got something. Maddie hesitated and then replied, Come with me. Tell me on the way. Chapter 61 When my dear old friend Greta Amsel opens her door, she's wearing an apron and I smell bacon frying. She studies my plumber's disguise and then stands aside. Down the hall on the right, you don't suppose it's a burst pipe? I shrug, smile, and respond cheerily, Who knows? I look, okay? The smell of bacon surrounds me as I walk down a hall with bare walls. When I go into the toilet, I notice she does not have the array of cosmetics, lotions, and soaps you'd expect. Greta Amsel lives a simple, austere life. I set the toolbox down and pull on rubber gloves. I look over my shoulder. She's watching me. I smile again. You cooking, yes? I knows in a minute if this is problem. If no, two minutes I be gone. She hesitates and then moves out of the doorway. I wait until I hear dishes rattle and then a radio sputtering with news. I fish in the toolbox and come up with my flathead screwdriver and a clipboard with blank paper on it. I flush the toilet and then holding the screwdriver beneath the clipboard, I walk toward the smell of the bacon. Hello there, I call pleasantly. Greta stands at the stove in a galley kitchen about six feet from me. She's rolling bacon onto a paper towel on a plate. She looks up. All done? Yes, no problem with toilet. Must be neighbors. I hold out the clipboard. You sign that I am here. Make trip for banter, okay? Greta steps toward me, and then I can't help it. Being this close to her pleases me more than I'd anticipated, and I make that clicking noise in my throat. Puzzlement and then disbelief twist through Greta's face. You know me, Greta, hmm, I say. A long time, and still you know me. She's paralyzed with terror, 
but I'm thrilled and fluid when I drop the clipboard and launch myself at her. Greta grabs the skillet and throws the bacon grease at me. It scalds my face, but that only serves to infuriate me. She starts to scream, but I knock the pan from her hand and jam my fist into her mouth before she can get out much more than a squeal. She looks at me wide-eyed and makes soft, whimpering noises. You remember, don't you, Greta? I ask in a hoarse whisper. All the fun we used to have, you and your mother. Mm. Chapter 62 Burkhart parked the private car down the street from Greta Amsel's apartment building, just as an older man in a blue jumpsuit and matching cap left by the front door, carrying a toolbox. Maddie was trying Greta Amsel's number for the third time. No answer. The workman climbed into a dark blue panel van. Maddie was barely conscious of him. She was running through the information Burkhardt had given her on the way over. The counterterrorism expert had discovered no other documents regarding the auxiliary slaughterhouse in Ahrensfelde. He'd looked in the Berlin City archives and in records repositories in Ahrensfelde, and there was nothing more than what they'd found already. People in the area immediately surrounding the blasted abattoir told Burkhardt that they'd already spoken to Reezy Baumgarten's agents and knew nothing about the place, other than they'd thought it represented a hazard to their children. Then Burkhardt had stopped for lunch at a cafe not far from the slaughterhouse and met a retired shopkeeper and his lady friend. The shopkeeper grew up on a farm that used the slaughterhouse. He said a man he knew only as Falk ran the place, and he described Falk as an alcoholic with a bitter and gloomy attitude. Falk had a son who worked at the abattoir, too. He couldn't remember the younger Falk's name, but he remembered that he was in his late teens the last time he saw him, and very smart despite limited schooling. The shopkeeper's lady friend told Burkhart that she walked by the abattoir in the late 70s, late at night, and thought she heard a woman screaming but it could have been a pig squealing. Pigs are smart, she told Burkhart. They know when there's killing going on. She told her late husband about the incident, and he'd told her to plug her ears from now on. The blue workman's van began to pull out. You want to knock on the door? Burkhart asked. We're here, right? Maddie said, climbing out. The van drove past them. They barely gave it a glance. They tried the buzzer to Greta Amsel's apartment twice. No answer. Let's come back tomorrow, Burkhart said. An older gentleman walked up behind them. Who are you looking for? Greta Amsel, Maddie said. The man looked around. That's her bike. She's here. She's not answering her buzzer. Lots of the buzzers don't work, but if her bike's here, she's here. Burkhart flashed his private badge. Mind if we go upstairs and try her door? Hell, I don't care, he said and let them in. They went to Greta Amsel's apartment on the fourth floor, knocked and got no answer. Then they noticed a strange smell coming from inside, a mix of bacon smoke and the acrid taint that lingers after hair catches fire. Something's wrong, Maddie said. I agree, Burkhart said. He crouched and proceeded to pick the lock. Guns drawn, they entered the hallway. The smell was worse here, crossed with human feces. The light was on in the bathroom. The toilet seat was up. The fan was running. So was the one in the kitchen where Greta Amsel's corpse lay, sprawled on her belly. Her hands were singed, and her fingers charred black. Chapter 63 Thirty yards out from the goal, Cassiano came to a full stop, juggled, and then popped the ball over the head of the final Dusseldorf defender. With explosive speed, the Brazilian wove around the stunned sweeper and half-volleyed the bouncing ball left-footed into the upper right-hand corner of the net. The crowd inside the Hertha Berlin Stadium went nuts. Jack Morgan and Daniel Brecht were up on their feet applauding. That's three, Brecht crowed. Absolutely super. No wonder Manchester United is interested, Morgan said. He's incredibly good. Why would he risk his career to get involved with someone like Pavel? That's exactly what he said, remember? Morgan said. But there's no denying the way he looked in those six games, Brecht countered. He was simply not the same player. 
Out on the field, the referee blew the whistle, ending the game. Cassiano jogged off, sweating, smiling, and waving to his adoring fans. Jack was silent for several moments watching him. I think he's telling the truth, he said finally. I don't think he'd risk his career for someone like Pavel, but maybe Perfecta would. She did get naked for him. She did, Morgan agreed. I want to talk to Cassiano again, and his coach, and the club's general manager, all together. Think you can set that up? When? Now sounds good. Chapter 64 Haupt Commissar Dietrich, Maddie said into her cell phone. She was standing in the hallway of Greta Amsel's apartment. Who is this? Dietrich replied in a thick, slow voice. It's Maddie Engel, she said. There's been another murder. There was a long silence before Dietrich said, Who? Where? A childhood friend of Chris's, she said. Greta Amsel. They lived in an orphanage together near Halle. Another long silence. And she's dead? We just found her in her apartment. We haven't touched a thing. I think we saw the killer. He was posing as a plumber. He was leaving as we arrived. Did you get a look at him? No, she admitted. Dietrich's third silence was the longest. She thought she heard him drinking something. Call Inspector Weigel, he said at last. Have her bring in a forensics team and three cripple detectives to canvas the building. I'll see to all this tomorrow around noon. Maddie hesitated, incredulous. Tomorrow? With all due respect, Hopped Commissar, I think you should come here right now and listen to what we've found. Another of Chris's childhood friends is missing. The High Commissar breathed heavily in response, almost laboring. Then he said, Frau Engel, I must confess to you that it would be unprofessional of me to be at a crime scene in my current state. I am to bury my father in the morning, and I am drunk and well on the way to being drunker. You'll have to call Weigel. I've left her in charge for the night. She'll be helped by the rest of the Cripo homicide team. The phone clicked dead. Chapter 65 My friends, I can't help it. Two hours after the fact, and I'm still shaking like a calf about to become veal. The smell of flesh burning and bacon still poisons my nose. The grease burn on my right cheek throbs, and thoughts crowd my head. I was in Greta's apartment barely twelve minutes. I left the fans running. It should have been days until her body was discovered. But then I saw Matty Engel and the big bald guy, and ever since then my mind's been throttled with questions. How could they have found Greta? I took all the files from the archives. What do they know? What did Kristoff tell them before he came after me? For the first time in nearly twenty-five years, I feel almost overwhelmed by the thought that my mask, my invisibility, might be weakening. Then I shake it off. They'll find nothing that will link to the invisible man. But I am, above all, a realist. I can clearly see now that I have limited time in which to fully erase my past. Three other children are still unaccounted for. Just three, and I'll be free. Like it or not, my friends, tomorrow is shaping up to be a busy, busy day. Chapter 66 It was nearly eleven by the time Burkhart turned onto Maddie's street. They'd been at the Amsel crime scene for hours, watching Inspector Weigel and the team of Cripo investigators and crime scene specialists document the body and the apartment. Weigel had seemed overwhelmed to be in charge of an investigation, even if it was only for one night, but she'd listened attentively and took copious notes when they gave their statement. Maddie had held nothing back. She told Weigel about the files stolen from the archives, Harriet Ledvish's assertion that something terrible had happened to Chris and his friends, and the missing persons report on Ilza Fry. 
Weigel had duly noted all of it before saying, So you're saying that there's no connection between the deceased and Hermann Kruger? I don't know. Weigel looked uncomfortable as she said, This afternoon, the higher-ups put a lot of pressure on the Hauptkommissar about Agnes Kruger's murder. They think that is the key to all of this. Dietrich thinks so too. Burkhart said, You mean it's more high profile than, say, a nurse's death? Weigel appeared even more torn, but then she nodded and told them that she had talked with Hermann Kruger's secretary in person. Weigel had gotten the secretary to admit that five days before, the billionaire told her he was going to be off on personal business for the next week, and then quite simply he'd vanished. Berlin Kripo had intelligence specialists trying to track his finances, but so far they were as shadowy as the man. No matter what had happened to Greta Amsel, Weigel believed the focus of the official investigation would be on Kruger until he was found and cleared. It's the six children, Maddie insisted to Burkhardt as he pulled up in front of her apartment building. They're the key, not Hermann Kruger. I agree, Burkhardt said. But I can see how someone like Agnes Kruger being slain in broad daylight would have a way of distracting attention. We have to find the other children from Weisenhaus 44. We have to warn them. Gabriel said he was staying at the office until he found them, Burkhardt said. Maddie nodded, but she felt insanely frustrated that they'd been so close to saving Greta Amsel. The killer had walked right by them, and then driven right by them. She put her hand on the door handle and was about to pull it when she stopped and looked at Burkhardt. Have you eaten anything? Not since lunch, he admitted. Feel like a home-cooked meal? You're gonna cook after the day you had? Burkhardt asked. My aunt does the cooking. When I get home this late, I warm it up. Chapter 67 Cassiano roared in Portuguese when his wife dropped her coat in the video Brecht had shot of the entrance to Pavel's hotel room. Hertha Berlin's star striker leaped from his chair in the team's conference room and lunged toward the door, shouting like a wild man. Brecht grabbed the Brazilian and said something forcefully in his language. For a second, Morgan thought Cassiano was going to pulverize Brecht, but then the striker softened and sat back down in his chair. What was he yelling? demanded the team's general manager, Klaus Bremen, who sat next to the coach, Zig Müller. Brecht said, he wanted to get a machete, cut off Pavel's balls, and shove them down Perfecta's throat until she suffocated. I told him it was a bad idea for someone bound for the World Cup. So he's saying he had no idea about this? The coach asked. Or about the betting? Brecht posed the question in Portuguese. Cassiano shook his head. Ask him about those games where he played horribly, Morgan said. Brecht did so, and the Brazilian began to shout at Morgan. Brecht said, He says he told you yesterday he was sick. He did not take a dive and would like to slap you for saying so right after he found out his wife was having sexy time with some old Russian bastard. Morgan said nothing. Cassiano looked at his coach and babbled in Portuguese. You believe me, yes, Zig? Brecht translated. Bremen, the general manager, replied, It's not a matter of belief, Cassiano. We need proof you're not involved. After Brecht told Cassiano so in Portuguese, the Brazilian began to shout again indignantly. How can I do this? Brecht translated. My wife is a whore, and I am the victim of rumors. How can I prove that I am clean? Tell him to give us a hair sample, Morgan said. Private will take care of the rest. Chapter 68 Mommy! Nicholas cried when Maddie opened the door to the apartment. Her son was in his pajamas and ran to her. She took him up in her arms, scolding, What are you doing up so late? Aunt Cecilia came behind her wearing her robe and curlers. He wouldn't listen. He's been a crazy man bouncing off the walls since that game ended, wanting to wait up and tell you all about it. Cassiano was unbelievable, Nicholas exulted. He scored three, three! Burkhardt appeared in the doorway looking somewhat awkward. Maddie smiled. Nicholas, Aunt C, this is Herr Burkhardt. He works at private too. Aunt Cecilia blushed, pulled her robe tighter and complained, 
Oh, Maddie, I didn't know you were bringing company home. He drove me home, and we both realized we were starving. That broke whatever spell Burkhart's arrival had held over her aunt, who turned and bustled toward the kitchen. I have cold sausages, potato pancakes, and homemade applesauce, and cold beer. Give me just a minute. Say hello, Nicholas, Maddie said, setting down her son, who appeared shy. Burkhart crouched and held out his hand. Nice to meet you, Nicholas. Nicholas hesitated and then shook it, saying, You're big. I know. You will be too someday. Am I going to lose my hair too? Nicholas, Maddie scolded. But Burkhart just laughed. Being bald has nothing to do with being big, Nicholas. Being bald is a state of mind. Maddie grinned. The tension of the day faded toward exhaustion. I've got to get him to bed. Sure, Burkhart said. Maybe I better go? No, no, my aunt would not hear of it. Someone going hungry is a major injustice with her. I heard that, Aunt Cecilia shouted from the kitchen. Maddie put her hand on Nicholas's shoulder and said, Say goodnight. Goodnight, Herr Burkhart, Nicholas said. You can call me Tom. Nicholas grinned and took his mother's hand, and they went to his room. She tucked him into bed. Nicholas said, Are you and Tom going to catch whoever killed Chris? Most definitely. Maddie kissed him on the forehead. Get some sleep, my little man. Tom said I'm going to be big. He did, didn't he? She went to the door. Mommy? Yes? You're not going to get killed trying to find out who did it, are you? Maddie turned and went straight back to him and wrapped her arms around him. No. I'm going to be safe and here with you until you're as big as Burkhardt is. Nicholas hugged her fiercely. I love you, Mommy. Maddie started to tear up. I love you too, Nikki. More than you can know. Chapter 69 Friends, fellow Berliners, it's not quite six in the morning, and I'm already on the road in the ML 500. I have a long drive in front of me, four and a half hours to Frankfurt am Main, if traffic on the Autobahn cooperates. Can there be a better time to hear a story than over a long stretch of road? I confess I love those audiobooks, don't you? Sit back now and listen closely. As I indicated once before, two years after the wall fell, well after the surgeries in Africa, it took me a month to locate the bitch that bore me. She was living in the sleepy hamlet of Biedenkopf, near the Rotagiburger Nature Park in west-central Germany. Do you know the place? It doesn't matter. Suffice it to say that my mother lived alone in a cottage on the outskirts of a rural village threatened by forest. On a chill, dark November night, I knocked at her door. Who was there? came a tremulous response. It is me, mother, I said, and I repeated the name she'd given me at birth. After a moment's hesitation, the wooden door opened slowly, revealing an old, frail woman I almost did not recognize. She was carrying an old luger, which she pointed at me suspiciously. Who are you? she demanded. A lover of masks, mother, I said, and made that clicking noise in my throat, Don Giovanni's most of all. Her eyes peeled wide, and her mouth sagged open in sheer disbelief as her pistol slowly lowered. Is it really you? Of course, I said. Do you still have that old Papier Crotler mask? They told me you died in Hohenschornhausen prison, she cried, and threw herself at me, weeping. I caught her as any loving son would. They told me you died there, too. She pushed back in horror. No! Yes. But they said you'd be told I went into the West. They said many things, I replied. I didn't believe any of it. And I should not have come in, come in out of the cold. I smiled dutifully at her mothering, 
followed her inside and shut the door behind me. My mother's living area was a simple place, with an overstuffed reading chair and a lamp and a fire burning in a wood stove. There were no photographs, which made my mission seem all the easier. She was looking at me in wonder and joy again. I did not recognize you. It's been too long, I said. Timidly, she said, Your father is dead, yes? Five years now. I'd heard that, she said with a pained expression. But I guess all things must pass. She went on, and then swallowed and looked at me pleadingly. Do you forgive me? I could not control my reaction. My right hand shot out of its own accord and grabbed my dear mother by the throat. I lifted her, dangling, bug-eyed, and choking into the air. As a matter of fact, mother, I said, I can honestly say I will never, ever forgive you for leaving me. Chapter 70 Private's corporate jet was a sleek Gulfstream G650, the gold standard in business aviation. At 9.45 that morning, the jet's landing gear descended in anticipation of landing at Frankfurt am Main Airport. Maddie finished her coffee and handed it to the steward, and then looked at the front page of the Berliner Morgan Post. The newspaper was plastered with stories about Agnes Kruger's murder and Hermann Kruger's disappearing act. Berlin Kripo was executing a search warrant on his offices and all his known residences in the city. The price of Kruger Industries' stocks had fallen in overseas trading. At the same time, Ole Larsen, the Swedish financier, had filed documents that indicated he'd increased his position in Kruger Industries from 5 to 10 percent. Maddie shook her head, puzzled, trying to stitch it all together. Was Kruger involved? Had he somehow known Chris when he was a child? Kruger was born in East Germany, wasn't he? She turned to look at Burkhardt. The counterterrorism expert was in the tan leather captain's chair opposite her. His eyes were closed. His great shaved head lolled to the right, and his breath came slow and rhythmic. Maddie decided that she might have underestimated Burkhardt. After shutting off Nicholas's light, she'd gone back to the kitchen and found Aunt Cecilia laughing and Burkhardt grinning, a plate of sausages and potato pancakes before him. He's funny, Aunt Cecilia said. She's a great cook, Burkhart said, sipping his beer. I know that, Maddie said, taking her own plate and beer. They'd talked and eaten for almost an hour. Burkhart was funny and entertaining in a mordant way, a quality she attributed to the line of work he'd been in prior to joining Private Berlin. He thanked Aunt Cecilia twice after he'd finished, and then Maddie saw him to the door. That was the best meal I've had in a long time, Burkhart said. Thanks. You're welcome. He smiled and said, I'll see you at the meeting angle. Call me Maddie, and I'll be there, she promised and shut the door. Burkhart was a good guy. But she didn't think of him as she went to bed. All she could see as she plunged toward sleep were images of Chris and Greta Amsel walking into Weisenhaus 44. Her cell phone rang at 6.20 a.m., less than six hours after she'd gone to sleep. Dr. Gabriel had found another orphan. His real name was Artur Becker. He'd changed it to Artur Jaeger. He was a design engineer for BMW in Munich. Maddie called BMW security looking for a phone number for Jaeger, but was told that he had gone to the IAA Motor Show in Frankfurt am Main, and the company had a policy against disclosing personal cell phone numbers. But Maddie insisted that Jaeger could be in danger, and the security person on duty relented. Maddie called the number immediately. Jaeger answered groggily. She identified herself and asked if his real name was Artur Becker. A pause. I don't know who you're talking about. My name is Jaeger. Please, sir, I'm trying to warn you about... Jaeger almost screamed at her. I don't know anyone named Artur Becker! I think you do. And other orphans, she said. You're all in, this is a sick, sick joke, he said, and hung up. She tried him back several times, but got his voicemail. She left a detailed message, describing what had happened to Greta Amsel, and to please call her back. 
Then in frustration, she called Morgan, who told her to take the jet to Frankfurt. Finally, she had called Burkhart, and he'd met her at the corporate terminal. She reached over and tapped him on the forearm. He startled and jerked awake. We're landing, she said. Burkhart yawned. Thanks. How far to the auto show? Fifteen-minute drive tops, Maddie said as the jet touched down. He sat up straighter, all business, and checked his watch, and his face turned grim. Let's hope we get there in time. Chapter 71 Following six old men who carried the colonel's ashes, Hauptkommissar Hans Dietrich trudged through wet grass toward an open grave in central Friedhof Friedrichsfelde, the central cemetery in the Lichtenberg district of East Berlin. The high commissar's head pounded from the vodka he'd consumed so copiously the night before, trying to deaden his mind so he would not drown in the dark, twisted quagmire that was his father. It had not worked. Dietrich's drunken thoughts had not been where they should have been. On the slaughterhouse, say, or on Christoph Schneider, Agnes Kruger, and now this Amsel woman. Instead, he'd wallowed in memories of the colonel and the ruthless manner in which his father raised him. Indeed, brutally hungover, moving unsteadily toward the grave, the high commissar's mind was still recalling the cold and often inexplicably cruel acts to which his father had treated him growing up. Dietrich was 52. He'd been trying to understand the colonel since he was a child. But as he watched the old men observing his father's urn being lowered into the grave, he realized once again that he could neither explain his father nor come to terms with him. The colonel was dead and about to be buried, yet the high commissar had the shuddering realization that the threat of the man might never die. Dietrich gazed blearily at the men gathered around his father's final resting place. They were in their 70s and 80s, and they wore somber gray suits, dark raincoats, and fedoras. There was no minister present. The colonel might have risen from the grave in fury had there been. But one of the men, stout with roomy eyes and gin blossoms on his nose, stepped forward at last and said, Conrad was one of the last of his kind, and to me it is fitting that he be given a final resting place close to the greats. Dietrich looked off toward a circular brick wall strangled in vine. He knew there were many burial urns sealed in the wall. A tall upright stone slab cut like an ancient tombstone stood dead center of the yard inside the brick wall. Surrounding the tombstone were the graves of Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, Wilhelm Pieck, and seven other titans of the German communist movement. My father's heroes, Dietrich thought bitterly. So close, and yet so far. He looked back at his father's mourners. They were looking at him expectantly, and he realized the stout one had stopped speaking. The high commissar said nothing. He took two steps forward, picked up a clod of wet black earth, thought to hurl it, but then dropped it on the urn. He stepped back, aware of the mud on his hand and not caring. One by one, the pallbearers tossed dirt into the grave, and then shook Dietrich's hand, blackening it further. The last mourner, the stout man, said, You have the condolences of the inner committee, Hauptkommissar. Your father was a valued member. With a dull, flat expression, Dietrich nodded. Thank you, Willi. Willi hesitated and then hardened. I suppose you must feel relieved then, now that he's gone. Dietrich had to fight to quell the nausea roiling in his stomach as he said, Actually, I feel cursed by him, by all of you. I won't be free of that until I know that every last one of you is dead, and all your secrets are buried with you. Chapter 72 It is just past 10 a.m. when I turn the Mercedes into a parking structure, on the northwest corner of the grounds of the IAA Motor Show, the largest car exhibition in the world. Gleaming exotic rides litter the parking lot, and I'm instantly a happy man. I love cars. They're one of the best disguises there is. In the right car, my friends, you can be anyone, don't you think? I park and study a photo 
of Arthur Yeager downloaded from the Internet, thinking about the helpful secretary who told me where I might find the engineer. I look in the mirror, checking the makeup job that makes me appear bald and much older. I zip up a blue windbreaker and then put on a red one with an Aston Martin logo over it. I tug on a matching ball cap. I pause, forcing myself to breathe deep and slow. I know what a terrible risk I'm taking. It's unlike me. I prefer to have the odds in my favor, but I have no choice. So I get the pistol and the suppressor from under my seat and slide the weapon into a holster I wear beneath the windbreaker. I open the door and make a show of pain as I get out. I've got a bad hip, or arthritis, or at least I do today. I gimp toward the gallery entrance, telling myself that if I am as cold and deadly as my father taught me to be, I just might leave Frankfurt an even more invisible man. Chapter 73 the taxi from the airport dropped Maddie and Burkhardt in front of the unequal twin towers called Castor and Pollux that front the city entrance to the Frankfurt Mesa Trade Fair. They paid for admission at the Festhalle entrance and entered a sprawling campus of gigantic halls linked by moving walkways and escalators. It was the second to last day of the show, but the place was still packed. Using a map, they navigated toward the BMW stand in hall number one, and began looking for Arthur Jaeger using a photo Dr. Gabriel had sent to their cell phones. Maddie spotted him up on a stage beside a beautiful woman in an evening gown. He held a microphone and was describing the intricacies of the sleek concept sports car that was turning on a revolving platform behind him. Maddie worked through the crowd toward the front. It was loud inside the massive hall, a general din that competed with Jaeger's spiel, so she did not hear what caused the engineer to suddenly jerk, drop the mic, and collapse backward. But when Jaeger hit the stage floor, she saw the fine plume of blood that burst from his lips. Shoot her! Burkhardt roared. Everyone down! Chaos bloomed into pandemonium as people around the BMW exhibit began screaming, diving for the floor or tripping toward the exits. Maddie drew her gun, her mind computing the rough angle from which Jaeger had to have been shot. She looked along that line of sight and spotted among those trying to flee an older man in a red windbreaker limping quickly away. The guy in the red jacket, Maddie shouted at Burkhart. He heard them. The old man began bullying his way through the melee, showing tremendous strength and agility. But Burkhart was like a rhino on steroids. He brushed people aside as if they were scarecrows, with Maddie trailing in his wake. The killer disappeared out into a crowded passage. Ten seconds later, Burkhardt and Maddie exited the same doors and scanned the crowd, which was beginning to pick up on the frenzy inside the hall as more and more people ran from it talking about the shooting. The old man was gone. Or was he? Maddie spotted a red jacket on the floor. He's changed jackets, she shouted at Burkhardt. Suddenly, toward the west entrance to the convention hall, they heard a gunshot and screaming. Chapter 74 A security guard had confronted the assassin at point-blank range and been shot in the chest, his gun discharging as he fell. Beyond the guard, outside the entrance and running toward Brüsselerstrasse, a man in a blue windbreaker and black cap dodged through the crowd. Burkhart took off in a full sprint with Maddie gasping to keep up behind him. By the time Maddie and Burkhart reached the entrance, the killer had dragged a man from a Maserati, pistol whipped him, and climbed in. The sports car squealed away as they ran out onto the sidewalk. Rain was starting to fall again. As he ran, Burkhart flashed his badge at a man standing shocked beside a red BMW coupe. Call Frankfurt Crippo, he shouted at the man, snatching the keys from his hand. Hey! the man shouted. That's not mine! You can't- Report this vehicle taken by Private Berlin and the Maserati stolen by an assassin, Burkhart commanded as he jumped in the driver's seat. He killed two. Maddie was in the BMW's passenger seat, strapping herself in. He's got a head start. And he's got more horsepower, Burkhart said, slamming the sports car in gear and popping the clutch. But he can't drive like I can. They went screeching after the Maserati, 
which had downshifted and drifted through a hard U-turn, heading due east toward Oslo-Erstrasse. The killer went right past them. He looked out the window directly at them. Bald, dark glasses, a mustache, hard to tell his age. The killer had already taken a right on Oslo-Erstrasse by the time they'd made the U-turn. They sped after him through a series of right-hand turns that led them around the perimeter of the fairgrounds and threw a red light out onto Route 44 heading west. The Maserati was 400 yards ahead of them when it took the ramp onto Audubon 648. Due to Burkhardt's remarkable driving skills, the killer could not widen the gap between them all the way to the interchange with the Audubon 5. The Maserati headed north. Call Crippo, Burkhardt told Maddie. Tell them to put a chopper in the air and give them his position. But right then, the skies opened up. A deluge came in sheets, and a gale overwhelmed the windshield wipers. Burkhart did not slow. Instead, he seemed to drive by Braille on the three-lane high-speed route, weaving in and out of cars as if the skies were clear. It scared the hell out of Maddie, who could not bring herself to take her eyes off the blurry road. Call them, Burkhart snapped. Maddie shouted, Slow down and I will. I slow down, we lose him, Burkhart yelled back. We can't even see where he is. I can see the brake lights where he's cutting people off. Maddie held on for dear life as Burkhart got them closer and closer. She heard herself tell Nicholas that she would not die trying to find Chris's killer. For a second, north of Rosa Luxemburgstrasse, Maddie thought Burkhart would eventually reel in the Maserati. But then the killer did something absolutely crazy. The rain let up enough for her to see the Maserati speeding up as it passed the exit for the village of Bad Homburg. The car flew over an underpass with Burkhardt still gaining ground. Then the killer must have hit his emergency brake just shy of the on-ramp for vehicles leaving Audubon 661 for the northbound A5. On the slick pavement, the Maserati drifted and turned 160 degrees, and then it roared down the entryway to the Audubon. Maddie's eyes widened, and she gasped as they shot past the lane. He's going the wrong way! Chapter 75 Friends, fellow Berliners, accelerating straight into traffic, feeding off the 661 is the best move I think I've ever made. It's remarkable how easy it is to get vehicles to turn out of your way when you're hurtling right at them fully prepared to die. A Lancia swerves right off my front fender, catches the guardrail and does a cartwheel. The driver's face was so terrified I start laughing. This has to be the most fun I've had in years. Better yet, I glance in the rearview mirror and see the red BMW that's been after me has failed to make the radical move that I did. Do the unexpected, my friends. It always pays off. At the far end of the on-ramp, I downshift, throw the car through a 180-degree turn, and hit the gas. The road to Bad Homburg is miraculously clear ahead. I keep looking in my rearview mirror as I pass through the town, but I still don't see the red BMW. They missed the turn. The next exit was five miles away. They're not coming any time soon. Still, I know that the Maserati is a car that's easy to recognize, one that I will have to lose as soon as possible. Ten minutes later, I pull the car deep into a wooded lane inside the Huktaunus Nature Park, northwest of Bad Homburg. Do you know it? It doesn't matter. Just know that I have no time to lose. There will be police swarming the area soon, and I have some distance to cover. I park the car in the darkest spot I can find, wipe down the steering wheel and the door, and get out, heading due northeast into the sopping wet forest. As I walk, I tear off the skullcap, the nose prosthesis, and the mustache. I find a stream and use mud and cold water to strip the makeup from my face. I ditch the blue windbreaker and continue on in the rain, my mind a whirl. I keep seeing the look on the driver's face before he flipped. I can't help it, my friends. I stop out there alone in the woods, throw up my fists, punch them at the weeping sky, and start to laugh. Soon I'm hysterical, and I've fallen to my knees. I've done it. Two more to go, and I've done it. 
no one will ever know who I am or what I've done. Some may suspect. Others may offer conjecture. But as I get to my feet and continue to make my way northeast toward the train station in the hamlet of Friedrichsdorf, I'm more certain than ever before that the person I was will never be linked to the person I have become. Chapter 76 Where did you last see him? Burkhart shouted as they roared north toward the next exit. Maddie was craned around in her seat, still shocked by the move. Engel, Burkhart demanded. Maddie blinked and pointed. He went off the road back there. Bad Homburg, Burkhart said. But by the time they covered the 15 miles and reached the sleepy little village of smooth-walled gray houses, they knew they had little chance of catching the Maserati. It could have gone in any one of several directions. Burkhart smashed his fist on the wheel. Maddie felt the same way. They'd been so close, but they hadn't saved Arthur Jaeger or the security guard, nor had they prevented the injuries resulting from the crashes. The killer had beaten them once again, and she was beginning to fear he might be unstoppable. We should go back, Burkhart said, and find the police and give our statement. Maddie almost agreed, but then something clicked in the back of her mind. No, wait, she said, digging for her cell phone. Pull over. She dialed Dr. Gabriel's number and got the aging hippie right away. Without pretext, she asked, Where is Ilza Fry from? The missing woman. Bad Homburg, he replied. You have the address? He told her to wait a moment and then came back with it. What's happening? Where are you? Bad Homburg, she said, and hung up. She looked at Burkhart. Ilza Fry lives less than a mile from here. The killer knew this place. That's why he ran here. Burkhardt put the car in gear. Six minutes later, they drove past a modest duplex on the outskirts of town at the edge of farm country. The rain had slowed to a drizzle, and in the distance they could hear sirens wailing. Burkhardt parked the red BMW in the alley so as not to attract police attention. They went to the back door and knocked. A few moments passed and they were about to knock again when a pleasant-looking blonde woman in her early thirties appeared in the window and eyed them suspiciously before opening the door on a security chain. Yes? Maddie held up her badge. We're with Private Berlin. We... The woman's hand went to her throat, and she cried, Did Chris send you? Has he found Ilza? Chapter 77 Dead, Tina Hanover said twenty minutes later in a soft, sad voice. And Ilza, too? They were sitting at a small table in a spartanly equipped kitchen, drinking coffee she'd made for them. Maddie's mind flashed on the woman's corpse beside Chris's. I can't say for sure. Her remains have not been tested, but there was a woman's body with his. Ilza Fry's roommate's shoulders slumped. Tears trickled down her cheeks as she shook her head slowly. Poor Ilza. She was right to be afraid. I told Chris she was afraid, and to be careful, I guess I... She bit at her knuckles and turned away from them. Why was Ilza afraid? Burkhardt asked. And why did Chris come to you? Tina Hanover made a puffing noise and wiped her tears with her sleeve. He came because Ilza's crazy sister Ilona asked him to. He said they were all friends from childhood. Maddie put it together in an instant. Ilona Fry had to be the mystery woman who'd visited Chris a week before his disappearance. Start at the beginning. Burkhardt insisted. Over the course of a half hour, Tina Hanover explained that Ilza Fry came home from work about two weeks ago as upset as she'd ever seen her. But Ilza had refused to tell her roommate what had gotten her so worked up. Stranger still, Ilza had gone straight to her room and called her sister in Berlin, which was very unusual. According to Tina Hanover, Ilona Fry was the bane of Ilza's existence. Ilona was a methadone addict who'd been diagnosed with schizophrenia. She'd been in and out of institutions and was forever hounding her sister for money. How did you know Ilza called Ilona? Burkhardt asked. Tina Hanover blushed and squirmed in her chair. I, uh... She turned defensive. I listened at her door. She was so upset I couldn't help it. What did she tell her sister? Maddie asked. 
Ilza Fry's roommate fidgeted again before replying. I didn't catch all of it because the doors are pretty thick, but I caught the gist of it. She'd recognized someone from their past. She called him Falk and seemed terrified, I mean absolutely terrified of him. Falk? Burkhart said. Are you sure? Tina Hanover nodded, and Maddie looked at Burkhart, puzzled. He said, The man who ran the slaughterhouse was named Falk. But he couldn't, Maddie said, and then she remembered. He had a son. He had a son, Burkhart said, nodding. For the first time since she'd gotten word of Chris's disappearance, Maddie believed they were homing in on the killer. Did you tell Chris all this? Tina Hanover nodded. He seemed to know who Falk was. What did he say? Maddie pressed. Say? Nothing. But you could see it in his body language. He knew him. There was a moment of silence in the room before Burkhart said, So where did Chris go from here? Ilza's law firm? The law firm? Tina Hanover said, surprised. No. But you said she recognized Falk at work, Maddie said, confused. Was Falk a client at the firm? Someone she saw at the courthouse? No, no, she protested, her face flushing. Ilza, she... She got defensive again. Ilza stopped working at the law firm 18 months ago, when she found out she could make more money in half the time working at the Paradise FKK Club north of town. She was a licensed professional sex worker. Chapter 78 The Paradise FKK Club was situated amid agricultural fields on ten manicured acres north of Bad Homburg. Trees and a white wall surrounded the compound. Despite the dismal weather, there were 15 or 20 high-end cars parked in the lot, and taxis were traveling to and fro. Maddie and Burkhart walked on a cement path past gardens appointed with pale Grecian statues of naked men and women in erotic poses. They came to a white building with columns that supported a portico over a grand entryway. A little over the top, don't you think? Maddie cracked uncomfortably as two men leaving the building walked by, staring at her. I told you to stay in the car, Burkhart replied. Maddie's cell phone rang and she answered it. You stole a car? Katerina Doric shouted in her ear. Maddie cringed and held the cell at arm's length a second before replying. We were chasing Chris's killer. He was getting away. You're not the police, Katerina shouted. You don't have the right to commandeer vehicles. Frankfort Crippo is going apeshit. You're wanted for questioning and... Maddie turned off her phone. I'll deal with her later. When she's calmer, Burkhardt agreed. They went through wooden doors carved with explicit scenes from the Kama Sutra into a surprisingly utilitarian and small lobby. Loud disco music played somewhere beyond the room. Two older women sat behind a counter at one end of the lobby. Stacks of Turkish towels and robes were piled on shelves behind them. They eyed Burkhardt and then Maddie, and then each other. One smiled knowingly. The other shrugged and said, 65 euro admission fee. You get use of the facilities, dinner, and coffee and soft drinks. The girls are extra. 50 euros for half an hour of straight loving. 50 euros to climax orally. 100 euros for 30 minutes of anal eroticism. She said all this while smirking at Maddie, who refused to react, even when the woman said to her, You want them to go down on you, honey? Negotiate. Chapter 79 Maddie pulled out her badge. The lady behind the counter stiffened. This is a legal establishment. We're not police, Burkhardt growled. We're investigators with Private Berlin. Maddie added, we're looking into the disappearance of one of your workers, Ilza Fry, and the murder of a man we believe came here looking for her last Tuesday. I don't know, she began. I remember him, the other old woman said. He paid his way in, talked with several of the girls, and left in a hurry. You know who he spoke with? No, but go inside and find Michelle. Michelle knows all. Burkhardt and Maddie moved toward the door into the brothel. No, rules are rules, 
the lady behind the counter said, holding out a robe to Maddie and a towel to Burkhart. If you want to take a walk through paradise, you pay and you change out of your street clothes. Maddie thought to protest, but Burkhart said, You take visa? Of course, the woman said and cackled. A few moments later, they walked through a door into a tea hallway with signs for men's and women's locker rooms. Maddie soon found herself in an empty and surprisingly clean locker facility that easily rivaled the one where she worked out. She hesitated, but then took off her jeans and blouse and hung them with her holster and gun in the locker. She put on the robe, which was entirely too large for her, and she had to cinch it tight about her waist. She found a pair of sanitized rubber sandals and headed toward a staircase at the other end of the locker room that featured an arrow and the word spa. At the top of the stairs, Maddie emerged into a large room with pools and jacuzzis and exotic flowers growing everywhere. There were beautiful naked women walking around and floating in the pools.